The story begins with a man apologizing to someone and his daughter yelling at him to have some pride and not to bow before them, as that girl was the one who hit her first. The parent of the girls was ordering the principal to expel her from the school. The principal told Minji's father that it was her third time hitting someone, and the girl she hit, Hyrie, her father was a politician who was trying to maintain his political image and that he was no joke. He suggests he apologize to them and clear things up before it's too late. And that's exactly what he does. He apologizes to them and blames his parenting for her behavior while Minji kept asking him not to apologize to them with teary eyes. Minji didn't have a mother, so it was up to him to take care of her alone. While coming back home, Minji lashes out at her father for being so weak and poor while everyone else's father was some CEO or politician. She hates her classmates, she hates her school, and she hates him for being as he was. She further goes on to even say that if it was going to be like that, then he shouldn't have let her born in the first place. All he could was just listen to her. After saying all that to him, she goes to her friend, Hina's house, and told him not to look for her or she would be even more pissed. He wanted to stop her but could empty. On her way, the girl, Hyri, stops her. She was with many other students as well. She hits Minji not expecting her to fight back, but Minji hits her as well. Hyri's boyfriend comes in the way and kicks Minji. His name was Sun Minho, and he was a member of the KK crew. Minji insults them, calling their action childish. The guy gets angry at her and starts beating her brutally. Even the other bully there think that he was going overboard and they should stop him. But instead of stopping him, Hyri runs toward her with a brick in her hand and hits her with that with all her strength. Minji falls to the ground, unconscious, and her blood splatters all over the place. Everyone starts to panic and wonder if she was really dead. Even Minho was terrified now. One of them tries to call 911 but Minho threatens them saying they were all accomplices in this. And if he gets caught, everyone else would be changed as well. He calls his crew head and requests him to take care of the body, but he denies it because he had just joined the crew and was a newbie. Hyri takes the call and told him that she was the daughter of Ju Kang Chan, the CEO of Joyan Construction. At home, her further was waiting for her and it was getting late. On the other hand, the boss of the crew himself comes there to take care of the body. He told her that he was helping her just because she was the daughter of the president and assured her that he would take care of everything. He told her how there was a new compression machine from Japan that shrinks the body to as small as a fist. Even he was shaken inside out after hearing that. We see at the back of the car was the body of Minji who was most likely dead. At home, her father fell asleep while waiting for her. When he wakes up and sees the time, he goes outside to look for her himself. Outside, where the fight took place, there were many people gathered to see the blood trail on the ground. He also stops there to see what was going on and notices a ribbon. The ribbon was the same as the girl Hyri was wearing at school. He calls her friend Hina. She had told him that she was going to her place earlier. She told him that she wasn't with her that day. He ends the call and started thinking about all the possibilities, and now, he was furious. Hyri was still scared and asked Minho if everything would be alright. He assures her saying all they need to do is to keep quiet. And that Minji's father was also messed up so he wouldn't be a problem either. As they were leaving for their home, Minji's further comes out of nowhere and stops them. They were terrified. He asks them if they had seen Minji. Minho gets angry at him for sneaking up on them and grabs him by the collar, threatening him to leave. Hyri was trembling in fear after seeing him. Minho told him that they don't know anything about her. He shows Hyri in her heart eye and asks her if it wasn't hers. Minho was pissed now and was about to hit him. In the past, a guy named Sergeant Kim had taken a superior officer as a hostage and demanded to discharge him. They were trying to calm him down but it was useless. They talk about a girl and how they didn't know she was his fiancé. They try to talk him out of it but he fires the gun in the air and the officer orders them to discharge him, as he was really going to kill him. This guy was Minji's father, and he was completely mental from the start. In the present, Minho takes his shirt off to fight him and tears his shirt off of him as well. But what they saw completely terrified them. In that past incident, the other officer was not agreeing to discharge him because he was their biggest weapon. The officer starts reminding Surgeon Kim of how many missions they had accomplished together. They took over the North 17 times, sent double spies to the South 5 times, and were jailbroken 2 times, the first Graton's assassination attempt in North Korea. North Korea even has a sentencing, and in China and Russia, 
There's even a team dedicated to him, and they didn't want to lose him at any cost. His present itself was a diplomatic problem. In the present, he beat up Minho in just a few seconds and he couldn't even keep track of his speed. Kim asked him again where his daughter was in a furious tone. He was choking him with the hot eye. Hairi screams out in terror, begging him to stop. In terror, her legs also gave up and she falls to the ground. Kim asks him for any hint, even a direction where they went. He didn't know where they went but he did give him his crew head's name. He was the one who contacted the boss. At a house, KK crew head, Ominchil was beating a civilian because he hadn't paid his debt to him. He was beating him brutally in front of her daughter. He had threatened him that if he didn't pay the money in time, the one who would suffer was his daughter. He was taking her daughter with him and made him watch them taking her. The girl was crying out for someone to help. Just then, Sergeant Kim also comes there with a briefcase. The crew head sends one of his men to check who it was. When he comes down, he sees that the front door was already open. He tries to alert them about the intrusion but they only hear a loud noise. Someone comes to the door of that room and starts banging on it. The other member was ready to attack as soon as someone comes inside, but the girls warns him in advance. The guy hits his own gang member instead of Kim, and Kim strikes back. Kim ties him with a rope to the ceiling and asks him where Minji was. He says he doesn't know what he was talking about and asks him crew head for help. But instead of helping him, he was planning on running away. Kim tries to catch him but he managed to escape from him. As he was running, Wondering who he was and how did he find him, he trips on a string and falls to the ground. He screams who put the string there and sees the whole alley was filled with traps. Kim catches up to him and ties him to the rope as well. He takes him to the house and starts beating him brutally, but he still wasn't talking and kept denying that he knows anything. He told him that he only contacted them on the telegram and it was up to them to contact him when they need him. Kim knew that he was lying and broke his arm. The father and daughter were terrified to see his brutality. The crew head threatens to sue him over this as he was still a minor, so he would only get a warning. But Kim doesn't care about anything at the moment and kicks him in the face. He takes out his gun from the briefcase. He told him how he was feeling right now after losing his daughter while putting the silencer on the gun. He points the gun at him and says that he was ready to face the consequences. The guy was horrified as he knew that he was not bluffing. He was really going to shoot him if he doesn't get what he wants. Terrified, he confesses that he was not a minor and Kim really shoots him in the leg. He told him that the only reason he was letting him live is that he still thought Menji was alive. He threatens to kill anyone who causes her daughter even slight trouble. The crew head calls him a mental. Kim takes his phone and at the same time, he gets a text message from them. The message was that they were about to load her in the boat, and before loading her in, they made sure that she was dead. Seeing this horrifying message, Kim was broken from the inside. He couldn't hold his tears back and immediately messages them back to have a voice call with them. They received the message but the boss told him not to respond, suspecting it was the cops. They delete the group chat and threw the phone. Kim asks the guy while crying what that meant and told him to contact them again. He told him that it was impossible to contact them now as they had deleted the group chat. But Kim doesn't care now and told him to contact them no matter how. While he was interrogating him, the old man grabs the knife and stabs Kim from behind. The guy compliments him for doing so and told him to stab him a few more times. The old man did that so that the guy doesn't collect the debt money from him. But Kim managed to avoid the knife from hitting any vital spots. And now he was furious at him and was about to kill him. Just then, the cops come there. They were horrified to see the scene and asked for more backup. At the police station, the whole precinct was in uproar while the gang members were accusing him of trying to kill them. The cops try to find out about his identity but they didn't get anything on the phone. They try to find out about him using his fingerprints, but they were shocked when they see his profile was blocked. They wonder how was that even possible. The guy told the cops that he was looking for his daughter and started beating him in front of the cops. Two big cops come there and they stop him. Kim's phone which was in the cop's possession gets a call on it. The cop reads the caller's name. It was her daughter. Hearing this, it was like he just woke up from slumber. The cop helps Kim get up and sees that he had already taken his handcuffs off and was shocked. The guy who was holding the phone turns around to ask them about the suspect's daughter when he sees all the officers and the thugs on the ground. He couldn't comprehend what was going on and Kim attacks him as well and told him to be silent. 
He picks up the call and asks if it was Minji calling. No one answers from the other side and ends the call. He tries to redial it but the phone was now unreachable. After that, he just leaves the police station like nothing happened. After he was gone, the high-ranking sergeant was scolding the officer. Just then a guy in a coat comes there and slaps the senior sergeant and takes away his badge. This guy was from the National Special Operations Department, Director Kangguk Chio, code name, Ground Dog. He was specially looking for Kim and called him COD-66. They were trying to track his phone and were shocked that he still has it, wondering how could he make such a mistake. They track him to a Taekwondo center. A man named was teaching kids Taekwondo when he sees Kim. This man is Song Han Su, national gold medalist in Taekwondo. He asks him why he came there after all this time and presumes it must be something extremely important. Kim told him that his daughter died, but he was not sure if she was actually dead because of the call he got earlier. He knows that he should throw the phone but he was still for her to call. And he also knew that he was being chased by those guys and asked for his help. Han agrees to help him because he had saved his son's life once, and this was his form of repaying. Han was going to take the kids to the safer location first but Kangok was already there. He was playing with the kids when Han attacks him without any prior warning. But Kanga grabs his leg and gets smug. Han attacks him with his other leg, but this time Kanga wasn't able to dodge it. Han was telling the kid to go to a safe place when Kanga attacks him, which Kim blocks. Kanga recognizes him and was excited to finally find him. Han kicks him in the face again and the rest of the detectives also come there. Han was beating all of them one by one. They were shocked to see him almost flying and defeating them one by one. One of them recognizes him. He told the others that he was so good at Taekwondo that even North Korea invites him. Han and Kim run from them. Han asks Kim what he needed, a weapon, transportation or to heal him first. But Kim demands the bunker. They get inside a van and get out of there. From the outside, it looks like an old crappy van. But inside that van was a whole setup to track and all kinds of stuff. Han guides him through the process to track her daughter's phone and he manages to find it in just a few minutes. But the location was a bit far from there. They arrive at the location where her phone was, but there were a bunch of high schoolers who had made a gang called Gyeongji Nambu. Han asks him if he was sure that her daughter was there. The vice captain of the crew told them to scram because today was their crew's meetup. They don't listen to him and keep moving forward to the exact location where the phone was. The vice captain gets pissed and grabs Kim from behind. Kim tackles him to the ground in an instant and puts his foot on him. He derives to him Minji's appearance and asks him if he had seen her, while the other gang members attack him, whom he easily defeats. The vice captain replies that he hadn't seen her and Kim threatens him not to get in his way. Inside the building was where the meeting was going on, and their boss was Shin Sun Go, Gyunji's undefeated boxer, who conquered three schools. Outside the building, Kim was taking them down alone while Han was asking around if the others knew about Minji. The delinquents get pissed and attack him, but he easily defeats them. The other students don't even try to fight him, let them passive. They beat the hell out of anyone who comes their way along the way. Kim arrives at the first floor and number two of the gang was waiting for him. He attacks Kim and sees that his chin was unprotected and goes for it. But, Kim just easily dodges his attack and starts beating him continuously. He started to get furious at them for trying to get in his way. He arrives at the central building and searches for the boss of the gang. He was pissed to see Minji's phone in his pocket. One guy tries to mess with him and he slams him onto the ground in just one hit. He beats all of the goons as well and goes to their boss and asks him where he got that phone. The guy looks at Minji's picture and disgustingly says that she was the girl he slept with last night and that she was great in bed. He shouldn't have said that because now Kim was furious. After some time, we see that the guy's face was fully busted and Kim was still going on. He puts a pen between his fingers, then stomps on it. The guy screams in pain. Han stops Kim, otherwise he really would have killed him, even though he confessed that he was joking and had never met her daughter before. His goons found her phone with some other phones and bring it to him. They have someone who could open anyone's password. The guy took Minji's phone and was going through her pictures when accidentally he called her father. The call from before in the police station was accidentally clicked by him. Kim was devastated because it was a dead end. The guy told him that he was the only one that used to call her and she didn't have any friends. There was one girl who used to contact her, Hina. Minji had told Kim that Hina was her best friend 
but the guy says that she was not much of a friend. Kim goes through her chats with Hina, and what he saw completely shocked him. The guy told him that the Hina girl was using his daughter as a shuttle. In the past, when the girls ask for her phone but she denies it. Hina says that they were friends so she should help her. Minji never had a real friend, so she mistook her for her best friend. While they were mocking her behind her back. Just thinking and finding out about all this was causing his blood to boil. He blames himself for being so blind all this time, while his daughter was being used and bullied. Just thinking about all this, he felt horrible from the inside. Han snaps him out of it and told him to stay strong for now. The guy told him the location where his men found the phone. It was a beggar who gave them the phone. They asked the beggar where he found the phone. The beggar was hesitant to tell them at first, but when they threatened him with cops, so he agrees to tell them. Earlier, a car stopped near him and threw a wallet and the phone. After they were gone, he took the phone and the wallet when the guys from the high school see him using an expensive phone and exchange it with a bottle of booze. Kim asked him about the license plate but he didn't notice that. All he knew was that the car was a white BMW and the one who came out of the car was bald. Kim says to himself that he was going to find him in five minutes. On the other hand, the boss arrives at his destination. He covers up her body and throws her in the freezer. Now that all of it was done, he was going to blackmail President Ju now. That was his plan from the very start. He says that President Ju was a monster who pulled out all his teeth. And from that day on, he was looking for it to get his revenge on that guy. But then his daughter killed a person and called him. Just then, a cop comes there and told them to show their identity. But they call him as well and throw him into the same freezer. They mock Hyrie for believing their story about the compression machine from Japan. After they were gone, we see a hand coming outside the cover. It was Minji's hand and she was still alive. On the other hand, Kim told Hansu that they had to find her in just five minutes. Hansu was surprised and asked him to give him six minutes instead. They both get inside the bunker and try to track the car. They were using face recognition of that beggar to find out about the time when he saw the car. The facial recognition was a success and they found the white car. They searched for the car owner from the car number. But this was not their car, this was a rental car. All guy comes out of the car to throw the bags and the smartphone into the dustbin. Hansu suggests using facial recognition to see his criminal record. They insert the recording of the car to find the car's location through their bunker. As it was just about to complete the process of finding the car, a different car hits their bunker. The whole setup was destroyed, but Kim managed to see the location of the kidnappers. The location was 9 kilometers from there. Their car was now completely upside down and the one who was driving the other car was the detective who was chasing him. He was also injured badly but still hadn't given up on catching them. Kim has had enough of him and decided to kill him and get rid of him. The gate opens and the one who comes out of the car wasn't Kim, it was Hansu. Earlier, Hansu stopped Kim because killing him would bring even more trouble. He was buying some time so that Kim could escape. The detective keeps asking him about code 66 and suddenly, the car behind him blows up. The detective was baffled to see that, while Kim manages to escape, he jumps into the river to escape. The detective was pissed at Hansu. Seeing up close, the detective realizes who he was and shoots him, but Hansu kicks him so hard that he went flying. The detective reveals that the first shot was a blank and now he was shooting to kill him. The detective makes fun of him for being this weak and how his kick is used to break stones into pieces. The detective lost sight of him and we see Hansu almost flying above him and landing a powerful kick. The detective manages to dodge the attack and the kick really shattered the road. Hansu told him that his first kick was also a blank attack. Out of bullet, the detective fights him with the knife, but he was no match for Hansu in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Just then, the rest of the detectives also come there. While the detective was distracted by them, Hansu gets into a special position and was about to use the jumping back kick. But the detective was sure that he couldn't attack him with that move from that distance. He was sure that Hansoon did some mistake in calculating the distance because otherwise this wouldn't make any sense. All he could do was just stand there and observe and Hansu was doing three spins in the air. At least that's what he had thought at first, but when he gets kicked by Hansu, he realizes that he did four spins in the air. The three spin talent is an overwhelming talent, and he never thought he would see four spins. Hansu takes the detective with him and jumps into the river while the other detectives were just watching. On the other hand, Kim finally arrives at the dock where his daughter was held. 
He finds the car he was looking for and follows the blood trail. Inside the freezer, Minji was trying to get help from someone, but no one answered her calls. Tired, she sits in a corner and starts crying remembering his dad. Just then, someone enters the room. Minji expects this person to be her dad and was about to cry from the relief, when she realizes it was not her dad but the guy who kidnapped him. He was trying to call President Ju, but he was not picking up, making him angry. Just then, the boss guy sees the footprints of the core. He was just assessing the situation when the cop attacks him. He was also wasn't dead yet. The boss stabs him again, making sure he was dead for good this time. Meanwhile, Minji was watching all this and was terrified. She sees that the boss was trying to call President Ju. The picks up his phone in front of Minji. He was so caught up in the moment that he didn't realize that Minji was not even there. And before he could find out, President Ju calls him back. He heard about what his daughter doing and wanted to talk to him in person about this matter. But the boss guy was pissed at him for faking being a nice person. The boss threatens to reveal what his daughter did to the girl if he didn't come to him alone. Ju reassures Hyrie that he would take care of everything. She warns him about her further but he didn't give it any thought. President Ju orders Director Nam to prepare 5 billion won cash. After talking to the president, the boss now couldn't wait to take his revenge on him. As he was blabbering about how excited he was to meet him, he sees Minji inside the freezer, alive. They both were shocked as hell, but before the boss could enter the room, she manages to close the door in terror. In anger, the boss calls his men, but they weren't answering because they had a visitor, who was known other than Kim himself. He gets inside the container and locks the door from the inside. As usual, he was pissed. They had no idea who he was and what he was doing there on his own. One of them starts acting rude to him and asks him who he was and where did he come from. He shows them Minji's phone without saying a word. On the other hand, the boss was pissed because they weren't answering. Just then, he gets a call from the rest of his gang members who were also there. The boss asked them if Kang Min was also there. They were talking about the mysterious guy in a hoodie. The boss orders him to go to the office first and see why they weren't picking up. Meanwhile, inside the office, everyone was on the floor, injured. Kim was chasing the last guy who managed to escape. He asks him why he was chasing him, and if President Ju was the one who sent him there. Kim didn't know what that guy was talking about. He climbs on top of a huge crane, and when he had nowhere to run, the guy confesses to him that she was already dead when they brought her there. Kim asks him what he was talking about and what President Ju had to do with any of this. But the guy didn't answer him and jumped off the crane. He tries to grab onto the wire and to the bottom safely, but the pain was so excruciating that his hand slipped and the guy falls to his death. The rest of the gang arrives at the office and reports the situation to the boss. Sang Min, the guy who fell to his death, was not the only one to escape. One more guy named Berger escapes as well. But as he was about to escape in his car, Kim finds him and starts breaking the window. But the window was too strong. Berger starts cursing him and challenges him to open the door which he easily opens. Now the guy was terrified seeing him and started spilling the beans without being asked. He told him that the girl was freezing inside the freezer and they were also lying to President Ju that they were handing her over to Japan to get rid of her. But before Kim could ask him more, someone attacks him from behind. It was the rest of the gang members. They attacked him and instead of Kim falling, the bat got bent instead. While Kim was beating them, Berger manages to escape. He finds a truck and was planning on running when he sees Kim still following him. Kim suddenly comes in front of him and breaks the window. The truck bumps into something and the whole truck falls into the sea. But Kim didn't let him sink and takes him out of the water safely. Kim asks him to take him to the freezer where Minji was. Inside the freezer, Minji was now could bar the cold. The boss offers her to open the gate and he would let him go. Just then, Kim also comes there. President Ju was also on his way to the dock. He leaves everything to the planning director Nam. His driver asks President Ju why he was letting someone like director Nam get in involved in some random gangster matter when they could deal with him without much effort. The president told him why and how that guy has survived till now. It's because he was a sly fox and doesn't trust anyone. The boss was negotiating with Minji that if she comes out, they both would walk together to bring down President Ju, and that he would let him go. But Minji knows he was lying and mentions how he would kill her just like he killed the police officer. The boss told her how he was genuinely planning to let her go, but since now she had seen him murder someone, there was no way he could let her go alive. 
Minji was terrified. Just then, he sees Burger all injured. He asks him what happened and suspects he was planning something with President Ju behind his back. This is what President Ju was talking about. He doesn't trust anyone, not even his men. But Director Nam wouldn't come out just for that reason alone. President Ju asks the team leader if he had heard the urban legend about someone who takes orphans away and fosters them into emotionless monsters. Director Nam had mentioned that there were some dangerous guys that came out of the market, and due to that, he had personally asked him to leave this matter to him. As long as that thing is hitting you, he is planning to kill you for Rayol. President Ju asks him if he could win against him. At the dock, Kim was about to attack the boss. The guy blocked his attack and immediately strikes back and aims for his eyes. This guy, Gangman steps back after landing his first blow. The boss was encouraging him to attack, but he was shocked to see what just happened. His both fingers were broken. Kim had managed to block and even inflict damage in a split second. In an angry voice, Kim asks him if he was with them as well. Gangman asks him if he was President Ju. The boss informs him that he was someone working for President Ju, calling him son. Just then, Kim suddenly attacks him which he dodges with ease and tackles him on the ground. He was aiming to crack his shoulder, but before he could do that, Kim attacks him directly in the face and starts beating him continuously. But this time, Kongmin caught his fingers instead and broke them. Kongmin was about to tackle him again, but this time Kim double tackles him and threatens to crush his back if he doesn't give up. But, the boss meddles and gets him off of him. The boss gives him the order to stop holding back and kill him instead. Just then, Kim attacks the boss from behind but Kang Min comes in the way and saves him. Now Kang Min was ready to kill him no matter how. Kang Min was young. He was around Minji's age. So instead of killing him, Kim decides to just make him give up. The fight begins. Kang Min attacks him with all knife continuously and Kim dodges all of them. He locks him in body hold and told him that no father would ever make his son do something like that. Kong Min remembers how he met the guy he calls father. He had no identity, no relations. So even if he were to call someone, the cops wouldn't find out about him. And to control him, one has to just say that he was his father. Because he was all kid who just needed a family. And he would do everything to protect them. Kong Min's fighting style was brutal and wild. Even in a situation where there was no way to escape, he makes way for himself. The boss used him as a tool to kill anyone who was a threat to him or his business. He made him do some really gruesome job that no one would vouch for. Kong Min called him father, but to him, he was nothing more than a beast. Just thinking about all this, Kang Min couldn't stop crying while fighting for his life at the same time. After a few moments, Kang Min finally passes out, but he had inflicted much damage on Kim's leg. Inside the freezer, Minji was afraid that she was going to die freezing. She remembers how rude she was to his father and regrets blaming him for all her pain. Outside the freezer, the boss hears something and checks the freezer's door and it was open. He sees a corpse covered in a blanket. He realizes that she was playing some tricks to escape. On the other hand, Kim was shocked when Kang Min gets up even after passing out just moments ago. He was attacking him like a wild beast but Kim was still overpowering him. Kim would have killed him too if he wasn't that young. The guy says if he doesn't kill him, his father was going to kill him anyways. Kim was about to hit him but stops, thinking about what Berger had told him about her daughter freezing to death or already dead. Kim told him that there was no way a real father would kill his son. This is not a family. He leaves after saying that, leaving the kid to realize how he was being used by his father all this time. Making him do things like that and even forcing him to kill the cops. While he was thinking about all this, Director Nam suddenly comes there and approaches his neck and killed him in an instant. Inside the freezer, the boss thinks that she was pretending to be a corp and starts stabbing it brutally. But then he realizes that someone was behind him, but it was too late now. She hits him with a rod with all her might making him pass out. When Kim arrives there, he sees a corpse and the boss knocked out. He deduces that they must have fought amongst themselves and ended up in that situation. He tries to wake up the boss and ask him where his daughter was, but he didn't come to his senses. Just then, he sees some writing on the ground. It was written by Minji who was asking his dad to forgive her for what she had said to him. Kim recognizes her writing and realizes that she was never dead. He was relieved to know that she was still alive. He was almost sure that she was dead and they were trying to hide this. He was still figuring out who was behind all this. And only one name was mentioned by all of them, 
President Ju. Kim now couldn't bear the anger and just wanted to get his hands on the culprit who was behind all this. But he realizes that his priority should be finding her daughter first. After he was gone, the boss guy woke up. He was pretending to pass out all this time. He was wondering what happened to Kang Min when he sees Berger closing the freezer's door. Berger locks him inside because he had tried to kill him. The boss apologized and also threatened him but he didn't open the door. He was afraid that President Ju was on his way there. And if he finds him, he would be dead. Just when he was about to give up, the door behind him opens. He was thrilled, but what he saw outside completely changed his excitement into despair. Because the one who opened the door was Director Nam. The boss was terrified and wondered why he was there. Director Nam orders him to open his mouth so he could break his teeth again like he did last time. Outside, Kim was running around looking for Minji, calling her name. Minji was running for her life when she realizes that his dad was calling her. But because of the rain, it was hard to hear and she thought it was just her imagination. Because there was no way his father would come there. Kim climbs to the containers and screams her name as loud as he could. But because of the rain, it was impossible for her to hear him. Just then, he sees Minji climbing up the hill to get to the road. And she successfully finds the road. She asks for help from the people passing by. But they think she was a scammer and passed by her. Leaving her in complete disbelief. Kim runs to the road as fast as he could, and when he reaches the road, he was shocked. On the other side, Director Kim was pulling out the boss's teeth one by one as he had done before. The boss used to walk under some local gangster and was pretty famous for his job. But his boss betrayed him for profit. But he survived the fall and went after his boss. He told him that he was ordered to do that by President Ju. He killed the boss and became the new boss. After a few days, he gets a call from President Ju and he wanted to meet him. The boss immediately recognized that he was the one who had given the order to kill him. The boss talks to him rudely, cursing him to his face. That ticks off President Ju and he calls him a wild dog, and that he knows how to tame a wild dog like him. He orders his men to bring the pot, which was filled with hard-boiled potatoes. They pulled out all his teeth and made him eat the hard-boiled potatoes. That's how crazy they are. When the boss couldn't bear the pain, he agreed to obey them from that point forward. He started to live like a dog and did whatever the president demanded him to do. And now in the present, after torturing him for some time, Director Nam told him that the president still wanted to give him another chance and asked him if he would comply this time. They were going to use him as a scapegoat for this incident. Not only that, they were going to get rid of all the opposing politicians with whom they didn't get along. The director thought all of this in the midst of all this chaos. The boss laughs at him and asks him if he knows what life tastes like. Director Nam orders his men to stop him as he was about to commit suicide, but it was too late. He had already bitten his tongue. While dying, he told the director that the girl was alive and her father was following her. Before he could finish his sentence, Director Nam punches him in anger and orders his men to look for the girl and her father. On the road, when Kim arrived there, she was already gone and was nowhere to be found. She got a lift from someone, and that someone was known other than President Ju himself. Kim realizes that if he wanted to find her sooner, he would need some help. He calls someone and asks him if his license to kill was still valid. License to kill is the situation that gives the individual in the country the privilege of being exempted from murder charges. As Kim was running on foot to the location, Han Su comes there on a scooter. Kim fills him in on the details and Han Su told him that they should get out of there as a strong storm was coming. And we see the detective who was rescued. He was super pissed and lashed out at his subordinates for being so relaxed and orders them to search for them. In an isolated place in the mountains, they clean her up and presented her in front of the president. President Ju asks her what happened to her, to which she replies that she only remembers waking up inside the freezer and meeting the boss who was trying to kill her. Then Ju goes on to ask her if she was friends with Hyri. She started fumbling her words and just said that they were not on best of the terms. The president started rambling about how much he loved her daughter, and he would do anything, cover up anything to save her. He told her himself that her daughter tried to kill her. That sent chills down her spine. She was terrified. He knew that she was trying to deceive him. A then inside the car, he knew that she was pretending to be asleep. Seeing her trying to deceive him, he perceives her as a bigger threat than he had originally thought and orders his men to take care of her. 
She begs him to forgive her and starts calling her dad for help. The guy was about to inject her with a lethal injection when someone rings the doorbell. President Ju was shocked because no one knows about this location. It was Detective, who was also looking for Kim's daughter, and they tracked her down there. When they didn't open the gate, they forced their way inside, breaking the door. The body gods there try to stop them but he told them he was from the government and demands to get inside. All this time, the other detectives were keeping an eye on all of them. That's how they got he before Kim and Hansu. They assumed that he was looking for his only daughter, and if they get to her before Kim, they could catch Kim this time. President Ju was watching all this from the top. They aggressively come inside and start racking the place, while President Ju was still not phased and was acting with calm. President Ju asks him what position he was on, and that ticks off the detective. The other officers inform him that there was no one inside. The detective orders them to just wait because, from the National Special Mission Bureau, the six gold stars were on their way here. As they arrive at the location, the one waiting for them was Director Nam. One of them tries to get him out of the way but gets beaten up instead. One more of them attacks him and meets the same fate as the other guy. And now it was the old man's turn to show his strength. Inside the house, the detective mentioned that he still didn't have a warrant but that wouldn't matter after they were done with them. Just then, the old guy enters the house and the detective was shocked because the one who was behind him was directing him. He alone manages to defeat all the six gold stars on his own. The president told the detective how he fears nothing. Outside the house, inside the jungle, Kim and Hansu were watching all this. They knew that the detective would go after Minji if he failed to catch them. So they followed him and arrived at this location. Now that they were he, Hansu asked him how he was planning to get her out of there. To which Kim replies that there was only one way. The way they used to operate before. As they were about to get to the mission, Hansu stops him. We see that one of the six gold stars was entering the house from the back door. The detective was lashing out at President Ju for interfering with their investigation. Just then, one of the other detectives informs him that the warrant was cancelled and the vice minister of South Korea wanted to have or talk with him. After listening to the vice president, the detective realizes that they were all in cahoot in this matter. He was frustrated at the system and warns President Ju that he would definitely come back for him. He gives the order to the officers to return. As they get inside the car, the president and the others kept staring at them until the end. The detective orders the officers to get out of there naturally. He was being so cautious because he had managed to get Minji out of there. Just then, one of the body gods informs them about this. They try to stop them, but it was too late. They were already out of their reach. Director Nam was surprised because they were weak and he had definitely taken all of them down. The detective mentions that they were top in their own field. He never said that they were good at fighting. Their objective was complete and they took what they had come for. The six gold stars are more suited for search and secret operation than or battle. Now we what had occurred from Minji's perspective. The president had ordered the team leader to take her underground and wait there until he gives him the signal to come out. When Minji opens her eyes, she finds or different guy, one of the six gold stars. She was grateful for them and expresses her gratitude. But she soon realizes that these guys were no better than the others and her situation was still the same if not worse. The guy choked her and made her faint. The detective compliments him on being like them now. Inside the other car, inside which the rest of the six gold stars were, we see or figure behind them. It was known other than Kim himself. He was ready to take them down. The director detective told them to not pick up any external calls because this was a big and sensitive matter which involves President Ju and Code 66. One of the six gold stars asks the senior what was so special about Code 66 that everyone was so worked up. The senior told him that it was an arrangement with North Korea. It was the proud North who consulted them first about this. The North had one condition, to hand over Code 66 to them. The number of official kills done by the Northern military under Code 66 was 49. That is why the North was so eager to get their hands on him. The senior told the guy that it was already two times, an attempted assassination on the North's supreme leader. The guy was shocked because they only knew about the first one. The first assassination attempt was during his time as a soldier. The second time was when he wanted to get discharged and go back to the north to meet his wife and his daughter. The officer was ready to discharge him but on one condition. And the condition was to kill the supreme leader of the north. The other gold stars were shocked to hear this. But one of them wasn't moving. When the other guy tries to wake him up, he also gets strangled by Kim. 
but the guys in front had still not noticed him. After strangling both of them, Kim attacks the rest of the two in the front seat. Seeing the car acting weird all of a sudden, the other officers try to contact the directing detective but his phone was official. Kim uses the walkie-talkie to contact the detective and threatens to kill him if he even touches her strands of hair. But the detective was confident because they were already at the headquarters. He marks Kim saying how he managed to take his daughter under his nose and he couldn't do anything about it. But the detective was surprised to hear that he still hadn't given up even though they were already inside the HQ. He ordered to increase the amount of security both inside and outside and put the target on the lowest floor of the interrogation room and he would personally watch over her one-on-one. -on -one. He was also curious to see what Kim would do to rescue his daughter. We see Hansu, who was hiding below their car all this time, and he was the reason why Kim was confident that he would save her. The headquarters was in an uproar. There was a level security. They take Minji to the lowest floor to interrogate her. When she wakes up, she freaks out finding herself tied to a chair. She told them that they were mistaken and she was not whoever they were looking for. The detective calls her by her name and that surprises Minji. He asked her if she knew what kind of man his father was and what was his real identity. She told him that her father was just a regular person and he had nothing to do with anything bad. The detective gets impatient and told her that her father was a really famous spy. He was so well known that even other countries were keeping an eye on him. That's why he couldn't take any actions on his own otherwise or spy from the north would come for him. He was silent for 19 years but suddenly he is running around wreaking havoc. They didn't know the reason for his actions but the mess he was making in the process was no joke and couldn't be ignored. He asks him if she knows anything about why President Ju was involved in this mess. She told him that she had a fight with his daughter. The detective was so furious to know that he was doing all this because of some kid's fight. He thinks of him as a dangerous guy who couldn't control his emotion. So, he orders the security to shoot him by mistake. Just then a soldier comes there and told the detective that the vice minister was looking for him and he was angry. After he was gone, Minji thinks about the things he said when she sees someone outside. The guy asks him if she saw something and she denies it. He goes outside to look around as he was sure that she had seen something. Hansu was hanging to the ceiling right above him. And when he realizes someone was there, Hansu attacks him immediately. After he was done with him, he goes to the room where Minji was. He takes her with him. She was curious to know who he was and she was about to ask him. He closes her mouth and hides from the soldiers, only to get spotted by another group of soldiers. But before they could even react and inform the others about them, Hansu attacks them and takes care of all of them in just a few seconds, not letting any of them escape. On the other hand, the voice minister was lashing out at the detective for causing all this fuss and even kidnapping or civilian in this mess. The detective accuses the vice minister of getting bribed by President Ju. The vice minister gets even more furious. The detective told him that the guys he was after were legends, and he needed to go to this extent to catch those guys. They went to North Korea like they went to eat or meal there. But if this was a normal situation, he would never permit a class emergency situation. The National Special Mission Bureau crackdown team, it had to be of this extent in order to catch these guys. We see that Hansu was surrounded by soldiers. He tries to run but the detective had already a plan for that. He took into account that they might escape and he called for the Northern Division Attack Force, Beg Jusan which specializes in stealth missions. As they were trying to escape, the team attacks him from above. Hansu avoids the attack but still gets injured. Now he was finally trapped and had nowhere to go. They wanted to take care of them quickly before North hears about this and makes a move. The detective also comes there and marks him for overestimating his ability and thinking he could escape the headquarters of the special bureau. He gives the orders to take care of Hansu and keep the hostage. We see the stealth team lurking above him. They all attack him at once and he had to fight them while protecting Minji. He puts up a good fight, but even he has only two eyes. He couldn't keep up with them while protecting her, and as she was about to get stabbed, the time for her seemed as if it was stopped. She sees some threads all around that area, and before they could attack her, the vice minister gets caught in the thread and orders them to stop. It was Kim. He threatens to kill the vice minister if they even move. The detective tries to make or move, but the minister gives all the soldiers clear orders to stop and drop all their weapons. As the soldiers start dropping their weapons, 
The detective yells at them for disobeying his orders. But the minister curses the detective and the soldier drop all their weapons. The detective warns Kim saying he wouldn't be able to get out of there just because he was holding or hostage. But Kim had already thought about that. Earlier, he discusses his plans with Han Su. They knew they couldn't climb the wall with Minji. So to make their plan walk and get out of there safely, they needed all third person. And that third person was already on his way. He had already taken care of many soldiers and was lashed with powerful weapons. The detective was trying to demoralize him by saying that they couldn't even dream of getting out of there. The wall around him collapses with a blast. The wall that just collapsed leads to the parking lot directly. For their mission to rescue his daughter from the special bureau headquarters, they needed someone stubborn and crazy enough to get involved in this mess. This guy was Park Jin Keel, or really stubborn person and there wasn't much information available. The detective gets blown away in the blast as well. One of the soldiers recognizes Jin Keel, but while he was distracted by him, Hansu attacks him, takes Minji with him, and starts running away. The detective orders the soldiers to not just stand there and pick their guns up and attack them. But before they could get their hands on their weapon, Jin Keel throws a nade at Kim, who redirects it towards the weapons. The explosion takes care of all the weapons. On top of that, the vice minister keeps ordering them to stand by otherwise he would lose his life. The detective was getting furious at the vice minister's cowardly behavior. Kim asks Jin Keel if the car that he had asked for was ready, to which he replies that he came right after listening to their strategy. He came all the way here running with weapons as well. The detective has had enough of this. He says that there isn't a single commander who would order his soldier to drop their weapon. After saying this, he shoots the vice minister in the head, taking away the only advantage they had over them. The detective was determined to kill Kim today no matter what. He orders the soldiers to attack them because their weapons were destroyed. They had to fight the three of them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The three of them destroy the first wave of the soldiers in just one shot, shocking the detective and the other soldiers. Kim says that it was better this way because he couldn't just leave them be after what they made Minji go through. Minji was overwhelmed by all this, so Kim says that they had to take care of them quickly. The stealth team's leader thinks that they were joking, because there was no way they're thinking of getting out of there. While he was mocking them, he realizes that Kim was already in front of him, without him noticing. He beats their leader first and all of the other squad members attack him as well. While he was fighting, Jin Keel was having small talks with Minji. A knife comes flying at him which he shoots with his gun without breaking his conversation with her. The rest of the fight, he fights the same way. When their attacks couldn't get to him, they attack Minji. But Hansu comes in the way to rescue her again. As the fight went on, a thought flashed through the detective's mind. Maybe he was wrong to mess with him. But still, he couldn't believe how the stealth team lost. They were in the top 5% and were highly trained. While he was thinking about all that, there were only 20 people remaining, and the numbers were decreasing even more as time goes by. They were using simple martial arts, but how could they compete against military training? Jin Keel was even talking on the phone while fighting. The detective couldn't comprehend what on earth was this situation right now. And soon, the soldiers finally gave up. After he comes to his senses, he sees three middle-aged men in glasses standing in front of him and all he could do was watch as they took his keys and left. He couldn't do anything as it was an overwhelming defeat for him. And now he even had to explain the death of the vice minister. On the other hand, Director Kim gets background information on Kim. He finds out that the girl's father was in special forces. But this still changes nothing. He could still just kill him. While all of this was going on, one of the soldiers was still inside the bathroom. He comes outside hoping nothing happened while he was gone. But what he saw was a completely different story. One officer told him that the central station was wiped out by one single man. They were talking about Jin Keel. This was the reason Jin Keel was late. They get inside the car and get outside without caring about the guards. Just then, the remaining guy announces that the central station was destroyed and they were to shoot at sight any unauthorized vehicle. They start shooting at the vehicle non-stop. Kim fires back and injures one of them. Before the rest of the reinforcement could come, they were already out of their reach. Seeing this side of her father, Minji was baffled. He remembers the times that she had spent with him and how he was just a normal loving dad. But seeing him in this state made her wonder if he really was her father. As she was about to ask him about all this, he hugs her. Kim apologizes to her for putting her in this kind of danger and not coming for help sooner. 
After going through all this, she was finally relieved and couldn't stop crying. Just when they were thinking that they were safe now, a truck crashes into their car, followed by two more trucks which sound them from the side. A truck in front opens its gate, and the one waiting for them on that truck was none other than Director Nam. He was with his team and all of this was his plan. He gives the orders to start the mission. The truck behind the car pushes the car inside the other truck. Jin Kiel laughs at him for acting all tough when they were just kids. He was also curious to see what the kids these days were capable of. Park Jin Kiel, strength unknown, nickname Otter One, participated in the Civil War in West Asia three times, participated in the Civil War in the Middle East 12 times, participated in the dispute in Iraq seven times, intervened in the Palestinian surprise attack three times, and much more dangerous mission lack them over the years. He survived through all of that, with a total record of 189 kills. All three of the trucks pushed together and made the car go inside the truck. And that's how they kidnapped a whole freaking car from a regular road. Only Director Nam could come up with something like this. Meanwhile, Jin Keel still kept laughing. Inside the truck, the guards were wearing masks, and they started to fill the area with sleeping gas. Kim told Minji to just rest, he would protect her no matter what. After some time, five minutes to be exact, they stop the gas and find out that they were out cold. He ordered the men to take the girls separately and drug the rest of them. They would hand them over to the police under the charges of driving on drugs, and Director Nam would control the media. As they were about to inject the girl with the drug, the rest of the men hear something was up. The man in charge of drugging them wasn't responding so one more of them goes to check what was up. He found the guy knocked out and there wasn't anyone in the back seat as well. Just then, that guy also gets beaten by someone. Due to the smoke, they didn't know exactly what was going on. As they were about to move as well, the car starts moving and crushes one of them into the wall. The one driving the car was Kim, who was wearing a gas mask. He breaks free out of the truck breaking the gate. He was not gonna let her be captured ever again no matter what. The director orders the other trucks to get them back inside the truck. As the trucks were about to push the car as they did earlier, Kim moves out of the way and makes the two trucks crash into each other. Now it was time for the truck in the back to crash. Kim hits the truck from a corner side, making it disbalance, and that truck was also out of the way now. Now the director realizes that he was not any typical thug. He was a highly trained individual. Kim says something in sign language, and that message wasn't for him, but for the guys behind him. We see that Hansu and Jin Keel never left the truck and were standing just behind him. The author compares Jin Keel with an otter, which is infamous for the cruelty of preying on animals larger than itself. And such animals are called a beast, a brute, and sometimes a predator. There was a multinational mercenary company named AKL that moves for profitable purposes only. They would engage in activities ranging from abduction to terrorism. They would do anything as long as they get paid. Their customers range from private companies to countries. In this mercenary company, there's a system called honorary retirement, and there is one condition to retire. The people who were once your teammates, you would have to kill everyone to leave. There was a guy named David on their team who wanted to retire, but he forgot about the condition and had to face all of them by himself and dies by their hands. While taking care of the body, the other members of the team also start showing disagreements with the retirement method, and they wanted to get out of this organization as well. They were telling all this to their leader, who was known other than Director Nam himself. He killed all of his teammates all by himself, and by the rule of the honorary retirement of AKL, he was free to go now. Now in the present, that same guy was facing Hansu and Jin Keel who was just laughing at his face while letting his guard down. Director Nam suddenly attacks him, which he was unable to block, and receives the attack directly to the face. After he was down, Hansu attacks him, but Director Nam's fighting technique overpowered even him, a gold medalist in Taekwondo. Nam uses a knife and Hansu was now on defense. He was constantly dodging his attacks but not getting any openings to strike back. Hansu realizes that he was in big problem because he received too many hits and was bleeding badly. Director Nam corners him and while Hansu was distracted checking on Jin Keel, Nam hits him. He barely manages to hang on to the truck. Director Nam told him that his friend got hit in the filtrum precisely and died on the spot. Due to the gravity of the situation, he was aiming for the vital spots without a single error. 
Hansu now realizes that this guy was a professional. He was quick to judge. The most important thing in the professional world is judgment. Due to the nature of the industry which is always at the crossroad between life and death, the most important factor is judging the situation. I'm on them. Those from AKL are by far of the highest level. Director Nam was going to make it look like his death was just a mere road incident. Kim tries to come near and help, but Hansu told him to take Minji and run, while they take care of him. Just then, Director Nam realizes someone was behind him. He attacks at the same spot he did earlier, but this time Jin Kiel blocks his attack, and that shocks Director Nam. Jin Kiel falls asleep again and even started dreaming. He gave up on holding his breath during the sleeping gas stage. Eventually, he fell asleep. The human instinct of drowsiness and the boundary of willpower to wake up, somewhere in between them, you'll be in a state of fierce fighting. In other words, the him right now is in REM sleep. The director was furious at him for sleeping mid-fight and starts attacking him continuously. But Jin Kiel blocks all his attacks even in his state. When his attacks don't get past Jin Kiel, he gives up on attacking his face and goes for the belly instead. As he was about to attack, he receives a brutal punch from Jin Kiel. Finally, this was the moment for him to wake up. He was pissed because director Nam aimed for Dabin, her daughter's image that he was wearing. His strength was tremendous. Nam feels like he was just hit by a truck. Director Nam starts rambling about how he was mistaken and how their death would be reported as a death from a fall. At that moment, we see that the judgment that he was so proud of started to break down. Jin Kiel gets the smell of war from him and says he was like him in many ways but he smells like a novice too. He acknowledges Nam's strength and decided to fight him earnestly and show him man to man. Team leader Han reports to the president that he was in some kind of problem. But the president doesn't cave he loses or wins, because he was confident that no one could touch him. On the other hand, the fight between Director Nam and Jin Kiel was insane. Director Nam was striking him with insane speed but Junchul was blocking all his attacks precisely. Director Nam tries to launch a strong punch but Junchul counters it with an even faster and stronger strike, which Nam receives directly to the body and fell to the down. While he was down, Jin Kiel attacks him with his knees which he barely dodges. Director Nam couldn't understand what was going on. Jin Kiel was also using CQC, just like Director. So why Director Nam couldn't touch him at all? CQC is a skill to overpower the enemy within 30 meters. While he was thinking about all this, he didn't expect Jin Kiel to attack him from that distance. But he was shocked when he got hit by him in an instant. He understands now. He didn't want to admit it, but Jin Kiel was on another level. If Director Nam's CQC range was 30 meters, then Jin Kiel's range must be. Director Nam was shocked to imagine his range. He wonders what kind of life this man lived to have this kind of strength and range. His mind starts flooding with the thoughts of the things this man had to go through to be on this level. Did he go to war every quarter? Or maybe, he fought with the terrorist. Was he dispatched to a place like the Middle East for a few years? Jin Kiel confirms his suspicions that he was going to destroy him for disturbing his friend's happiness. At that moment, a lot of thoughts crosses Director Nam's mind. Thoughts like if he wants to fight him, he would win against him. What was the range and gap? And much more. And the choice of Director Nam who now recognizes the strong person was simpler than expected. Running away. His choice might be futile, but what he did against such a strong person was the most suitable choice. Jin Kiel also admits that he was smart and was making a good decision. He jumps off the moving truck because it was better to tumble down and break a nun than fight a monster like that. But he didn't account for was that Kim never left and was waiting for him outside. Director Nam could feel the rage coming from him. A thought crossed Director Nam's mind. First, was that the same person who kneeled down in front of them back then? If that was him, how many wrongdoings did he commit for him to live while hiding his own identity? And second, why was he now falling down? Jin Kiel was still not done with him properly. He brutally beats him and slams him against the truck's wall so hard that his face appears from the outside. And finally, Director Nam was down for good. Just then, they arrive at their destination. The guy in front didn't realize that it was the director who was getting beaten up all this time, not the other way around, and they kept driving. They were shocked to see Jin Kiel coming out of the truck instead of the director. Kim also arrives there and asks them to take care of Minji while he talks to that person. Jin Kiel asks him who he was, to which he replies that he was an extreme parent who needed to know who was more of an extreme parent. 
The section chief comes in his way to stop him, but he takes him down with just one hit. He was furious and didn't want any more from them. The rest of the small fries attack him as well, but as expected, Kim takes all of them down in an instant. He told President Ju that they needed to have a talk. President Ju starts laughing because he thinks that Kim was the same as him. He would go to any length to protect her daughter just like him. President Ju reminds him of the things that he did wrong to him. How he pretended to be nice and was using his desperation for his public image. He had said many things to him that day. The way Kim raised her daughter in poverty. He called it child abuse and humiliated him in front of her daughter. President Ju offers him to walk under him and he would pay him 100 million won per month. Kim remembers how his wife's last wish was that he took care of Minji no matter what he needed to do in the process. She had asked him to leave everything behind and just take care of their daughter. Minji's father told him that they should resolve their problem man to man. Kim told him to set the rules and he would yield a bit. President Ju has had enough and punches him first with all his might. He starts humiliating him and threatens him saying that if he were to refuse his offer and decided to go for revenge. He would make sure to make Minji's life a living nightmare with his power and money. And there would be nothing he would do that could stop that. Even after listening to all his threats, Kim punches him anyway, remembering what his wife's last wish was. Kim answers him what President had asked him before that he was from anti-North Korean operative Bechtison Unit 1, code name 66. He told him if he doesn't decide the rule, he would decide for him, and he challenges him to do one touch. On the other hand, Hyrie was worried about his father and asked his bodyguard if there was any news. Just then, the bodyguard got a call and the man on the other side of the call informed him that the section chief Nam had been passed out and he was in a very bad situation. They send more support to the location to support Chief Nam. At the location, Kim punched the president so hard that he nearly passed out just with a simple punch. But Kim stopped him from passing out and told him that it was his turn to him. This was the first in a Kim very long time President Ju had felt like this. This feeling of humiliation was too much for him. He got back up even after receiving such a blow to his face. He informed Kim it wasn't his first time dealing with someone like him and punched him again. While he was monologuing after just landing one punch. Jun hit him again in the middle of his smug speech. Kim knew the kind of person President Ju was. You make him fight until the moment he tires himself out. If you don't do that, you know that he will provoke you until the end. Right now manager Kim is completely trampling on President Ju's pride. Kim told him to hit him again as it was his turn to hit, making him even angrier. But the president calmed himself down and informed him that fist wasn't the only thing he could use. With all his connections in Korea, he could destroy him with just a phone call. That phone was worth more than his life. But before he could call anyone, Kim called some named teacher Hu Jiongji. This surprised the president who was wondering whom he was calling. When the person picked up the phone, Kim asked him for a favor. He asked him to dismantle the Junyong constructions. Teacher Hu told him that he was not sure if he could dismantle it completely, but he could do something similar. The teacher asked him if he was sure about this, and Kim replied that he was. President Ju questions him who just called. And what did he do? Just then, he got a call from his legal team. Kim suggested he pick up the call and informed him that there were skies beyond their skies. President Ju was just baffled. The teacher told Kim no matter how close they were, they couldn't just do it for free. Kim agreed to work for him and earn him back for this favor. President Ju was on his knees. He didn't know what was happening anymore. While the legal team was informing him of what was going on, Minji woke up from her sleep. She didn't remember anything after getting into the truck. She saw her father talking to President Ju. President Ju hit him again in anger asking him what he did to his company. Kim hit back, slamming his face on the bridge because they were still doing one touch. Now thanks to President Ju, it was clear to Kim that he would do anything to be a prideful father from the inside, even if he had to become a monster on the outside. Seeing this, Minji couldn't stop her tears. Hansu requested her not to hate her father too much after this. He may be clumsy in expressing his love, but she was the only one he cared about. How could she hate him after she heard him say that? That day, she saw the bottom of her dad's heart for the first time. Her dad, who never gave a proper answer to anything she asked, actually really loves her a lot. Her dad, who looked indecisive, was actually a person who lived with great determination and endurance. She thought that her father didn't know her, but she was the one who didn't know him. To cheer her up and lighten her mood, Park chin Chil asked her if he should tell her his father's secrets. Hansu told him not to tell her that story, 
But Henschel didn't listen to him, saying she needed to know everything about his father at this point. Minji was confused about what they were talking about. Henschel asked her if she knew how they met his father. But of course, she didn't know about it. He told her how they were very different in the past compared to now. Manager Kim was born in North Korea, the most closed-off country in the world. One day, the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea's major, Ryun Gryong came to his school to take students for social and physical education. He ordered the ones who were physically strong to come out and made them fight each other to determine who was the strongest. Sometime later, only one guy was standing while everyone else was on the ground, brutally beaten up. This guy was Park Young Kwong. The major chose him and he chose one more guy. We see a kid who was not letting go even though he was beaten pretty badly. The major was impressed by his tenacity and recruited him as well. This guy was Kim. He hated hunger and he would do anything to get out of that situation. That was why when he was young, he was fooled by the lie that they were going to pick members of social physical education. But he didn't know what was waiting for him next. He ended up being in a unit that nurtured spies to be dispatched to the south. When he first went to the unit, he barely remembered anything. All he remembered was his name was Kim. What he remembered was being called the number they were assigned. And Kim's number was number 73. Another thing he remembered was that he was beaten up until he forgot his name. That is how, in about a month, they forgot their first and last name. The training was hellish. Every day it was training that hung between life and death. They were being fed poison. They were underwater with their hands tied. They were shot right next to them during the night. At the end of such a training that hand between life and death, there were eight people left. Park Young was sparring with Park Young again, but he still couldn't beat him after all this time. He keeps losing to him every time they fight. Because he lost, he was beaten by the trainer, and was ordered to not eat dinner as punishment. He was roughed up pretty badly but Park Kwong offered him his share of rice ball. But Kim refused to take it thinking he was pitying him. Park Kwong wanted to help him because they were from the same middle school. But Kim attacked him and they started fighting again. It had been three years since they started training. And tomorrow was finally the day of their first operation. While the Major was briefing them about the mission, Park Young told Kim how nervous he was. But this all would be over in just the next three days anyway. If they managed to complete this mission, the country said they will allow them to have a family. Park Young was determined to come back alive and have a family. At first, Kim thought this guy was disgusting, but as they endured that telling place together, somehow, Kim thinks of him as his brother. Kim asked him if he didn't even remember his name. How was he going to start a family? Park Young told him that his name was Kim. Park Young forgot his own name, but somehow he remembered his name. Kim was shocked to hear his own name which he had forgotten long ago. That day, his eyes came to life for the first time. He found a reason to live. The next night, they were sent to a mission right away. As they arrived at their target location, they couldn't get in touch at the important moment and came to nothing. Kim told his brother about the situation. He decided to enter the villa first and capture it. They came bursting through the door, but they found an explosive on a chair. Unfortunately, it was a trap. His comrade died in front of his eyes. He yelled at Park Young asking if he was okay. Park Young assured him that they were not in much trouble even though he was heavily injured. His leg was detached from his body due to the explosion, but he wasn't making a big fuss over it because he didn't want to freak out Kim. He made fun of Kim for crying like a baby over nothing. Just then, the headquarters contacted them, ordering them to hold the mission and take their own life in the name of their country, so that the information wouldn't leak to the enemy. Park Young told Kim to not believe in any of the BS that they spout and live. It was his first and last request to Kim. Park Young died in his arms after his last wish. Eventually, he survived and was caught. He was handed over to closed military facilities. After some time, the major of South Korea was interviewing Kim. But he couldn't find any answers he was looking for as Kim didn't remember anything about him. But the major did know about his achievement and that he was an elite in North Korea. He asked the elite of South Korea if he could take him on. This guy was young Park Jin Chil, who was a rocker. There was no more information available on him. In Park Jin Chil's theory, the only way to kill was to fight with the intent to kill. He warned Kim to do his best if he wanted to live. Kim remembered what his brother had told him and what was his last wish. Park Young had a request. He had asked Kim not to forget him. If he forgets him, there's no one who will remember him. To which Kim replies that there was no way that he was going to forget him even if he wanted to. They've been stuck together for the past three years. He was number 73 and Park Kim was number 6 to 6. He was going to remember him by all means. He told Jinchul that he didn't even cave he lived or died. He just wanted to fulfill his comrade's request 
and he would do anything to fulfill that. Jinchul finds it a solid reason to live, the feeling of wanting to remember. He asked him what his name was, to which he replied to call him by his number, number 6 to 6. He took his brother's number instead of telling him his number, which was number 73. It was so that he didn't forget him ever. After some time, we see both of them out of breath and covered in blood. The major's office was completely destroyed, so he ordered them to go fight outside. But Jinchul told the manager that he wasn't going to fight him anymore. He showed him his weaknesses many times, but he never came in. But even then, he didn't want to lose either. Jinchul realized it was his skills that were the real deal. As soon as Kim came in, he had already checked out all the edges. He had already instinctively memorized everything he'd need to fight in his environment. Before leaving, Jinchul suggested he keep what he had said to him in mind. After he was gone, Kim advised the Major to get rid of him because he was an idiot and was too soft. The Major informed him that they don't just go around killing people in South Korea. He even offered to teach him how to live like a normal human being. The Major was a friendly person, and as he taught him, Kim learned to live like a normal person in South Korea. It had been two years since then. Kim was now a part of the South Korean force. The Major assigned him to be a part of the Northern Maneuver saying it was his chance to get back at his motherland that abandoned him and to prove his patriotism to the South. Then he would be able to acknowledge him as his son. But behind that friendly facade, there was a hidden reason. After the Northern Maneuver team left for their mission, an officer told the Major about the concern that the President had. He had expressed his concern about having a North Korean member within the unit. That's why the President wanted to see Number 6 to 6 deceased after the completion of the mission, and the Major was completely fine with this. They arrive at the mission's location and are ready to move in. We see a North Korean Major, who was planning to sell some top secrets. But before that, a bullet pierced through his head. They easily acquire the documents. Before moving on to their next task, they got orders from above to get rid of Kim. The soldier apologized to him saying there were some people above who were uncomfortable with him. Moments later, the North Korean Peshort team entered the hideout and what they saw shocked them. Everyone was down and soaked in blood except for Kim. He voluntarily got arrested. He was so tired of it that he wanted to give it all up, but thinking of his brother number 66, he couldn't do that. He was being interrogated and tortured, but he was still not opening his mouth. Just then, a senior officer comes there who immediately recognizes who he was. There was a rumor that he could kill anyone. This guy was the person who had chosen him as a candidate. He freed him from there and took him with him saying he was his buddy from years ago. While they were chit-chatting, Kim asked him with his emotionless face why he made them forget their name for absolutely no reason at all, and that if he had taken them in, he should have taken care of them, not throw them away. He was clearly hurt, was crying, but he was showing no emotion on his face. The Major informed him that he was forced to do that. If he hadn't done it, someone else would have replaced him. But even then, he was sorry. He gave him a second chance to live his life as long as he stayed in the town. Ironically, the first taste of freedom he felt was in North Korea. It was infuriating and unbelievable at the same time. And this is when he met the girl of his life in that place. It was love at first sight. They soon expressed their feeling to each other. But his happiness didn't last long. The Major wanted him to get rid of someone. He informed Kim that the rumors of him being back were spreading like wildfire and it was not easy to suppress them. Rumor has it that they were planning to get rid of him and his future wife. Kim understood the mission. He would kill for him and in return, the Major would provide him and his wife protection. The man Major wanted gone was known other than the Supreme Leader's eldest son, but Kim didn't hesitate even for a second and took the job. At the same time, in South Korea's National Intelligence Service headquarters, someone else took this job as well. They told the guy that the eldest son had developed a nuclear weapon. That's why, for the sake of South Korea, he ordered Janchul to eliminate him. He was coming to Harbin in China for some business. This was their only chance to get their hands on him. And not just him. There was one more guy who was given the contract to eliminate the eldest son. It was Sung Hansu, the Taekwondo medalist. Due to the impossible nature of the mission, those three of them were about to meet for the first time. Kim arrived at the hotel where the target was staying, but he was there a week before him to prepare for his plan. He asked them for the rooms that were above or below the room the target was going to stay in, but those rooms were already occupied. Kim understood something was wrong. We see that those rooms were occupied by Jinchul and Hanso, who were already preparing for their mission. Not having any other choice, 
Kim took room 1406, which was the same room that the eldest son was going to stay in a week. The receptionist told him that he would have to empty that room within a week though. Kim knew they were listening to him and gave them a message. He told them that since their mission overlapped with each other, they should have a conversation so that they wouldn't interfere with each other's mission. He invited them to a nearby restaurant. Kim was waiting for them when he saw someone familiar. He immediately recognizes Hanchel and asks him what was he doing there. Hanchel made an excuse saying he was just there to meet someone and just happened to be in the same hotel. After that, Hanchel suggested he put down the gun that he was holding. He was not here to fight him. Kim puts away his gun and suggests he does the same. When Kim saw how much firepower he was carrying, he asked him if he had lost his mind. They both point out how their outfits looked super suspicious. But their outfit was nothing compared to how much Hansu's attire stands out. They immediately recognized that he was the third dude. All three of them have a drink together while pointing out that their first and foremost priority should be not to stand out. They both insulted Hankil's outfit. Hansu was done with all the BS and told them that he was there to eliminate the eldest son of the North Supreme Leader, and he ordered both of them to stay out of his way. Jinchul felt as if his prey was being stolen from him and also stated his purpose of coming here and challenged them to stop him if they could. Hansu took this personally and started laughing. Then he proceeds to break the table in front of him. Their plan to lay low was a bust. Everyone there was now looking at them including some gang members. They started fighting while Kim was just sitting thinking about what the Major had told him. If this mission failed due to some outsider, they all be dead, including his girl. He suggested that they should decide some whales who was the boss once and for all. That way, no one would be able to interfere with the mission. But before that, they had something else to take care of. The gang of that area had surrounded them for causing chaos in their region. Without a word, all three of them understood the assignment. Just the three of them took the whole gang down within a few minutes. As they were about to fight among themselves, the cops came there and they had to run away. When the cops arrived at the restaurant, they found all of the gang members on the ground, but there was no sign of the three of them. Three days after the incident, Kim was in the hotel again when Hansu also came there and SAT next to him. Coincidentally, they were thinking the same thing. And these two were not the only ones who were thinking the same thing. Jinchul was also there. Hansu told them that it had to be him who got rid of the eldest son. They should just stay out of it, and their mission would also be completed without them having to lift even a finger. But Kim remembered what the Major had ordered him. He needed to be the one to kill him or there was no reason for the Major to provide security to her girlfriend. As they were quarreling over who should be the one to kill him, the eldest son's security arrived there before they were supposed to. When they found out someone else was using the room they were planning on taking, they found it weird. Because that room was the most expensive one. They found it very suspicious and decided to look for another hotel. They also increased the security level. At that time, without talking, they all came to the conclusion that the mission had just become impossible to do alone. At this point, it would be a war of information. They were thinking the same thing and saying the same thing at the same time that they should work together. They made a plan with all the information that they had and decided to gather the next day at 2 p.m. The thing that they were more concerned about was the security. They had no idea who was coming as the security guards. The next day, all three of them arrived there three hours before the assigned time. They argue with each other about why they were there before the assigned time when a security guard spots them. But before he could even do anything, he was barraged by Hansu and Kim. While these two were busy dealing with him, Jinchul ran inside while screaming. All the guards were now after Kim and Hansu. Before they could take their guns out, Kim shot them with his gun. Jinchul enters the hotel and is welcomed with a punch to his face. This guy was from the North Korean security team named Dandelion and his name was Mun TBM. Hansu was also attacked by someone skilled out of nowhere. The guy knew he was Hansu, the national medalist in Taekwondo. He was also from the security Dan Alliance. While the security guards were focusing on those two, Kim managed to enter the room where the eldest son was supposed to be. But when he arrived at the room, he couldn't believe what he saw. His wife was also there between all the security guards. She saw him sneaking into the room and told him to just come outside and that they needed to talk. The guard freaked out hearing number 73 was there. But he easily got rid of them and came down to ask her what was going on. He asked her to explain to him this well because he was not in his right mind. He was saying all this while crying. But before she could say anything, the captain of the Dandelion security came there and informed him that she was just a puppet all this time. The Major used her to get to him and use him as well. The explanation was simple. To the Major who wanted to start a coup d'etat, Kim was the best fit because he was a special agent whose identity isn't even known. However, 
He needed a way to tame him. So he trained a whole village of actors, and for over half a year, he completely deceived him. The captain confirmed with Lim Yujin if he was really the number 73. After she told him that he was, he was about to shoot her saying her job was done now. And she accepted her fate without question. But Kim came in front of the bullet to save her. Lim Yujin was shocked to see him save her even after what she had done to him. Even Kim didn't know why saved her. Probable because she was just a puppet that he loved. The captain informed him that she didn't know about the coup d'etat. And that was why he was going easy on her and giving her a quick death. Kim asked him if there was any way they could survive. What if he kills all of them and they no one would know about his existence anyway? On the other hand, Hansu and the other guy from the Dandelion security were going toe to toe against each other. The guy watched all of Hansu's moves on television and says that his moves were only flashy. He didn't know the basics. He attacks Hansu again which he blocks only to be overwhelmed by his other moves which he keeps launching again and again. The guy was overpowering Hansu in every expect. He calls his spinning technique was just flashy. But all this talking made Hansu realize the basics of spinning. He jumped very high and spun a number of times in the air before landing a critical hit on him. With his neck down, the guy was down for good this time. Just then, we see Jinchul, who had picked up his opponent in the air who was twice his size. He was someone who could pick up a grown fall with his hands being lifted by someone. Jinchul slams him on the ground, but the guy immediately got back up after feeling insulted like that for the first time in his life. On the other hand, after listening to Kim's bluff about killing everyone, the captain gives up on the thought of capturing him alive. He shoots him without hesitation, and more than once at that. The captain knew Kim could turn everything upside down because he had no identity. After he killed him, he gave the gun to his wife and ordered her to kill herself. She took the gun without hesitation and pointed it towards herself, saying if it was the order of the supreme leader, she would take her life without hesitation. But before shooting herself, she states that she genuinely loved him just like she was ordered. After saying that, she pulls the trigger but nothing happens. The captain complimented her loyalty and figured she could be useful to him. Jinchul and his opponent were still going toe to toe against each other. None of the two were backing down. Hansu took this opportunity to sneak into room number 306 where the eldest son was supposed to be. But when he arrived there, he found the security captain coming out of the room. The captain started shooting at him without any second thoughts. Hansu asked him what happened to the guy who was inside the room. To which the captain replied that number 73 died with a hole in his chest. Hansu was confused because there was no way he could die with holes in his chest. Because before coming he, Jinchul gave both of them bulletproof vests. And with that, we see him standing behind the captain. He snatched the gun from the captain and informed him while beating him that he had already lost a friend to them. He was not gonna lose his woman as well. The captain laughs at him saying that women didn't know how to love. She was just a puppet. Also, they should have made a run for it when they had the chance. We see that there was more reinforcement. There were 76 more security guards from the Dandelion group. And on top of that, Jinchul was getting his ass kicked. His opponent was overpowering him greatly and was beating him brutally. He acknowledged that Jinchul was strong, but that was not enough to defeat someone like him. The guy even insulted his hair and his overall outfit. Jinchul was passing out. He met his idols while he was passed out, who couldn't accept that the rock mentality was being insulted. And Jinchul was the only one who could stop that from happening. That's why he couldn't lose just yet. Jinchul got back up and was more powerful and stronger than before. He started to overpower Moonyeb. The guy could feel that he was not much stronger and faster than before. And right now he was being overpowered by a small fry like that. He knew that if he didn't put his guard up, he would die for sure. But Munyab was someone who never needed to put his guard up against anyone. That's why his guard wasn't very profound. It was full of openings. And with his next attack, he managed to take Munyab down. While he was celebrating his victory, he was surrounded by a bunch of guards. The captain was suggesting they surrender, and he might consider letting them live. Just then, Jinchul came screaming asking what they did. Because the gang from earlier was he, and they were looking for them as well. It was Hansu who came up with this plan. He dared them to come to this location and told them that his subordinates would be waiting for them. And that went according to plan. The thugs from China were fighting the goons from North Korea. Like they had said before, they were going to get out of here live with the women, because they were not alone in this. Kim and Hansu continue to tag team on Beak as they attempt to take him down. They manage to land a few hits and finally make him unable to fight anymore when suddenly Chiel comes flying in with a kick, but as he's about to hit him, 
Beak dodges it and grabs him by the collar of his vest and throws him away. Hansu exclaims that the National Security Bureau is definitely on another level. Beak knocks over Chiol and tells them that they get along pretty well and asks if they're brothers. Hansu jokingly says that they are not brothers but they are made in America as he shows him his Nike shoes. Beak runs towards them cussing and attacks both of them at the same time. He says to Hansu that he should joke to his grandfather's grave or should he sew his mouth so that he can stop talking and get it together. But they are quick to counterattack and hit him at the same time and tells him to stop talking to them and focus more on guarding himself. As they're fighting Beak orders Animal to pick up the gun that is lying in front of her. She hesitatingly picks up the gun and he order her to shoot. Everyone fighting outside is stopped by the gunfire. Hansu and Kim also stop for a moment because they cannot believe that she just shot Beak through the neck as he stands there trying to get a grasp of air to breathe. Earlier when Beak had shot Kim she was there seeing all of it and Kim had told her before passing out that the gun was empty so that when Beak asked her to shoot herself she didn't hesitate and did it. As he stood there with blood draining down his throat he asked if she already knew the gun had no bullets to which she replies that she was ordered to love Kim sincerely and she did so. Soon the police arrive at the place and arrests everyone present on the scene. She says to Kim that she should hand her over to the police but he disagrees and is not ready to leave her alone. Hansu chokes him out and carries him out of there without getting in the sight of police, and Chiel comes behind him carrying her on his back as they make their way out. They reach the city and are on their way to a pawn shop. They reach an underground place with neon lights all over, and are greeted by an elderly man, Su Penquan, who is 72 years old and the owner of the Chion Wai Chion pawn shop. Penquan is sitting there with women and alcohol all around seeing which Kim asks Hansu if he's the right guy to which he replies that he has only heard about him through rumors and never really got to know him. Penquan asks them if they are the same guys who caused trouble at the Harbin, and they're shocked how fast the rumors have spread. He asks them what they're going to do if he reports them to which Hansu replies that if he intended to report them, he wouldn't let them in there. He further says to him that he has heard he is expert in laundering, so he should shut up and do what he's an expert in. Penquan is hurt, and a tear rolls down his cheek as women rush to console him. They all exclaim that he is very soft compared to what he looks like when suddenly his crew attacks them, but they manage to knock them out easily. He mocks them by saying that they lack skills, and Hansu tells him to hurry up as they don't have a lot of time. Penquan gets up and jumps straight in front of Hansu, and tells him that not only careers but money from all all the world comes to his pawn shop for laundering, but in order for the exchange they have to fulfill one condition. They are worried as to what the condition would be as he pulls out a fridge full of alcohol. He tells them that they have to do a drinking race with him, and if they beat him, he will do the laundry free of charge. They agree and Kim goes first. Hansu asks if he will be able to do it well which he replies that he had much worse drinks when he was training and it'll be easy but is passed out in only two glasses. Next Chiel sits down and gets ready. They both start drinking and continue drinking until the box is completely finished. Penquan orders more and tells the workers to continue bringing the alcohol until all the bottles run out in the bar. They both continue to drink and all the alcohol is finally finished and Chiel is exhausted while Penquan sits there smiling and says that it's been a while since someone gave him a competition. He says that he will do their laundering but not of Kim and Animal to which Hansu replies that they're the most important ones but he doesn't agree. Hansu kneels down and asks him to help them too because they are his friends. Hansu is standing outside on the roof of a building. Chiel asks him to come inside since it's very cold and says that in the end things eventually worked out and he agreed for the laundering. The next morning Penquan calls the head secretary of the presidential secretariat Choi Ki Hyung and asks for a favor as he explains that he wants to launder Kim and his friends across the border but Ki Hyung refuses and says it's not possible even if it's his favor. He further says that things are already out of hand because he is still alive and the relationship between North and South are already very bad. Penquan tries to convince him and says that the relationship between North and South is not today's matter and it has always been like that and that he should see the bigger picture. He explains that since he's looking for Kim and it's his dream from a long time of the North Korean squadron of Mount Bak Du and they can use him. They all look confused and Kim tries to say something but Chiel shots him up. He convinces the secretary and makes a deal with him for $2 million. After hanging up the phone he tells them that they are going to South Korea to get their identities laundered. He further tells them that Hansu will ride a ship together with but they need to throw some odds on the girl since she has no backstory, so she will take another ship in two days. Kim tries to argue because he doesn't want her to be alone, but she convinces him and tells him that she will come to see him as soon as she reaches there, 
and Peng Kwon guarantees her safe travel. As they are traveling on the ship, Kim doubts if things will go as planned, but they convince him that it will be all right as he sits there looking at an old pocket watch with her picture in it that she has him before he left. But that farewell was the last time he saw her. Ten years later he was discharged from the Mount Baokdu and still had the watch with her picture in it. He takes the watch for repair but the owner of the shop says that the parts are not from their country so he cannot fix it. The owner's wife comes in, looks at the picture and says she looks like Sujin, the girl who helps her at work. Kim goes to the place the old lady was talking about and sees her there. He walks up to her with tears rolling down his cheeks as she looks at him and says he found her. They go to her house together and Kim passionately kisses her against the wall. She stops him and says that it's been so long she is feeling a bit shy and asks him to at least turn the lights off first. Some time later Kim is looking at some flowers kept in a pot. She comes out of the shower and tells him that it's the honeysuckle flower and it represents devoted love. He then asks her how she's been and why didn't she try to find him? She hesitates a little and then tell him she asked Peng Kwon to send her away some wells because she didn't want to be a burden on him. Hearing this Kim gets emotional and hugs her tightly and tells her that if that was the reason then he understands completely. The next day he is presented before the team leader in an inquiry room. The leader asks him why did he sleep with that woman when they already told him to avoid civilian contact. He says that he is a man too and has needs sometimes too so it was just a one night stand. The leader still suspects him when another soldier enters the room and tells him that the woman was not there when they sent their men for her. Kim gets shocked hearing this and the leader believes that he is telling the truth based on his reaction. The punishment he got for meeting with her again was an immediate dispatch to an unknown remote island in the West Sea. The barracks were almost fallen. No proper diet all he had to do was train. It was like living in a prison, but he didn't feel like imprisoned because he was happy to know that she was in Korea. He was sitting in the changing room one day when suddenly his phone rang. He picked it up and it was Peng Kwon. He asked why did he call him suddenly after 10 years. Peng Kwon replies that his woman is pregnant and is currently in labor. He asks Kim to immediately be there. A doctor comes rushing in and shouts that the woman died while giving birth and Kim is shocked to hear this. When he reaches there, Peng hands him the baby and tells him that her last wish was to name her Minji, and he should do whatever it takes to take care of her. He rushes to the general in command of Mount Baokdu and asks for immediate dispatch, so they give him the task of bringing back the VIP and the Baokdu troops within 12 hours. He agrees and tells them he will bring him in 3 hours, and everyone is shocked. The supreme leader of North Korea slams his desk angrily and says what did his wife's nephew, Jong Sun done? and what was he thinking that he kidnapped the president of South Korea. The general of defense replies that they are doing all they can but cannot find him, it apparently happened during the internation talks. A black car speeds away in some remote place. The president is tied by ropes and his face is covered by a mask. A man in the car asks Johnson if they are doing the right thing. He looks at him quite annoyed and replies that the supreme leader hasn't been doing his job lately and is just being forced into the pact by sweet talk. The supreme leader asks the general what should they do now and he suggests him to stay safe in the Bongwa chamber one because the Americans might use this opportunity to attack him and no one will be able to find him here. Kim reaches the facility knocks out one of the guards and impersonates the guard. He reaches the Bongwa Chamber 1 facility gates and tells the guards that he's here for a special word with the Supreme Leader and that he's from Unit 51. One of them looks suspicious as Kim walks by them. He tries to say something but the other guard stops him by saying his ID card read Unit 51 so he must really from there. Earlier that day, Kim swore to bring back the president within three hours and everyone present there was shocked. He says that he does not need to find the president of South Korea, but instead he will use the supreme leader to bargain with the kidnappers. He had already called Peng Kwon and asked him to inform the general that there is a spy among the supreme leader's men, and he needs to be shifted as he's not safe there. As soon as the general heard this, he immediately told the supreme leader to bring as few men as possible and meet him at the sixth aisle. In the event of a national security crisis, the president uses the sixth aisle situated underground to escape to a war bunker. Kim reaches the sixth aisle with a carabag in his hand and takes out some ropes. As he's taking them out, few soldiers spot him and ask what was he doing. They go on to inspect his bag, but suddenly Kim attacks them as they try to defend themselves. He takes out every single one of them and proceeds with his plan. As the supreme leader and the general are reaching towards the sixth aisle, they spot their soldiers lying on the ground. 
He orders the driver to ignore them and move faster. Suddenly their tires get locked by ropes which Kim had tied earlier in the way. They try to make sense of the situation, but Kim quickly attacks as soon as they stop and orders them to surrender. Johnson is flabbergasted when he hears the news that the president has been kidnapped. His men tell him that investigation is going on, but there is not news as to where he has been taken. Johnson gets down on his knees and starts crying. Meanwhile at the headquarters a soldier tells the general that the president has been captured as they look at him worriedly. He further tells him that Kim cleared the sixth aisle by himself and is on his way with one hostage to Injun River. As Kim is about to reach the bridge, the North Korean army spots them and orders everyone to not shoot because the bullets might hit the president. The president asks Kim that it's the first time he has been tied up like this and he must know the president quite well and what's his name. On the other hand, everyone at the headquarters is continuously trying to contact Kim when suddenly the defense minister walks in and angrily asks the general what is going on to which he replies that they were already in a bad position and this plan was the best way to return the South Korean president. Suddenly they receive a call from the kidnappers of the South Korean president. They agree to return him and ask for the safety of the supreme leader. The general tells him to reach the Injun River with the president in one hour. Kim drives through the barricades and drifts to the edge of the river such that half the car is outside the bridge and could fall any minute. He tells both sides of the army to not do anything otherwise he will drive the car off the edge. At the same time the Republic sent their men to the hospital at which Minji was kept and they started looking for her everywhere and causes havoc at the hospital. They bout the nurses while asking them where the baby was kept. The gate opens and Hansu works in with a smile on his face and a new haircut. Sometime earlier Hansu arrives at Penquan's pawn shop to complete his side of the deal. He welcomes him and asks him to keep his luggage down and orders someone to bring the contract copy. Hansu thinks that he screwed up and maybe the collateral he was talking about earlier might be that he wants him to be his slave. He hands him the contract and it treats that Hansu will work under Penquan as his servant and won't deny any of his orders until his period of service runs out. If he manages to fulfill his duties, he will be discharged with certain incentives. Penquan sits down smiling and says he almost died cleaning up the Harbin matter, and it still reminds him of them. He nonchalantly says that he should think of the contract as just another 10 years of them working together. He also tells him that he will make Hansu stronger while he works for him. He looks confused and says with pride that he doesn't need to get stronger, he is already strong enough. Peng gets up from his seat excitedly and laughs like a maniac. He says that his pride is what makes him special, but in martial arts the source of power is humility and conduct, and that's why they have got to fix his manners, and if he's about to follow a path of martial arts, he needs to have character. Peng sends to a shed built on a secluded mountain, and an old man rung to his limit is standing outside of it. Hansu greets him as the master of the Gyukchen martial arts headquarters, Kanahara Kuda, and says Peng has sent him to receive his care. Cut to today. He reaches the hospital and smiles at the men sent to take Kim's daughter as they are causing havoc everywhere in search of her. Their head looks at Hansu and asks angrily who is he and what he is doing there. He further says that the hospital is off today and he should go somewhere else as he grabs him by the collar of his kimono. As they're about to attack him he easily beats them with the new karate he learnt. On the other hand, things seem very tense on the bridge as the car is moving forward slowly but the kidnappers are nowhere to be seen. The supreme leader warns Kim that he will be chased for the rest of his life because he kidnapped him. Suddenly Johnson reaches there with the president and surrenders. As things were going smoothly, Kim pressed the accelerator of the car and it goes off the bridge, and everyone is shocked to see this. The Republic goes crazy because of what he did when they already arrived with the President. An unidentified helicopter arrives at the bridge and Cheel stands at its gate ready to jump. The pilot asks if he really wants to do it to which he replies that this is how the way of men is and jumps straight into the river. Five years earlier, Cheel had been promoted to officer but he refused to be promoted, and his reasoning being that a soldier's duty is to truly be loyal to his country and rank doesn't matter to him. The general says that he has to dispatch him to a special mission but he refuses and says there is a concert of rock star Janet which he has to attend. Suddenly a woman officer, Ganso Rung works in and asks the general about the dispatch mission. Cheel looks back and is taken aback by the beauty of the officer. He feels like there is a spring breeze with the smell of flowers infused in it, and his heart starts pounding very fast. He gets on his knees and grabs Sorai's hands and asks her name, 
It feels to him as love at first sight. She looks down on him and tells him that she doesn't even recognize men who are lower in rank than her, and he's just a nobody. Chiel gets up and tells the general to dispatch him to the deadliest mission and just get his promotion faster. So, he was sent to Somalia, and he became the first person in Asia or even the whole world to single-handedly unify northern Somalia. After returning from Somalia, he went straight to help Kim. He jumps from the helicopter and lands straight in the river. He starts looking for Kim and Supreme Leader. He spots them and quickly swims towards them. But to his despair, the North Korean army starts firing at the river and he gets hit with a bullet in his leg. He gathers the strength to move forward because if he loses them then he will not be able to find them later. He tries to move forward but the current of the river slows him down to the extent that he loses them. Kim swims ashore with the president and sits him down on a tree and moves forward. Meanwhile in the headquarters the minister says that he has betrayed the republic and is no longer the citizen of the republic and is just a terrorist now. The general stands there not able to do anything and orders to remove all records of him and send a strike team to take him down. Before going on the mission to kidnap the president he had contacted Hansu and asked him to help protect his daughter and send him to the hospital. Hansu asked him what if things go wrong to which he replies that they won't but even if so, they have a trump card. Unit 51 is ordered to hunt down Kim. They close down all exits and blows the entrance to all the tunnels. Kim stops on hearing the blast and thinks that the strike team is working faster than he had expected. As he starts to run forward, he gets shot in the arm. He hides behind the trees and two of the Unit 51 start looking for him but he attacks them sneakily and knocks one of them out. As he is about to attack the second one and other bullets hits him in the other arm. The leader of Unit 51 stands there with other members and tells him that there is nowhere to run now. As he's talking to Kim Chiel comes and knocks one of them down. He looks back to see who it is as he stands there and rips off his shirt. Chiel rips his shirt off and they all look at him shocked as to why he did so, but immediately blinded by a flash. Chiel throws flashbangs and blinds them all as he walks through them without any problem. He stands before Kim and says it's been so long since they last saw each other. He replies that they can save the talk for later and right now they should focus on the escape route. The leader of Unit 51 comes out of the smoke and points his gun at them, but Chiel throws a grenade at them and there is a huge blast. The whole strike team is defeated as Chiel carries Kim out of there and they move forward. As they are walking, Chiel asks how does he plan to escape and he replies that he has hit a paraglider in the forest because all the land routes have been shut and since his both arms are short, he cannot swim that's why they need to escape through air. They reach the shore, Chiel looks at the water and sees a motor boat and asks Kim how did it reach there to which he replies that he also hid it here. Kim gets on the boat and asks him to get on but they hear the army reaching them. Chiel says that he heard Kim did all this because of his daughter that's why it's important for him to stay alive and he pushes the board into the water. Kim shockingly shouts at him to get on but it's too late. The army reaches him and is about to shoot. He promises Kim to return alive as he takes out another grenade, and there is another blast as Kim looks with disappointment in his eyes. In the present time, Chiel is explaining this all to Minji who has a look of shock and disbelief on her face. She asks him out of the whole story how much is true. He tells Minji that her father really loves her very much and she should never leave her side. The police arrive on the scene and surround them. Kim walks up to Minji. She hugs him tightly and asks him to promise to never leave her side and she promises the same to him. Quite some time later they get out of the situation. They get busy in their work and it becomes hard for Minji and Kim to meet more often because he is busy in his work. Hansu calls Kim to ask how he is doing and if he joined the job Peng told him about. He replies that he will go to the interview after the investigation is completed. He asks Hansu to take care of Minji as he is walking towards the office. Tihoon arrives at home and they hang up. Kim reaches a shop which says White Tiger Forces. He takes a deep breath and works inside for the interview. Kim reaches an old looking building and checks the address one more time to confirm it's the right one because it doesn't look like an office, but again, he thinks if it's someplace suggested by Peng Kwon, then it must be it. He walks in the room mentioned on the paper and stops midway because there is a man standing naked. Kid there and two men are lying on the floor beaten to a pulp. He says that he's there for the interview and Peng Kwon has sent him. The man looks at him and grabs a robe saying it's very indecent of him to not even wear anything. He puts on the robe and asks if they should start the interview. They sit down and Kim looks a bit nervous because the man doesn't have any pants on. He introduces himself as White Tiger Forces Manager Lee Dogyu. He asks Kim for the resume and his background. He starts asking him questions about why he is he and what his surname is. He replies that he is there to earn some money 
and in a timid voice he says that his surname is Kim. Lee shouts at him to speak loudly and tells him if he doesn't want the job he can get out. He leaves, and as he's leaving the place, he thinks that there is no other way for him to correct what he has done, and he really needs the money so he turns around. Lee sees him and asks what is he doing there to which he replies that he is there for the interview. Lee tells him to hit him however he wants and Kim pinches him in the stomach. He continues hitting him but he holds a bit back because he doesn't want to kill him. Lee seems to be enjoying it. While fighting he says that he definitely has the strength most of the youngsters are missing these days. As he's about to hit Lee again he stops him midway and grabs his punch and tells him to not hold back just because he looks old. The people in the office on the lower floor exclaim that they are again making noise. One of them go to their floor and opens the door to tell them not to make so noise but is shocked to see them fighting. Lee breaks the door apart and hits Kim with it but he dodges it and counterattacks him with a punch that sends him flying and he looks genuinely hurt. He stops and says it's not good to kill someone just because of an interview. The worker from the office on the lower floor is standing at the door and seeing Lee and Kim fight and thinks to himself, JX second-hand cars, two years in the business and specializes in the sale of used cars a business that pursues honest and sincere intermediary. Majority of everyday work includes responding to customer inquiries, vehicle inspection, etc. Operating normally as expected, but this company right now is witnessing a small war. Lee attacks Kim and says they'll see who is going to kill who. Kim replies that he thought he would judge the level of his strength through the punches he has landed until now. Lee attacks him again and says that he must have figured it out until now what white tiger forces do. They do anything as long as they get paid for it. In other words what they look for in an interview is the posture of a pro who is ready to do anything for money. He continues attacking him against the wall with tremendous speed and Kim defends with all his power. He further tells them they receive high profile cases and are paid in advance with no refunds and they don't take powerless customers in the first place. In other words they can earn as much as they want and can earn billions of dollars depending on their work. He stops attacking and turns around. Kim gets up and asks what about the employee's welfare to which he replies they partner with four top insurance companies as Kim hits him and he hits the wall in front of him. Lee asks if he agrees and he replies positively. He further tells him that the first round of the interview is over and it's time for the second round as he attacks the worker from earlier. He says that since the nature of their job they have a lot of rescue operations so he needs to save this man. As he's about to hit the boy Kim uses strings and makes his punch miss. He gets accepted for the job and they both look happy. Another man in a suit works in the office smoking a cigarette. He is the deputy director Kim yong Chil. They sit down He yong Chil tells Lee that there is another mission. The former deputy minister's granddaughter has gone missing and he them to find her. She had caused some trouble in her school by beating someone too badly and has been missing in the past one month. He further explains that the family receives messages of her well-being but when they go to call the number it doesn't connect. yong Chil asks if he should go but Lee tells Kim to go and he is now a manager of White Tiger Forces. Kim reaches the Yunshin High Schools as a new teacher and the students there are very rebellious. One of them, Lim Hyung Tuck, gets up and challenges Kim to a fight. In the headquarters of White Tiger Forces, Lee dog Yu engaged in a conversation with Kim yong Chil, seeking clarification on recent events. Kim yong Chil, curious about dog Yu's lackluster interview performance, speculated if it was due to dog Yu's fondness for him. Amused, dog Yu pressed further, asking if he had inadvertently hurt Kim's feelings. Kim clarified that his inquiry stemmed from curiosity, noting that dog Yu's sub pop performance was out of character. dog Yu laughed saying it was simple he didn't want a talented person to leave during a labor shortage. Shifting to a school setting, manager Kim found himself under interrogation by students curious about the meaning of an interview. The exchange took a physical turn as one student threw a punch, only for manager Kim to deftly dodge the attack, leaving the student bewildered. Manager Kim seized the moment to emphasize the importance of dressing neatly, engaging in a well-choreographed series of maneuvers to assert his authority. As he continued this unconventional disciplinary method, the students, left battered and confused, cursed him for his unorthodox approach. Returning to White Tiger Force's headquarters, Dog Yu elaborated on the reasoning behind assigning a peculiar task to manager Kim. Acknowledging Kim's esteemed courier, Dog Yu believed that, with a bit of discipline, he could transform into the ace of white tiger forces. Kim questioned if manager Kim could handle the situation better, prompting Dog Yu to clarify that the task came to expose the darker side of money and provide the newcomer with a comprehensive learning experience, not to compare capabilities. Back in the school, manager Kim continued his dual role as a teacher and an enforcer, defeating students with finesse, 
leaving them puzzled about his identity and the unusual class dynamics. Manager Kim concluded the class with an announcement of an unexpected repeat of history due to the students' expulsion of their previous teacher. In a restroom, Manager Kim found himself ambushed by two formidable students from the gatekeeper crew of Yongshin High. Despite the surprise attack, Manager Kim skillfully defended himself, leaving the students astonished. At the golf course, the Deputy Prime Minister leisurely engaged in a round of golf when his bodyguard delivered news of the White Tiger Force's commencement. Inquisitive about the credibility of the information, he learned that Manager Lee Dong Yu was at the heart of the action. To emphasize his disappointment, he set up a golf ball on a man's mouth, expressing regret for delving into truths beyond his grasp. The man, unable to speak due to a golf pin, suffered further when the deputy prime minister took a shot, leaving him bloodied. Back at the school, the students who had confronted Manager Kim found themselves overpowered and sought forgiveness, unaware of his strength. Manager Kim, dismissing the incident, revealed he was searching for individuals for a proposal he had in mind. Upon hearing the proposition, the larger students questioned its validity, prompting Manager Kim to affirm its truth and assure them of his expertise in the matter. He inquired about their decision, and all three students humbly pledged to take charge and give their best. In the school hall, the trio confidently worked ahead of Manager Kim, instructing others to step aside. Manager Kim's proposal addressed their adulthood and the challenges they faced offering assistance with physical examinations and a solution to military service concerns through his connections, urging them to understand the weight of receiving a physical notice at the age of 20. In a show of commitment, all three students bowed before Manager Kim, expressing their willingness to serve him. Manager Kim, maintaining his unconventional approach, suggested they assist him by becoming a woman. In the school ground, Manager Kim revealed his plan to the trio. He explained that they needed to become a woman. The confused trio inquired further, and Manager Kim cleared the misunderstanding and told them that they just need to assume that they were girls and imagine a scenario where they had run away for over a month. The trio elaborated on the potential hideouts, such as runaway families as they have a separate hideout or a friend's houses. Manager Kim then probed them about the possibility, even if the girl in question had recently transferred. The trio then told him that if they were a girl, then they would have lived together with their boyfriend as there were some cases where some bitches were caught living with their teachers. Manager Kim then instructed the trio to clear the way for him in the school hall. He tasked them with investigating the girl in the picture, delving into her boyfriend, school life, close friends, after-school activities, food preferences, clothing choices, and even trivial preferences. The trio bid farewell to Manager Kim upon reaching his office and ran away after he entered the office. As they ran, the trio discussed the girl's identity as Jun Seong's girlfriend and contemplated the implications of getting involved with him. They decided to lay low temporarily, avoiding potential danger. One of them questioned the severity of the situation, prompting a reminder of Jun Seong's violent past, including a notorious incident with a machete. Unexpectedly, Manager Kim caught up with them, inquiring about Jun Seong's reputation. The students confirmed his menacing nature without realizing that it was Teacher Kim who asked the question, and then they got beaten up again for attempting to escape. Seeking forgiveness, they clarified that they were not trying to run away, but were apprehensive about getting entangled with Jun Seong. Manager Kim probed further, asking if they were genuinely afraid of Jun Seong. The students expressed genuine fear, describing him as a complete nutcase where words can't describe him. The scene shifted to an abandoned warehouse, where a guy was caught cheating and hiding a card. He tried to create excuses, but a red-haired person came up to him and smashed a glass bottle on his head. This person was identified as Kang Jun Seong. He then asked someone to call the guys and hold the person and he'll have to educate him well. The guys called by Jun Seong hold the guy who cheated and gave a knife to him. The guy cried to Jun Seong that don't do this as he was his uncle. Jun Seong told his uncle that he doesn't care whoever he is and chopped off his hand as a brutal punishment and warned him about playing fairly. He then ordered someone to clean the mess. The injured guy asked someone to take him to the hospital but was stopped by Jun Seong. After he was searched, they found a card and Jun angrily asked someone to bring axe and was about to attack him with it but someone came in running and told him that his juniors were here to meet him. The trio told him that they were from Jun Seong's crew, representing Yongshin High. A confrontation ensued, with the big guy from Jun Seong's crew attacking one of the trio. Manager Kim intervened protecting the student and defeating the aggressor. The bewildered onlookers questioned Manager Kim's involvement. Back at the school, Manager Kim confronted the trio, asking if they were more afraid of him or Jun Seong. They asserted that Jun Seong was scarier, 
expressing their unwillingness to die. They conveyed their decision to face military service without exemptions. Manager Kim, displaying incredible strength, destroyed a stone book on a statue, surprising the trio with his abilities. In the warehouse, Manager Kim confronted Jun Seong, showing him a photo of the girl and demanding her boyfriend to come forward. The tension in the warehouse escalated as Manager Kim began a countdown. The student requested clarification from Manager Kim, who stated they were confronting Kang Jun Sian. Despite warnings of danger and the criminal nature of the organization, Manager Kim remained adamant. He assured them he had a plan and called in an expert, the ideal person for the job. In the warehouse, Manager Kim demanded the girl's boyfriend to reveal himself, initiating a countdown. Jun Seong's crew questioned his identity, suspecting he wasn't from the police. As one of them swung a bat at Manager Kim during the countdown, Ken Hyun Min from the PH crew of South Jeongi Marbuk High School intervened, punching the attacker before he could land a hit. Although Ken Hyun Min inquired if it worked, Manager Kim noted that it hadn't, as the crew was unwilling to comply and viewed themselves on the same level as other students. Turning around, he sought someone's opinion, and the response criticized the poorly constructed gambling house and sub pi evacuation routes. The speaker noted that in a metropolitan area, even a single police officer would have swiftly shot them down. When one person attempted to challenge him, he was swiftly incapacitated. Identifying himself as Shin Seong Ho from South Jeongi, he declared their affiliation as mercenaries. In a flashback after his hospital discharge, Shin Seong was congratulated by his KSM crew. Responding warmly, he greeted everyone. When asked about the attack in his absence, Shin Seong disclosed that two old men had assaulted him, vowing to retaliate once he located them. Amidst the crew, someone approached Shin Seong with a phone call. Handing him the phone, the individual conveyed that the old man from the past wanted to speak with him. With a somber expression, Shin Seong took the call and assured the caller that he would come. In the present, Jun Seong's crew attacked Manager Kim's group, but got beaten instead. Shin Seong confronted Jun Seong, warning him not to run. As Jun Seong attacked, Shin Seong deftly dodged, calling him a clever psycho. Shin Seong measured the distance and landed a punch. He was then attacked from the side, but dodged it by rolling away. Jun Seong tried a knife attack, but Manager Kim intervened, saving Shin. Manager Kim urged Shin to rest, noting he teased them enough. Shin admired the middle-aged man's fighting skills. Despite Jun Seong attempting to flee, they decided not to chase, realizing the strategy to lead them to their hideout. Manager Kim questioned Shin's confidence, but he explained beating them up wouldn't reveal the hideout suggesting a temporary loss might prompt them to lead the way. Jun Seong urgently reached his hideout, encountering a girl who questioned his sudden appearance. Inquiring about a money bag, he grew impatient with her persistent questions. Identified as N. Aung, the deputy prime minister's granddaughter, she continued asking what was wrong. Jun Seong, attributing a potential raid to her, silenced her and dismissed her inquiries. As he spoke, the door to his room opened, revealing a terrifying presence. Jun Seong, now frightened, demanded an explanation for their intrusion and how they arrived. Outside the building, Manager Kim verified the hideout's location before leading his group inside, instructing them to follow. Manager Kim and his gang entered the building, focused on finding An Daeyoung, the 18-year-old granddaughter of a former South Korean deputy minister. Lee dog Yu expressed disbelief that someone from such a prominent family would run away, suspecting a deeper motive. Kim yong Kiel questioned if it might be a crime, and Lee dog Yu affirmed it was more, citing the family's scheming nature. He directed Manager Kim to stick to the task and work according to the agreed-upon payment. Manager Kim climbed the stairs, keeping Lee dog Yu's instructions in mind. Arriving at Jun Seong's hideout, they noticed the door open, raising concerns that the girl might have escaped. Manager Kim advised silence, suggesting others might be ahead of them. In front of Jun Seong, a person lit a cigarette questioning if Jun Seong thought him a fool and accused him of ignoring due to his appearance. The man queried if Jun Seong believed he wouldn't be found with a girl. Though Jun Seong denied it, the man grabbed his hair, demanding repayment. He sought 100 million borrowed for his business and an additional 350 million as interest. Again, questioning if the squint-eyed appearance influenced the ignorance, Jun Seong refuted it. The man instructed his crew to prepare for the violation of human rights. Manager Kim entered the room, extending apologies and stating his purpose of searching for someone. The squint-eyed man questioned if Jun Seong had called them, which he denied. Manager Kim approached the girl, inquiring if she was N. Daeyoung, and then informed her that her parents were searching for her. When attempting to escort her away, the girl resisted, insisting her boyfriend accompany them. Manager Kim declined, emphasizing he was solely following the terms of his paid job. The squint-eyed man intervened, 
questioning manager Kim's identity and destination after causing a commotion. He then told his crew member to get him, but manager Kim kicked back the door and then kicked him through it, sending the man flying. Curious about manager Kim's background, the squint-eyed man's crew inquired, and he mixed up Mount Bauk Du and White Tiger forces and told them the name Di Ko San. The squint-eyed man's crew asked if they had heard of him, but he answered with a no. At that moment, Shin Sung wondered if now was his opportunity to defeat manager Kim. Formerly the hot spot head of the joint region, Shin Sung's crew was swiftly destroyed by two men, shattering his pride and dragging him into this predicament. For someone seeking revenge, this presented the perfect chance. With manager Kim's leg caught in a door, Shin Sung envisioned the possibility of taking him down. A member of the squint-eyed man's crew attacked manager Kim, but even with his leg stuck, Manager Kim overcame and subdued him. Shin Sung, observing the ongoing struggle, questioned his initial assessment as Manager Kim continued to fight effectively. Despite his leg restraint, Manager Kim defeated everyone. Spotting a knife on the floor, Shin Sung wondered whether he should pick it up or not. The squint-eyed man then seized An Dayang as a hostage, holding a knife to her throat, and ordered Manager Kim not to move. Defying the threat, Manager Kim delivered a powerful kick sending the squint-eyed man flying. Manager Kim commended Shin Sung, expressing relief that he didn't act on a potentially harmful impulse. Shin Sung, surprised, questioned if Manager Kim could read minds. Tearfully, he appreciated Manager Kim's decisive kick. In the bungalow of the deputy minister, he received word that the White Tiger forces had located her. His assistant assured him they would prepare the car. Concerned about potential revelations, the deputy minister inquired if the White Tiger forces might uncover the truth. The assistant reassured him, citing their history of handling money-related tasks. In Manager Kim's car, An Aang queried who sent him. Manager Kim admitted he didn't know, stating he merely followed instructions. He shared that, as a father with a daughter, he understood the pain of losing a child and urged her to return home. Unconvinced, An Aang presented a quiz asking him to guess the factor that most kills the youth in South Korea. And Aang's parents were overjoyed to see her, expressing concern about her well-being and questioning where she had been. Reflecting on their earlier conversation in the car, And Aang revealed that the answer to her quiz about the biggest factor affecting South Korean youth is family. Despite the weight of her statement, Manager Kim halted her from delving further. He expressed his role was to bring her home, emphasizing that her family dynamics were beyond his purview and he couldn't intervene in issues he couldn't resolve. Upon reaching their destination, Manager Kim informed the White Tiger forces that he had successfully reunited An Nayang with her parents. Grateful for his efforts, An Nayang's mother acknowledged her father's anticipation and hard work. Cautious due to their public official status, An Nayang's father stressed the need for confidentiality, particularly from the public. Manager Kim assured them, emphasizing the reliability and trustworthiness of the White Tiger Forces. At White Tiger Forces HQ, Manager Kim's successful completion of his first mission was celebrated. Upon noticing the cash, he inquired if it was from the client. Lee Dog Yu clarified it wasn't a substantial amount but revealed a bet regarding the time it took for Kim to finish the task. When asked if he won, Lee Dog Yu suggested his expression spoke for itself and urged him to enjoy the cake. Manager Kim acknowledged and inquired about his next mission. Lee Dong Yu informed him it was nothing, advising him to take a three day break as he had worked hard enough. In An Dayang's parents' car, her worried father asked why she ran away, concerned about their model daughter's hardships. An Dayang apologized, claiming a momentary lapse, promising to return to her past self. Meanwhile, Manager Kim reflected on the suspicious aspects of the mission the unusually high payment and the emphasis on secrecy. Despite pondering possibilities, he continued driving, concluding there was no need to dwell on a completed task. He then called Minji, asking if she had eaten yet, strolling through the school hallway where students respectfully made way for him. Informing her about his temporary teaching role, she found it amusing, questioning his subject, history, and bursting into laughter. The gatekeeper crew spotted manager Kim, attempting to hug him, but he evaded them, bidding his daughter farewell on the phone. After the call, they questioned his serious demeanor, joking about his return for regional domination or becoming the principal. Interrupting him, a student praised manager Kim for apprehending An Dayung, calling her a psychotic mythomania. Perplexed, manager Kim inquired about mythomania, learning that she claimed someone threatened her life, prompting her escape. In the car, An Dayung bit her mother's ear, causing panic. As the car stopped, she sought forgiveness from her dad mentally and vowed never to return home, fearing murder. She ran away as her parents shouted for her. Back at school, learning about Anayang's mental illness, 
Manager Kim questioned why her family concealed it when she went missing. He suspected someone might truly be threatening her life. At the White Tiger Force's headquarters, Yeon Chiel questioned Lee Dog Yu about the suspicious client and the family's hidden secrets. Lee Dog Yu explained that he took the job because the old man repeatedly asked him to find someone, though he later realized the person was often killed. While suspicious, the job paid well, and they only needed to locate the individuals. Yeon Chiel inquired about the client potentially harming his granddaughter, to which Lee Dog Yu responded that even if he did, they would continue working as paid. He pondered how much enlightenment manager Kim would gain from this case. Back at school, the students noticed manager Kim's serious expression and inquired about what was bothering him. Speculating among themselves, they mentioned that it seemed related to An Aang's student record. They noted that it was the first time they had seen such an expression on his face. Fixated on school records, ponders the abrupt replacement of two homeroom teachers within a month, trying to farm what went wrong. The scene shifts to Jun Seong, battered and bruised, holding a door open for Daeong. Confused, Jun questions why she isn't home. Daeong retorts with disdain, revealing she can't return home for some indisclosed reason. Jun, frustrated, demands an explanation and orders her to come closer, his intentions unclear. In another setting, Daeong manipulates her unsuspecting mother into lending her the credit card, fabricating a story about needing money for a textbook, deceptively registering the card on her phone. Daeong diverts the funds for her own use later discovering a substantial expense at an unfamiliar hotel. Intrigued, she wonders about her mother's secret activities but dismisses it momentarily. Days later, a second payment to the same hotel raises Dayang's suspicion. Contemplating her options, she decides to confide in a long-serving family servant, Kim, urging him to spy on her mother. The risk is high for Kim, who has dedicated two decades to the household. Despite his loyalty, Kim eventually gets caught and is fired. Enraged by the betrayal, Daeong loses her way, transforming into a delinquent. She transfers schools frequently, seeking solace. Approaching a teacher for assistance with a leave of absence, she eventually takes matters into her own hands, syncing her phone with her mother's to gather evidence. After discovering a photo on her mother's phone dated December 4th, depicting a sumptuous stew with a card and spoon, Daeong hears a knock on her door. Angrily, she dismisses the visitor only to find her grandfather on the other side. In a heartfelt conversation, her grandfather urges her to share her troubles. Tearfully, Daeong admits her mother's infidelity, presenting the evidence. Her grandfather, initially angry, advises her to keep it quiet. He assures her he will handle the situation discreetly, apologizing for not paying enough attention to her. As he hugs her, Daeong gazes at the photo again, noticing a reflection in the spoon. To her shock, she recognizes her grandfather standing behind her mother in the hotel room. As she trembles, her grandfather in a menacing face says you saw it. It was him. In the aftermath of Daeyang's shocking revelation, her heart pounds in her chest as her grandfather calmly addresses her. He hints that she might have seen him with her mother, pointing at the picture on her phone. However, to Daeyang's relief, he references the VIP card in the photo claiming that uncovering details about a hotel VIP is effortless for him. As her grandfather exits the room, satisfied that she hasn't recognized the reflection, Daeong, overwhelmed and bewildered, succumbs to the revelation, vomiting. Meanwhile, the narrative takes a plunge into the grandfather's life two decades earlier. He was a prominent figure, surrounded by media, facing allegations of multiple mistresses. With a menacing glare, the grandfather deflects the questions, hinting that the truth about the scandal will be revealed soon. The scene shifts to a violent encounter with party leader Lyndon Hong, who holds a glass holder near the grandfather's face. Accused of womanizing, the grandfather faces the wrath of the party leader, who is set to become the next party leader. In a heated confrontation, the party leader berates the grandfather for tarnishing their political reputation. The grandfather, unfazed, takes responsibility and proposes a strategic move to salvage them. Standing, he suggests marrying the last remaining mistress to his son, orchestrating a scenario that makes their relationship appear legitimate. Despite initial skepticism, the party leader laughs off the audacious plan, wishing the grandfather luck as he takes the secret to his grave. The narrative takes a grim turn as the party leader meets a fatal accident shortly afterward. The senator, now the party leader, keeps the secret intact and enforces silence. A glimpse into the ruthless nature of the grandfather is revealed as he threatens anyone who knows the truth. The flashback ends with the senator, now party leader, reflecting on the power of silence, determined to guard his dark past. Kim, the servant hired to spy on her mother, 
is shown being brutally interrogated by the grandfather. The grandfather, wielding a nine iron, emphasizes his commitment to science, even if it means humming those close to him. Daeong, beaten and vulnerable, faces the wrath of Jun, who berates her for returning. Simultaneously, Yong Chil, on a phone call, instructs someone not to aid Daeong. He reveals that Daeong ran away due to her own choice, cautioning against interfering in her affairs. Manager Kim, overhearing the conversation, realizes he's been instructed to stay inactive. However, fueled by his recent conversation with Daeong and her plea to take students seriously, Kim decides to act. In a determined move, manager Kim distances himself from his team, informing them that he's acting on a personal request. Shin, one of his team members, expresses concern, questioning the decision to take action without an official mandate. Unperturbed, manager Kim asserts that they will proceed at full speed. Jun's frustration reaches a boiling point as he violently lashes out at Daeong, berating her for the chaotic turn his life has taken due to her family hiring dangerous individuals. The chaos intensifies when Jun receives a call from his boss, derogatorily nicknamed Shithead. The demand is staggering 350 million won owed to the boss, along with additional damages summing up to a whopping 550 million won. Failure to comply would result in dire consequences, including the threat of organ harvesting. Faced with a life-altering ultimatum, June reluctantly agrees to start a business with his boss, although the nature of this enterprise remains shrouded in mystery. Amid this turmoil, June turns to Daeong, who is left beaten and crying. In a complex mix of emotions, Jun questions her about the duration of their acquaintance 33 days. As he reflects on their tumultuous past, Daeyong assures him that their shared experiences were not entirely negative. Seeking solace, she leans her head on Jun's shoulder, proposing a desperate escape from their predicament. However, the fleeting moment of vulnerability takes a dark turn as Jun chokes Daeyong, rendering her unconscious. The scene shifts to Shin and Kim, investigating a residence where Daeyong might have sought refuge. Signs of struggle, a scratched door and a lone shoe indicate potential foul play. Kim, recognizing Daeong's distinctive shoes, concludes that she has been kidnapped. Meanwhile, Jun initiates a phone call to Daeong's mother, and the unexpected voice of her grandfather answers. Jun fabricates a story about Daeong being critically ill, manipulating the situation to extort ransom money. He demands 1 billion won, threatening to provide proof through a photo of Daeong. However, the grandfather, unfazed, dismisses the negotiation, accusing Daeyong of attempting to scam them. As tensions rise, Jun's boss instructs him not to hang up, putting a knife to his neck. The grandfather, unmoved, challenges Jun's bluff and suggests severing one of Daeyong's fingers to probe their seriousness. The shocking revelation that Daeyong's mother had an affair with her own grandfather adds a layer of complexity to the already convoluted family dynamics. Jun's boss is taken aback by the twisted family narrative. And as the call concludes, the grandfather prepares to meet the demands. He instructs his chief of staff to get ready, signaling the seriousness of the impending encounter. Simultaneously, Shin and his team follow manager Kim, who receives a call from someone named Nam, a former planning team manager at Joying Construction. Nam's involvement adds an intriguing layer to the unfolding drama. Manager Nam, a former member of the infamous AKL Mercenary Corporation, stands over the lifeless bodies of his AKL colleagues. Park, a mysterious figure, approaches Nam with an offer to join a team named Areas, comprised of skilled individuals specializing in warfare. Despite the weight of Nam's dark past, Park extends this opportunity as a chance for redemption. Nam contemplates the offer, wrestling with the ghosts of his previous mercenary life. He reflects on the havoc he wrought and the undeniable comic toll that follows him. Park dismisses his concerns, casually informing Nam that he has already accepted the offer on his behalf, framing it as a small favor out of respect. The narrative then shifts to Shin and Kim, who observe the tension building between Nam and Shin, hinting at a complicated history. The story gracefully introduces the mysterious Park's involvement, adding layers to the evolving plot. In a different arc, Jun faces a daunting task. He orchestrates a 1 billion won ransom plan, gathering his team for what appears to be a serious and risky venture. Tensions escalate as the clock ticks down to the exchange at Jankson intersection. The scene becomes a gripping exchange as a man with the ransom money is brutally attacked by bikers, leaving the chief of staff bewildered. Jun, who seemingly betrays his team, takes the money and speeds away on a bike. However, a surprising twist reveals that Shin is tailing Jun, leading to an intense confrontation between them. Amidst the chaos, manager Kim enters the scene dramatically, Confronting Jun about Daeong's whereabouts, Shin and manager Kim intercept Jun, 
creating a riveting chase. Jun's attempt to escape is short-lived as manager Kim delivers a powerful kick, subduing him. The tension escalates when Shin warns Jun against resisting, emphasizing the gravity of the situation. Jun, fearing for his life, divulges crucial information about Daeong's abduction. The narrative shifts to the shipyard where Daeong is held captive. Jun's boss faces unexpected trouble as Yakuza members arrive late to the deal. This unexpected turn of events introduces a new layer to the story, bringing in the Yakuza and complicating the situation further. As manager Nam emerges from the shadows on the ship, his presence signals a shift in power dynamics. Nam declares his intention to end the chaos and showcases his prowess, ready to confront both Jun's boss and the Yakuza. In a gripping flashback, manager Kim and Nam meticulously plan their next moves, opting to split up to tackle the multifaceted crisis at hand. Nam is assigned the task of pursuing the gangster responsible. As the narrative shifts back to the present, Nam's unexpected appearance startles Jun's boss and the Yakuza. The Yakuza boss, Teki, intrigued by Nam's skills, decides to face him head on. Teki launches a series of punches, but Nam effortlessly dodges and deflects each one, showcasing his extraordinary combat prowess. He quickly analyzes Teki's fighting style, recognizing the sheer force behind each strike. Despite the seemingly one-sided battle, Teki surprises Nam with a swift knife attack, scratching the left side of Nam's face. In phased, Nam retaliates with a flurry of punches, disarming Teki and turning the tables. Seizing the opportunity, Nam grabs Teki's knife, holding him hostage. With a reassuring glance at Daeong, Nam assures her safety and commands Teki not to worry. Defeated, Teki acknowledges Nam's superior skills and remarks on the prudence of having insurance when dealing with Koreans. However, the scene takes an unexpected turn as a man in a white suit with a katana enters. Identified as an executive in the Yakuza gang, he surrounds Nam with other white-suited members. The story then transitions to manager Kim, who faces impending danger from two Yakuza members, Sas and Ryawaki. Overhearing their conversation, it becomes clear that the Yakuza boss distrusts them and orders them to call everyone and secure the money. The intensity heightens as Sas and Ryawaki, armed with knives, approach manager Kim and his members. Meanwhile, Nam finds himself surrounded by Yakuza henchmen. The hostage Yakuza, stabbed by his own associates, reveals the Yakuza's commitment to their missions. Despite the betrayal, he praises Nam's determination, adding a layer of complexity to the narrative. The blonde Yakuza, holding a katana, declares Nam as Teki's enemy, vowing never to forgive him. In another scene, Shin prepares to confront Sas and Ryawaki, recognizing their ferocity. As the Yakuza members approach with psychotic grins, Shin narrowly avoids a knife attack that grazes his ear. With a sense of trepidation, Shin observes the Yakuza's unsettling behavior. Back with manager Kim, he steps forward to face Sas and Ryawaki. Shin questions the identity of these Yakuza members, prompting one of them to lunge at manager Kim with a knife. However, manager Kim's swift and powerful response sends one of the Yakuza members flying. As Sas lies defeated, Ryawaki is struck with fear sensing an overwhelming aura of power emanating from manager Kim. The scene concludes with manager Kim confidently advancing towards Ryawaki, setting the stage for an intense confrontation. In the sprawling criminal empire of the largest Yakuza organization in the Kansai region, where the primary trade is human trafficking, a well-defined hierarchy dictates the power structure. At the helm is the non-combatant president, followed by the executives, and finally, the henchmen. The henchmen, often on the front lines, serve as both fighters and sometimes punching bags. Among the executives, there are distinctions, white badges for common executives and black badges for those with formidable combat prowess. This system was instituted by the first president of the Sacred Celebration Assembly, Sasaki Kenji, a man determined to enhance the organization's combat strength. As manager Kim stands over a beaten white badge henchman, the latter defiantly refuses to divulge any information, invoking the honor of the organization. Unfazed, manager Kim kicks him in the face, expressing his intent to find the information himself. Meanwhile, scenes shift to a ship dock where Chief Nam, a high-ranking figure, engages in a fierce battle with black badge executives. Dodging katana strikes and showcasing remarkable combat skills, Chief Nam identifies the adversary's past ties to the Japanese self-defense forces. A brood black badge executive confronts Chief Nam, turning the tide with unexpected strength. As Chief Nam prepares to finish off his opponent, he is interrupted by a surprise attack from another black badge executive. The narrative introduces a blonde black badge executive named Taiki, an ex-member of the AKL with a unique CQC technique. In a tense moment, Taiki questions Chief Nam's motive, 
hinting at the possibility of saving hostages. As Taiki grabs a hostage by the hair, he casually kills one, claiming it doesn't matter which one Chief Nam is trying to rescue. The situation intensifies as Taiki continues the brutal interrogation, slicing another hostage's neck in front of Chief Nam. Amidst the chaos, the Black Badge Swordsman demands answers from Chief Nam, revealing their involvement in organ trafficking. Chief Nam maintains a stoic demeanor, concealing his true intentions, especially regarding a potential connection to someone named Andayung. Taiki, however, seems to have a particular interest in a female hostage, hinting at a deeper connection. As the power struggle unfolds, Chief Nam realizes he is up against an XAKL member, forcing him to keep his emotions hidden. The tension rises, with Chief Nam determined to protect a crucial secret, even if it means facing the ruthless Taiki and his sadistic methods. Taiki scrutinized Chief Nam, recognizing a fellow former Akal in the intense standoff. Chief Nam struggled to mask his emotions, contemplating the potential clash between two former Akal members. Meanwhile, the muffled pleas of the female hostage for help heightened the tension, leaving Chief Nam perplexed about the potential consequences if things turn violent. His mind raced for a solution as panic set in. What if the hostage got hurt? In a sudden twist, Chief Nam shouted, hold on. Catching Taiki off guard, Chief Nam implored him to stop and conserve energy. Acknowledging his internal struggle, Chief Nam revealed he had a lot on his mind and gestured towards an unconventional solution. Chief Nam, this is my answer. As the scene transitioned, Manager Kim raced on a motorbike with his companions. Sion Hoshin questioned their direction, frustrated by the lack of information from the Yakuza. The only lead they had was a meeting at a port likened to finding a needle in a haystack. Regret lingered in the air as Seong Hoshin wished they had extracted more information from Kang during their encounter. Cut to the red-haired Yakuza they had interrogated earlier, now crawling for safety. Intent on seizing the money, he was suddenly confronted by two men in black suits. The situation escalated, prompting a call to the deputy prime minister. He assured them he would handle it, revealing a beaten body of someone wearing white badges. Doguli, with a confident smile, expressed his trust in his hired agents and informed them of an agent on standby nearby. Meanwhile, Manager Kim received a crucial phone call revealing the Yakuza's location. Back at the hostage situation, Chief Nam faced Taiki, revealing a satellite GPS on his left pants sleeve. Park Chun Chiel explained its significance as a symbol of honor, designed by his daughter. Chief Nam made light of the tracker's design, questioning its usefulness. In the midst of the hostage crisis, Nam exposed his GPS tracker to Taiki. A man in a black suit whispered to Taiki, revealing it as an ankle monitor used for serious offenders. Nam, admitting to his current criminal status, emphasized the absurdity of saving a hostage in his situation. Taiki questioned Nam's sincerity, prompting Nam to reveal a personal connection to the girl resembling someone from his past. As Nam faced the imminent threat surrounded by black-suited men, he warned Taiki against casual killing citing the danger of being tracked by a formidable adversary. The scene shifted to the dock, where manager Kim and his team approached, ready to confront the Yakuza. Chef Nam's hands were stained with blood, a testament to the fierce battle he had just endured. Beaten gang members lay scattered on the floor, their presence no longer a threat. Taiki, a witness to the carnage, acknowledged Nam's prowess. You wiped out every single member by yourself, including executives. How impressive, Taiki remarked. Curiosity sparked. Taiki questioned Nam's decision to be a criminal, wondering why he chose such a path. Nam, unfazed, identified himself as an AKL, a mercenary bound by duty. The completion of the mission mattered most, regardless of the consequences. Because I am an AKL, I am a mercenary mandated to complete the mission. Shouldn't you know this as well? Nam explained, emphasizing the relentless pursuit of the job, come hell or high water. Taiki, recognizing Nam's principles, extended a recruitment offer questioning if Nam worked for someone. Nam, recalling a prior offer, declined. I refuse. Someone already made me an offer, Nam firmly stated. As Taiki unsheathed his katana, a swift and unexpected move, he slashed Nam, ensuring a wound that wouldn't be fatal. I have slashed just enough so you won't die, Taiki declared. Nam fell, blood oozing from his chest. The scene shifted to the dock, where Shin observed gang members receiving orders to load up a shipment. With the boss initiating a plan, Kim, Contrary to his unusual strategic approach, confronted the gang members directly. It's full of danger here from this point, so you guys stay out of here, Kim warned his companions. Shin, puzzled by Kim's unconventional tactics, speculated on the boss's strategy, comparing it to a police car's siren luring criminals. As the boss's siren echoed, Kim showcased his formidable combat skills, 
swiftly incapacitating gang members. Back on the ship, Nam found himself tied to a rope, exposed and defenseless. Gang members speculated about distant noises, pondering if someone had called the police. Taiki, dismissing the possibility of Korean cops intervening mid-operation, inquired about the whereabouts of Sass and Ryoaki. Taiki, sensing a potential threat, stepped out just as gang members rushed someone. However, Kim's entrance was overpowering, as he effortlessly dispatched the assailants with strong punches. Taiki, katana in hand, attempted to strike Kim while he was occupied, but Kim's mastery with sharp threads thwarted the attack. As Taiki held Kim in a precarious position, a gang member with a sharp knife approached Nam. The situation escalated as threads tied to Taiki revealed a trap. Are you sure? Kim questioned Taiki, highlighting the flawed judgment of leaving Nam alone. In a swift move, Nam utilized a laser on his GPS tracker, escaping his binds. With impeccable close quarters combat, he neutralized the guards within minutes. Kim criticized Taiki for the rookie mistake of leaving Nam unattended, asserting his active duty status with a menacing look. I am not near retirement. I am very much on active duty, Kim declared. Hiring a mercenary is often seen as an inefficient choice. These professionals, while skilled, prove difficult to control, frequently engaging in theft and heinous crimes. Moreover, their services come with a hefty price tag, and they often operate in murky legal territories, brushing against international laws, including the Geneva Convention, which doesn't officially recognize them as soldiers. Despite these drawbacks, the mercenary market persists, and their popularity endures. In the midst of this discussion, the scene shifts to Chief Nam, showcasing his combat skills by swiftly neutralizing a group of gang members with powerful kicks and punches. With the adversaries subdued, he approaches a female hostage, intending to free her. However, a surprising twist unfolds as the girl, terrified, mistakes Nam for a pervert. Nam's attempt to calm her down takes an unexpected turn, revealing a misunderstanding rooted in a tactic he used earlier to distract Taiki. As Nam grapples with the situation, a menacing gang member enters the scene. The brute-like figure looms over Nam and the frightened girl, casting a dark shadow. Nam finds himself facing an unknown adversary, adding another layer of complexity to the unfolding narrative. The story transitions to the intense battle between Kim and Taiki. Taiki, Attempting to create distance, discovers his pinky fingers severed by Kim's hand threads. Kim, seizing the opportunity, taunts Taiki with the tradition of Japanese Yakuza slicing their pinky fingers upon leaving the group. The skirmish escalates, with Taiki attempting a final strike, only to have his katana shattered by Kim's hand threads. Amidst the clash, a mysterious voice interrupts, berating Taiki for causing a commotion during a supposed human trafficking operation. The voice scolds Taiki for his lack of professionalism revealing the gang member standing next to Nam and the female hostage. In a surprising turn, Taiki is rendered unconscious by a powerful punch from Kim. The attention then shifts to the gang member, revealing his identity as Yakuza Vice President Fujimori Yuki, a formidable presence with a bald head and a prominent scar over his left eye. Fujimori stands over Nam, questioning the unexpected presence of a Korean fruit fly. In a desperate attempt to break free, Nam kicks Fujimori in the face. Enfazed, Fujimori tightens his grip on Nam, rendering him unconscious. As the scene shifts, Kim finds himself surrounded by Yakuza members. A gang member informs Fujimori about a signal from Interpol, signaling the urgency to depart. Fujimori expresses his dislike for overseas dealings due to the increased risk of being tracked by authorities. Without hesitation, he tosses Nam's unconscious body into the water. Fujimori orders the gang to prepare for departure emphasizing that anyone late will be left behind. He instructs them to teach the Korean the way of the Yakuza. Meanwhile, Kim manages to fend off the Yakuza members with knives, creating an opening to jump into the water. With Nam in tow, Kim descends into the depths. The situation becomes dire as multiple Yakuza members attempt to drown Kim, but he skillfully uses a knife to dispatch them. Back on the dock, a lone Yakuza member notices blood in the water and realizes that Kim is still alive. Unexpectedly, a biker named Chan Wang, the chief gatekeeper of the crew, arrives on the scene. He swiftly knocks down the remaining Yakuza members with metal baseball bats, allowing Kim and Nam to escape. The bikers appear out of nowhere, catching the Yakuza off guard. Kim, assisted by Chan, climbs up quickly, but they can only watch helplessly as the ship leaves the dock. On the ship, Yakuza members are busy handling boxes filled with human organs. Fujimori instructs them to remove those with drugs who are still breathing and load the boxes containing corpses with ice. Meanwhile, Shin and Dongyong question their next move. Dongyong expresses concern about their predicament, 
stating his age as only 21. Shin, contemplating a new chapter of history, loads a revolver, expressing his desire for acknowledgement from their boss. As Shin recalls Kim, he proposes taking over the ship to Dong Yong. Dong Yong questions Shin's ability to sail a ship, to which Shin responds with a confident smile, stating that knowing how to drive a motorbike is all a man needs. Determined, Shin rallies Dong Yong to join him in this risky endeavor. Shin and Dong Yong were engaged in a conversation about taking over the entire ship, fueled by their aspirations. But Dong Yong quickly injected a dose of reality, stating that it was nearly impossible given the ship's infestation of Yakuza members. The tension escalated as Fujimori's heavy steps approached. In a hurried attempt to remain unseen, Dong Yong hid behind the door, and Shin pressed himself against the wall. Fujimori, struggling to fit through the narrow door, commented on the ship's size, promising to prepare a larger vessel next time. One Yakuza member acknowledged the situation, assuring Fujimori they would wake him upon arrival. Seizing the opportunity, Dong Yong observed Shin loading a revolver, contemplating the possibility of shooting Fujimori. However, Fujimori noticed his men acting strangely and questioned them. A Yakuza member reported a small boat tailing them, but upon inspection, it turned out to be an empty fishing boat. A scream echoed, diverting everyone's attention leading them to discover two guards on the ground with blood oozing from their heads. Panic ensued as the realization of an attack dawned on them. As they investigated further, blood-curdling screams emanated from the basement. Fujimori took charge, reprimanding his men for running from an intruder. The scene transitioned to a mysterious figure choking a Yakuza member. Fujimori declared a game of cat and mouse as he confronted the chaos in the basement. Manager Kim made a bold entrance landing a powerful kick to Fujimori's face. A fierce battle ensued, with Kim showcasing impressive martial arts skills. Fujimori, recalling encountering the AKL, presumably a special unit, acknowledged Kim's victory over Taiki but declared he couldn't let him live. As the brutal fight continued, the perspective shifted to two bewildered Yakuza members contemplating their involvement. Concerned about certain death, they opted to wait, confident in their vice president's prowess. Back to Dong Yong and Shin seized the opportunity to take control. Dong Yong, wielding a revolver, confronted the Yakuza members, announcing their takeover. Shin, manipulating the ship controls, initiated Fujimori lost control midair, and Kim capitalized on the chaos, delivering a series of powerful moves. Amidst the fight, Kim revealed that despite the cost-effectiveness of guns, he had prepared his team for such situations. In the midst of the chaos, Kim confronted Fujimori, intending to conclude the game and settle the score. Dong Yong's voice cut through, questioning Shin's actions. Confused, Shin stood at the ship's main control, uncertain of his next move. Dong Yong acknowledged the successful U-turn but warned that the ship was at risk of overturning. Yakuza members struggled to stay on board, supplementing into the water mid-air. Switching back to Shin, he summoned self-confidence, determined to find a solution. He located a pedal and, with a loud creak, opened the ship's doors, allowing water to rush in, gradually submerging it. In the basement, water seeped through the hole, creating additional chaos during the intense fight between Kim and Fujimori. Manager Kim attempted to cut Fujimori's thick neck with his hand threads but was abruptly thrown away by Fujimori. Fujimori marked Kim for not bringing an axe if he intended to target his head, slamming him onto the hard metal surface. Dismissing the effectiveness of the threads, Fujimori engaged in a fist fight with Kim, who surprised him with unexpected strength. As Kim delivered a swift kick to Fujimori's neck, shock registered on Fujimori's face. In the midst of the battle, Fujimori experienced a haunting flashback. He ordered his members to mercilessly attack Jainiki Yakuza members and innocent civilians. Fujimori's brutal actions, indifferent to the law and life, were revealed as he cruelly killed men and women, justifying it by claiming the victims didn't know their place. The flashback showcased Fujimori's sadistic nature playing a deadly game of tag with civilians. Returning to the present, Fujimori found himself at the mercy of Kim. Kim, using his threads, grabbed Fujimori by the legs, tossing him into the air. As Fujimori felt the force tearing at his neck, he realized he was no longer the hunter but the hunted. Manager Kim, relentless, threw him against the floor, defeating Fujimori. In the aftermath, as Kim asserted the basic principle of hunting aim for the neck, the scene shifted to the dock. The deputy prime minister and his bodyguard observed a ship returning. The bodyguard expressed uncertainty, but the prime minister acknowledged it. Suspicion lingered as the prime minister questioned the trustworthiness of leaving someone in charge. Nearby, a beaten white suit member sought forgiveness, blaming poor training for his actions. The deputy prime minister, Lee Dong-yu, remained in phased, 
sipping from a bottle as he expressed the need to inspect what Kim carried down his pants, a menacing glint in his eyes. The female hostage found herself submerged in an ice bath, surrounded by lifeless bodies. Anxiety gripped her as she pondered her predicament, wondering how she ended up in this chilling nightmare. Despite attempting an escape, the unyielding door left her feeling trapped, surrounded by the deceased. She feared sharing their fate and prayed for salvation, yearning for someone to rescue her. In a sudden turn of events, Manager Kim approached, opening the door. The woman's tear-filled eyes brightened as she embraced Kim tightly, relief and gratitude evident on her face. Together, they hurriedly made their way outside. The scene shifted to the Yakuza members on the ship relentlessly firing at the ship's control center. Dong Yong sought cover, and Shin, contemplating his next move, stood over the control hatch. The narrative then shifted to manager Kim swiftly incapacitating the remaining Yakuza members on with guns. Kim's quick actions included disarming one of them and using the handgun to fend off the approaching threats. Shin, observing from above, witnessed Kim eliminating the remaining Yakuza members, filling him with a sense of awe for the middle-aged man who concealed his true strength. Dongyong alerted the group to the side of land South Korea. Shin and Dongyong shared a hug, expressing relief at surviving the perilous situation. Dongyong, however, raised a practical question did Shin know how to stop the ship? As they approached the dock, the ship collided with it, causing destruction. Prime Minister and Dongyu remained unfazed, their gang members fleeing. Dongyu noted the ship's costly nature, hinting that manager Kim might have to foot the bill. Kim, with the female hostage in tow, emerged from the ship, joining Shin and Dongyong. Dongyu, irked by Kim's non-responsiveness to calls, interrogated him about awareness of their principle strictly moving for clients who pay. Kim admitted knowledge but emphasized that he couldn't turn a blind eye, prioritizing principles over money at that moment. Dongyu, with a scoff, asserted money as his principle and questioned Kim's decision. Suddenly, the scene took an unexpected turn as Fujimori, presumed dead, emerged, cracking his neck. Shocked, Kim realized Fujimori was still alive. Dongyu swiftly silenced Fujimori with a lethal punch, demonstrating his ruthless disciplinary approach. Shin, bewildered, exclaimed, he's dead. Dongyu confronted Kim, seeking confirmation about his awareness of their client-centric principle. Kim acknowledged his knowledge but defended his deviation, apologizing for prioritizing principles over money. Dongyu, however, dismissed Kim's stance, asserting that money was his principle. As Dongyu glared at Kim, ready for confrontation. In the heart of the underworld, Dongyu Li, a towering figure draped in a large hoodie, earned the title of the King of the Streets. This label was reserved for those who had climbed the ranks, reaching the pinnacle among the bottom feeders. Dongyu, however, transcended even that, securing the title of the king of the underworld, or simply Dogyu Li, a rare distinction earned after unleashing terror upon the streets. The narrative shifted to a ship dock where Dongyu confronted manager Kim. Dogyu demanded clarity money or principles. Abruptly, Kim received a forceful punch from Dongyu, sending him sprawling near the ship. Despite Dongyu's overwhelming physique and surprising speed, Kim retaliated unexpectedly. Grabbing Dongyu by his tie, which was tied to his right hand, Kim swiftly delivered a kick to Dongyu's face. Dongyu, taken aback, questioned when he lost his tie. With tie pieces in hand, Dongyu scolded Kim for allowing emotions to cloud his judgment. Dongyu emphasized money as the sole trustworthy entity, even if a student's life hung in the balance. Dongyu's unhinged demeanor showcased his unyielding commitment to monetary pursuits. As he kicked Kim, Dongyu suggested talking after beating him some more. In the distance, the Prime Minister ordered his guards to bring Daeong, the female hostage. Shin, fiercely protective, intervened, engaging in a swift and surprising confrontation with the guards. Observing the gods' skills, Shin deduced he was a versatile fighter, possibly trained in UFC. Dongyong, armed with a crowbar, joined the fray, yelling at the guards to back off. Amidst the chaos, Daeong screamed at her grandfather, the Prime Minister, revealing a painful family secret. The revelation halted everyone, including manager Kem and Dongyu, as Daeong accused her grandfather of an affair with her mother. The Prime Minister, devoid of humanity, confessed to the allegations, admitting there was no turning back. The scene transitioned to a new character, Hyo Sung Kim, a formidable man with a white beard and a golden hook for a left arm. Introduced as the superintendent of Blue Dragon, Inc., Aaron Services Center, Hyo Sung Kim, age 42, expressed a desire to fight Dong Yu. The Prime Minister revealed Hyo Sung was hired to deal with the situation. As the tension escalated, Dong Yu sought answers from the Prime Minister. The PM terminated Dong Yu, alleging greed and a breach of contract. Amidst the turmoil, Manager Kim, 
previously at odds with Dong Yu, proposed a temporary alliance. While Dong Yu acknowledged they were not done talking, he and Manager Kim prepared to face Hyo Sung together. The narrative concluded with Manager Kim urging Dong Yu to avoid injuries to prevent any excuses for defeat. The impending confrontation promised an intense showdown, with principles and money colliding in the gritty underworld. In the midst of the chaotic confrontation between Manager Kim, Dong Yu, and Hyo Seung along with his men, confusion prevailed. Hyo Seung, puzzled, inquired about the identity of the person standing beside Dong Yu. The member informed him that this individual had been fighting Dong Yu earlier. As Hyo Sung's men surrounded Kim and Dong Yu, the superintendent introduced himself to Dong Yu. Without hesitation, Dong Yu charged towards Hyo Seung with the intent to kill, accusing him of stealing his work. However, Hyo Seung's men swiftly pulled out taser guns, and before Dong Yu could react, he was saved by manager Kim's hand threads. Kim warned Dong Yu about the taser guns, expressing gratitude for the rescue. Despite being shot by several taser guns, Dong Yu displayed resilience, standing amidst the smoke with a smile on his face. Astonished, Hyo Seung's men were shocked to find that the taser guns had no effect on Dong Yu. Dong Yu, undeterred, taunted them, asking if a knife or a gun would work instead. As Dong Yu continued to overpower Hyo Seung's men, Manager Kim used his hand threads to choke and immobilize some of them. The two displayed a coordinated and formidable partnership. Dong Yu, jokingly acknowledging his discomfort in crowds, teased the men, adding a light-hearted touch to the intense situation. Hyo Seung, undeterred, asserted that fights and wars were different, considering every job as a war. Dong Yu, seemingly unaffected, continued to display his strength and resilience. Hyo Seung, raised his hook arm, preparing for an attack. However, Dong Yu swiftly struck him with a powerful punch, causing his head to deform upon impact. The Prime Minister, witnessing Dong Yu's Herculean strength, felt a sense of dread. Dong Yu stood over the defeated Hyo Seung, his blood red eyes fixed on the Prime Minister. Dong Yu then turned his attention towards the Prime Minister, demanding an exorbitant amount multiplied by 20 to keep the secret of his affair with his mother in law. As Dong Yu prepared to strike the Prime Minister, Manager Kim intervened holding Dong Yu's hand. Kim urged Dong Yu to consider the presence of the Prime Minister's family and advised moving the discussion elsewhere. Dong Yu, angered by the interruption, questioned Kim's interference. In the background, Shin received a call informing him that Manager Nam was unconscious and that Park, claiming to be Nam's colleague, had arrived with a strange story. The tense situation escalated further as Dong Yong screamed for mercy, pinned to the ground by the Prime Minister's guard while the god's boss held a knife to Daeong's throat. The chief of staff apologized, acknowledging the situation had spiraled out of control. In desperation, the prime minister agreed to pay the penalty and hush money. The atmosphere became more intense as Daeong's parents rushed onto the scene, witnessing their daughter held at knife point. The guards detained Daeong's father, leaving Daeong helpless and terrified. As the prime minister's son demanded an explanation, the prime minister, realizing the gravity of the situation, put his hands behind his back. Daeong pleaded with her father for help, but the Prime Minister declared that there was no turning back. The Chief of Staff received orders to proceed with the plan. Suddenly, Manager Kim swiftly intervened, protecting Daeong from harm by delivering a powerful punch to the Chief of Guard. Dong Yu, puzzled by Kim's actions, questioned him, but Kim claimed to be on vacation. Dong Yu, seemingly uninterested, absorbed Kim's punches, allowing him to continue his intervention. The Prime Minister, contemplating his escape, recognized an opportunity to slip away amid the chaos. However, a stabbing sound halted the conflict. All eyes turned to see Daeong's mother with a knife, having stabbed the prime minister. Shocked, Daeong witnessed her mother's anger and confusion. Daeong's mother revealed a traumatic flashback, exposing the prime minister's predatory behavior. He had approached her, expressing admiration and eventually causing immense distress. The flashback unveiled a car accident orchestrated by the prime minister resulting in the death of Daeong's parents. The Prime Minister's insidious intentions were further revealed as he mentioned liking the fruit her parents sold. In the present, Daeong's mother confronted the Prime Minister for ruining her life and attempting to harm her daughter. She unleashed a torrent of stabs, expressing her years of torment. Daeong, in shock, ran towards her mother, pleading for her to stop. The Prime Minister screamed in pain as Daeong's mother condemned him for his atrocities. Daeong's father, observing the gruesome scene, was paralyzed with shock. Flashbacks of his father's actions replayed in his mind, revealing the dark truth about the Prime Minister's manipulation of their lives. Tears welled up in Daeong's father's eyes as he grappled with the horrifying reality. The once confident Prime Minister, now writhing in pain, 
face the consequences of his malevolent actions. The unfolding drama exposed the depths of deceit, betrayal, and the profound impact on the lives of those entangled in the Prime Minister's web of manipulation. The boy narrates about the deeds his father had been doing since he was young after which he finds out the first thing later is that his mother committed suicide which was due to his father's extramarital affairs which he frequently had which was the reason his mother ended her life. It was at her funeral that the kid's father was been interviewed about how his wife died calling upon the reason which said she was stabbed to death by an assailant and questioning him about what happened during her volunteer work. The man answers by saying that his wife was a naive woman who didn't even listen to him despite his warning about the work being dangerous to her. He then starts to sob blaming himself and states that he would hold his political life for his son, taking it as the reason for an opportunity to take upon someone's death. The boy then states the character of his father to be such a kind of person who would hesitate to call anyone even if were his family member if there weren't any for his purpose. The boy led such a life since he was young, and he knew all about his father and the things he had experienced, which now made him a man who always tried to turn a blind eye to ignore any of the issues he faced pretending he didn't know things even though he knew the things happening without his notice, which even had his fiancée cheating on him with his father before marriage. He continued to live a life pretending to be all right and a well-obeying son who was feared by his father, which made him kneel despite him knowing everything. He witnessed something that he couldn't turn it to be a blind-eyed incident. He came across a lady who was stabbing a man to death. The other two men were watching the situation when one of the men who was the general manager yelled out to stop him from getting killed, and as he approached him, he was stopped by manager Kim, and then goes to the lady, stopping her from stabbing the man who was known to be his father. He then yells out to his father that she is his family, and points out that he is different from him in terms of protecting his family until the end. It was a challenge for him as he was stepping up to be the head of the family for the first time after his father despite any dirty tricks his father played then. Suddenly, the old man collapsed to the ground and was accompanied by his guards yelling out at him addressing him as the deputy minister. The man then cries out to the lady saying he would find a near hospital for him and assures her he would take the responsibility even if they blamed him as a responsible dad would do to save his family and his daughter from the trouble. The general cries out and rushes towards the minister worrying only about him as his only money source since the old man took money from the manager who was his client. And now the blame was taken by his son, An jung -yo. The old man was admitted to the hospital where he was left to recover from his consciousness and he was getting treated as all of his organs were damaged. His granddaughter comes to visit him and she subs thinking that this is the justified punishment given to him by heaven saying that she thanks An. Manager Kim then held up the meeting which talked about how they were able to acknowledge by saving the dying client as well as succeeded in receiving the penalty without any loss. But points upon manager Kim for salary reduction where one of the officials who was the general manager and up, suggesting him to set up his own company if he wanted to do what he pleased and then fired him from the job. During this conversation, the walls burst behind them. The Aries team showed up surprising Kim. The leader Park approaches the general manager asking him whether he could now take him away from them with a wide smile on his face. The man invites Anne to come and join along with him by the Aries team. Seeing which the general manager grins at how he got to meet him again and speaks upon how he was interfering with the situation by holding such a discussion in someone else's business place. Listening to how they were arguing over Kim to get them into their team. The other team member of Ares asked his leader whether he could kill them all and take manager Kim by their side. To which the leader says he would hurt any of their friend's teammates and they would deal with this as gentlemen. Listening to this, the general sends a man to attack them and as he swings the sword, the team member of the Ares team swiftly moves across him, breaking the weapon which surprised them. It was Albert Kim who threatened them upon gangs who usually get out of the way after seeing the way they attacked and who was specialized in assembling and disassembling. The deputy manager then points strikes using a sharp weapon towards Albert reminding him that he was supposed to be the cop before joining the White Tiger forces. The old woman from the team approached the members and started saying that there was such a problem that would cause them death. She was known to be Ying Ok soon. The general manager, Lee Dog Yu then threatens the mess they made at his business place and challenges the team force to throw themselves all at a time towards him saying he orders his members to pull the shorters down, signaling that they will fight against the Ares team. Seeing the chaotic environment, manager Kim yells out at them to stop everything they were doing just because things gets turned up by him and apologizes to them regarding the mission and states that he won't repent. He turns towards the Ares leader stating that he already turned their offer down. As they were talking, 
The general manager talked with Yong Chiel about how Kim said he would repent despite their thoughts on about his ego and talked about how he was compromised over it. Manager Kim then stays home along with his friend, seeing his daughter reaching back home who was surprised to see her dad who curiously asks whether he finished his work after which he says that his mission ended sooner than he thought and after which his daughter runs towards him hugging him concerned asking him how he was doing. Seeing their relationship, Kim's friend was happily jealous of how they cared for each other when Minji told her dad to rest and she would do the other work for him. Kim's friend then asked him to tell him what happened about the matters at work on how they ended, which Kim then reminds how the general manager stated upon Kim being on probation how important it was to solve the matters and warned him not to cross the line anymore until he could be treated well by him. As they were talking, Kim's daughter told him that she would be out for a while and told him that she returned home to get her wallet as she was now part of the movie club which was commercialized as a film by the famous musical director. Listening to this, Kim tells her to take care despite the thoughts he had about him being the male senior. Minji then issues Kim saying that he wasn't any strange person as she had said that their tastes matched upon the talk over the movies. Kim seemed to look possessive about his daughter and as she was talking to him, a man appeared behind her saying that she wasn't lifting her calls or responding to them. It was the vice president of the movie club, Yoon Tae Young. He told Minji that he had come to her house as he was worried and asked who the man behind her was. To which Minji introduced Kim and his friend, Sung Han Soo to Yoon. Sung also felt the anger surpassing throughout Kim. Yoon then addresses him to be IUC and suddenly Sung yells out to apologize to him as he didn't ask for Kim's permission to call someone else's father to be a dad. Then Kim raises his face with a frozen expression seemingly staring at Yoon, and says to Sung that he wouldn't have any idea about it. As Yoon was explaining about the film being the vice director of the movie club, it was two months since Minji transferred to Jungyo High School, and she fell in love with Yoon when she happened to join the movie club. Kim was in a furious mood when Sung talked about how Minji was interested in films and said that she might be thinking of a career in the way to be into acting and videography. Kim then fiercely stares at Sung asking him whether he must kill Yoon. Sung suddenly tries to calm him down by saying it is normal that minor children are already going to movies by themselves and asks what is wrong with him. Sung then tried to convince Kim to get hold of him saying that Minji was going to be an adult soon and pointed out whether he would be going to inspect everything was his own and tell Shim that he should try leaving it to her choice as of how she chooses the work environment to be by themselves. Then the leader of the area hears them over the phone as to what Sung was talking about and encourages Kim to find out about the man whom she was with saying they would only know the tension of dads having daughters. Kim then starts to spy on Minji and Yoon and finds them going towards the theater to watch a movie together, and fears what will happen. As Minji and Yoon Sun Bi arrived at the theater seated together, Minji was flushed as she was watching a movie alone with Sun Bi as he said this was a meet to appreciate the film. She then recalls about Sun Bi, who was the transfer student the same as her during the same time she got transferred. She then wonders how she was attracted to him as they had the same taste in liking movies, and due to this, she joined the movie club out of her interest in it. And as Sun Bi presented the movie, Minji fell in love with him. As she was lost in those thoughts, Sunbi called out to her, getting her back to her senses and saying that the movie was about to start. And as the movie was going on, Minji couldn't focus on the movie and was thinking about Sunbi as she gazed over him without his notice. This was figured out by Kim, who was seated far away from them and was furiously watching them together. The movie is completed. Minji and Sunbi work out talking upon taking a work nearby and they have fun together in a cafe by playing games and all. As it is already night, they are walking along, and Yoon stops saying he has something to say to Minji, where Minji thinks he is going to confess to her, but instead, Yoon asks whether the man following her is her dad as he figures out staring at them since earlier. Minji was surprised to see him and asked whether he was following them to which he said he stopped nearby. Yoon then bows to Kim addressing him as dad again and introducing himself to be Minji's senior. He then asks them to get over to the car saying he would drop them off. And then after picking up Yoon, he warns him not to misbehave with his daughter before she is completely an adult and threatens him that he is dead. Listening thus, Yoon starts to laugh hard and Kim stares at him with a death stare to which he keeps telling Kim about the fact and says that he wouldn't be anything if there was something about his daughter. And then instantly, a vehicle hits their car, Kim loses control of his car and crashes on the road. Sung was worried about why Kim hadn't written home and he asked Minji when he said he would drop her guy friend by his car to which Minji answered yes and told him not to worry as Kim said he would return soon. As the car crashed, the men in masks came out from the truck vehicle who were out to confirm whether Kim was dead and checked upon Sunbi, whom they referred to as Jay. 
He was shot by the injection to bring him back to his senses. Sunbi was then kicked by the man as that he was doing instead of stealing information which he couldn't do even after getting close to Kim's daughter. The masked men then thought of getting departed and while they were getting into the truck, Kim grabbed one of them by the neck, who was called out by pointing gum towards Kim saying they shouldn't be involved in such a mess in someone else's country. Some then decided to go and find Kim as he was feeling strange as if something bad happened to him, and now, he couldn't leave Minji alone. And then suddenly the doorbell rang, and it was the delivery guy as Minji ordered some midnight snacks. And then she tells him to leave them by the door, and as Sung opens the door to take it, trembling in fear and asking the fees in a shaky voice, and gets shot by the men behind who try to barge into Kim's house. Sung he tells Minji not to visit the club again from now on, and then tells her to close all the doors around the house and fights them to protect Minji, and eventually gets lost and lays down on the ground as he is overpowered by them. The masked men find Minji in a bunker which is in the bathroom, as Minji remembers her father saying this would even protect her as it withstands the nuclear weapons too. The leader of the areas still fights them when he is at his location, and Jay then grows furious after which Sung wakes up after getting electrocuted by the asked men and finally gets prepared to teach a lesson to them. It was the times when Sung was trained to fix the nature of his high temper by undergoing character training that led him to sharpen and polish his traits. And thereby, he fought all the masked men thinking about what his master would do after knowing that he lost his temper to fight them. And then suddenly, Jay raises attacking Sung threatening to kill him, and then he knocks him using his karate skills. He then approaches Jay and confronts him about who they are, and scares him by asking what he had to do with his friend and his daughter as to why they were getting attacked. As he was talking with Jay, the other masked men set fire at the entrance of Kim's house, then Sung senses it and suddenly grabs Minji, and succeeds in escaping the house without any burns leaving the area to be burned in flames. The men who captured him try to figure out how the situation along Jay was and decide to continue the mission where they were targeting Kim and his daughter. The building was set on flames and the residents were chaotic and were dialing 911 then Sung asked if she discovered anything strange about the club's senior to which Minji said he was a transfer student because of his father. The AS leader, Park calls Sang saying that the men weren't answering anything despite interrogating what they said about, and saying that he would be coming up with the results within 10 minutes. Minji then yells as she doesn't get any information regarding where her dad is. Sung was also wondering as it was strange since it never happened that Kim disappeared for such a long time. Park then listened to this over the phone and giggled after hearing how concerned his daughter was asking about him remembering how Kim fought with the enemies in different scenes. Sung then assures Minji that to not worry about him and says that he is well known and famous in the industry as a renowned lunatic. Kim was getting back to their senses by listening to the talk of the masked men after being knocked out by the accident. He then figured out that he was brought into an underground passage as he sensed the damp smell around him. He was thrown there with his hands and legs tied up. He then counts upon how many men are around him. There was Jay, who was sitting with an unsatisfied expression and the men as what was wrong and threatened him that he would crush his face. Then Jay snags saying that he was also no less to crush his face. And as they both were singing, the man carrying Kim started to tremble which grabbed the attention of all the enemies and then Kim managed to free himself from the ties and fought all the enemies around in an instant. The enemies then take upon the forces by guns and start to shoot at Kim which he manages to dodge them. When Jay spots him and moves to attack him, Kim is stuck on the roof after which he falls on the masked man, behind Jay startling him and shooting through his. Kim then points the gun at Jay, questioning him who had sent them. Kim then notices the writings on the walls of the passage which says that this was the first passage which is a completely controlled area and to apologize for crimes towards your people by death, and to kill the enemies of the party. It was North Korea's largest political prison camp, Biobui, where a man appeared he said he was there due to the gun sound he heard seeing him, and Kim was surprised. Park then informs Sung about the backtracking result which was found to be from North Korea, and he states that the opponent has prepared very systematically this time which seemed to be an act of revenge. It was Beak who stated that he was happy to meet Kim with such evil intentions on his face. It was in the past when a man ordered a woman to kill herself and handed over the gun to her, and in the present Beak was pointing his gun toward Kim. Minji was worried listening that it was from North Korea, which left Sung confused as he assured them that they must be in South Korea, and that he would hand this to Jin Chil to deal with it, and said he would contact a North Korean expert he knows. He then dialed up the person, it was Ken Gukchul, who belonged to the National Special Mission Agency, he was a bit crazier than usual as he grew furious to get his phone after a man sarcastically pointed him as the idiot who left the phone without any consent. Kim was wounded by his shoulder 
and then address B to be number 6 to 6. And then he reminds us why he is here stating that he would take revenge on him which he was prepared for a long time as his comrade died in the past, and threatens Kim saying he would take his revenge by targeting his daughter and killing her in front of him so that he could feel the pain he had losing one of his men. Suddenly, Kim punched Beek's face, such that blood started to ooze from his nose, and Jay ran calling him father. Beak then smirks as he thinks he will be struggling soon as he did to save his daughter when he was here. As he sings with Minji, who is surrounded by the masked men who are threatening them to attack, Beak smiles with an evil look on his face, and Kim grows furious to teach him a lesson and swears to give him a brutal death. Sung and Minji are surrounded by the men, and Beak reminds him of when he was going to continue and triggers the feeling in him to give up on everything he had. The masked men were informed to target the girl, Kim's daughter. Minji asks where Jin Chiel is to which Sung replies that it would take some time for him to arrive as he wasn't nearby, and she starts to cry upon knowing that no one would show up. Sung tries to comfort her by assuring he would be there to protect her. Sung then continues to fight all the masked men and saves Minji from escaping from them. Beak then reminds Kim as to how his men were persistent in attacking and that they wouldn't lose to anything whatever happened. Beak then reminds Kim of how he predicted him to come after the Special Affairs Bureau incident, which was the cause of the first revenge taking upon him. As Sung and Minji were escaping from the men, one of the men aimed to attack them by putting at gunpoint, and suddenly, the old woman barged in and introduced she belonged to the Ares team, and was a ninja who came to protect them, and was known to be Yung Oksun, also known to be Kuroda Yuki. In he passed, Yun was known to be a profound ninja who were most of them the assigned assassins who were given missions and took care of the secretive works as agents and spies. She was one of the oldest members of the organization who despite her age continued to fight the Ares team. The masked man ran towards her, swearing at her in anger, and she was blocked by the man, who was being ordered to kill the members in the mask. Yoon then stabs the last man without affecting his vital organs and to obtain information from him. They were known to be the people who were called upon to the location by the order of their leader, and the man was the youngest member of the team, Section Chief Nam, who was under Jin Chiel and was now preparing to infiltrate North Korea. In the past, Kim already had suggested Jin Chiel about those men who would find out about him and even try to attack later, and Kim concludes by saying they would soon end the ill-fated relationship with the North. Nam then gets informed that the leader was aware of the situation that was going on, and that he was worried about Kim's daughter and her safety. Yoon then informs that she found out the location which was Biol Bawe, where Kim was trapped. Kim was losing his senses due to the wounds he got fighting Beak, and he thought he would allow him to run, before he changed his mind saying to his son that nothing happens without any challenge, and that the world was full of variables which he did to make him feel about it. Kim then starts running towards the exit. Yoon then explains Sung upon how the prison was like a maze which wouldn't be easy to escape from the place by own, and if anyone even found out it would be hard to escape as it was the place where thousands died of starvation from the unbreakable prison. Yoon then says that she contacted someone who already knew things a North Korean would know. The man was armed by soldiers who tracked down Kim's location where the special operation team of Mount Bak do. The leader then yells out swearing they could sweep out all the spies at a prison, instead of the fact they didn't seem to have come to save him from the prison maze. Park then receives a call that he was able to get in touch with the man who seemed that he would be able to help him right away. A girl was rushing toward the shop and was yelling out for her father as she had something to talk about what had happened at her house, and that moment, she opened the door. She was confused about where her father disappeared. The man was known to be the mole cricket who performed surveillance, kidnapping, and detaining civilians, and he even killed his superior. Despite this, he was able to remain in the special task force because the force gave up everything for the sake of the nation rather than the individual. And because of the closed nature of the organization, the dismissal had the employees promoted in the exhausting military world who were tied under that man. The man who was the vice minister then researched El Bay was number 6 to 6 and about his personality as to how openly he was in the south. At the time, he was informed that things were ready and the four teams were ready with their troops to go. To which, the vice minister stated it wasn't much more important than the national security as of now, and marched upon to protect the country primarily. Kim was still wandering within the walls of the prison when he found a corpse which reminded him about the place he was in which was known to be the political prison camp, designed to drive people insane under the labyrinth of cannibalism. And suddenly, a man with an axe starts to attack Kim, which he manages to dodge. They were the underground residents of the prison, 
Ri and Cho, who seemed to be driven insane after being trapped in the place. Kim then remembered that this was the place where cannibals were residing, who were in a state to be pushed to eat humans only to choose to survive. These people were even ignored by the prison guards, even though they fought with the other prisoners, despite it being no less than hell, as people got used to this hell and already lost their minds. They approached towards Kim the half-dead zombie who planned to kill and feed on him. Kim then attacks the man approaching him, which shocks the other prisoners, and then Kim looks at them with a killing stare asking for where the exit is. Jay concerned asked his father Beak what would happen to them if their hostage fled freely while they relaxed, to Beak assures him not to worry and says that it wasn't an easy revenge he held for ages. As Kim was fighting the crazy men around him, he noticed the sounds of the woman around him who was speaking to him, getting her turn cut by beak by the prisoners. Kim then fights all the guards and approaches her remembering her to be the person from his past who he didn't seem to forget about and he cries with a furious look on his face after seeing her condition asking what happened and why was she here. It was about beak's revenge on Kim for which he waited for more than 20 years for the moment he wanted to seek him in a desperate situation. He seemed like a sadist as he wasn't pleased by seeing Kim to see such a hopeless expression where he met the person who he thought was dead. Kim then asks the woman why she was there and cries out loud grabbing her shoulder as to why she deceived him for a long time and asks whether it was from the times when Minji was born. He becomes emotional when he speaks of his daughter and how she grew up and cries upon how she resembled her so much crying over her dead expression face. He was in mixed emotions of hatred and relief as he found her alive after so long. As she wanted to talk about something, she could only make noises which made Kim realize that she had undergone lots of torture and noticed that her ting was cut off. Kim then wipes his tears and carries the woman on his shoulders. The man lying on the ground looked at what Kim was doing and as his eyes met his, Kim was staring through his soul which feared him. Kim then questioned him what Beak Daniel was. Beak was gathering up the guards, who were ordering them even when they saw Kim roaming freely, not to kill him but to shoot him instead of killing him directly. The father and so have already planned upon how Kim would try to walk away with the woman he found out, but Beak points out that he would be looking for him instead and that his eyes would be burning with anger and revenge towards him which he wanted to wake up in him. The bank was already prepared to face Kim when he seemed to be as such with dozens of revenge on him. He then leaves the guards dispersed to do their duty and orders to look upon the location tracker. Jay then tells his father that he wouldn't point out Kim's tacking suspecting him of approaching them by taking off his clothes. One of the guards barges into Beak's room yelling out that the tracker on the woman's body was discovered and destroyed which shot Beak. Beak then orders Jay to set upon an emergency defiance alert, which makes Beak tremble on how his efforts would go in vain. The alarms were ringing which said that the emergency defense alert was activating wherein the situation among the guards went chaotic. Kim then starts to sense something weird as he remembers that he was injected with something after which he reached the limit which made him think he couldn't run or fight. Kim then was disguised as one of the guards who were planning to meet Beak to end such an exhausting faded relationship between them. Kim comforts the woman assuring her her that he would protect her despite seeing Beak preparing all the things he is dressed up as one of the guards to settle the matter with Beak and tells her that he will be back to her when it is done. Then Kim approaches the place where Beak is and calls out to meet him outside his room which is overheard by them. The guard then starts to recognize him and before the other guards turn to them, the guard is thrown down and all the guards rush toward Kim to attack him. Then when Kim barges into the room, he doesn't find Beak or Jay inside who are not in the place where Kim already arrived. Kim then starts to fight all the guards, clearing his way to find Beak. Jay was already cautious and was shooting at Kim who had already reached their room. When Jay ran out of bullets, Kim called him out to fight one with him. The moment Jay rose unarmed, Kim took it as an opportunity and shot Jay down. He was tricked by Kim as Kim already knew he was running out of bullets, leading him to be shot by him. Jay then confirms that nothing is going on with his daughter, listening. Kim feels sorry for his daughter as if he was the man she loved, and then he shoots him to death as a result. As Kim comes out, the guards keep marching towards them to attack him which Kim ends by shooting them. Kim was trembling due to the poison effect of the injection, but was determined to go back to Minji. Soon he finds the gang of masked men ahead of him, who demand where Jay is which Kim says he would have died by shooting himself. As Kim's vision was blurring out, his friend, Park, arrived which set the whole situation in battle mode. Park was accompanied by the bulky man who was the owner of a laundry shop, 
who was set upon the fighting mission which was against the gangsters and the fathers of the daughters who would intend to spare themselves and their lives to protect their daughters. One hour earlier, the vice president and his troops were speeding in their vehicles to infiltrate Biol Bawa. The head of the security confirms G1 and G2's positions, and the vice president tell them that two teams of Mount Bapdu and 17 Venus are moving, and they will be taking tunnel numbers 606 to 7, 59 and 47 as well. He further tells them to not worry about the aftermath because the North infiltrated first so their actions are justified. The relationship between North and South is a bunch of infiltrations anyways, but this information is not revealed to the common public, and as long as they're not loud while infiltrating, it won't be any problem, and it's not like they are going there in a helicopter. As he is speaking to them, a chopper passes from above them, and they all look at it surprised if it is their ally or an enemy. The vice president looks at it and says it's definitely the North's special forces chopper but he didn't dispatch it. The chopper is being operated by Cheel, who is singing while flying. The doctor asks Cheel if he can just steal a helicopter from the army just like that to which he replies that he didn't steal it and he just took it in advance as he points towards Sam Dak and asks if he knows about advanced supply and how he misses it. A soldier says to the vice president that at this rate their position will be reversed and the helicopter will soon reach the North's airspace. He further notices that Chiel had forcibly gotten access to the floor plans of Biol Bawa. He lands the helicopter and says they have reached earlier thanks to the floor plans. At present time they are standing surrounded by North's soldiers. There is a blast in the building and Cheel and Sam Dak force their way through the soldiers killing them one by one. They try to counter-attack them but all their efforts go down the drain as they continue making their way through them without any difficulty. The doctor and Cheel reaches to Kim and he give him an injection to treat him then they go back to fight the other soldiers. Kim reaches the room where Beak is present and says as he is entering that he finally found him. Beak replies that indeed he found him after going through the labyrinth and asked him to get seated but he refuses and wants to ask something else but he interrupts in between and asks him to get seated again as one of his men bring out Eugene on gunpoint. Beak takes the gun from his hand and shoots her through the head saying that he asked him to sit down but he didn't. Kim just stands there snapped out of his senses to see her short in front of his eyes. Beak says that Kim is responsible for her death since he didn't follow his order and didn't sit down. Kim is boiling with rage. As he's about to do something Beak takes out his phone and shows him a photo of Minji surrounded by his men with guns pointed at her. He says that his men already found her and if he tries to do anything he's going to kill his daughter too. He kicks a chair towards him and orders him to pick it up and sit down. He walks up to him and shows him and asks him what was he thinking kidnapping the supreme leader and thinking that the Republic will leave him alone. He further says that the Republic will not get off his back as long he is alive. He takes out his phone and shows him an order, and tells him he can press the button and tell the Republic that number 6 to 6 is dead, and the Republic will not bother him anymore but in exchange his daughter will die. Or he can kill himself and save his daughter in exchange. As Kim stands there helpless and filled with rage and he says that he loves the expression on his face because he cannot do anything. Earlier Beak's men had bought a woman who looked like Eugen, and he ordered his men to cut her tongue, and with a little bit of plastic surgery and hair dye she will look like Eugen. He also edited a fake picture of Ninji to look like his men had reached there to deceive Kim. He is waiting for Kim to kill himself because he knows he wants to save his daughter and can't wait to tell him that he has been deceiving him all along. But as soon as he lets his guard down Kim comes through and pinches him in the face. He already found out that Beak was lying because when he touched the woman's hair earlier it let out the dye and he found it out when the doctor gave him the injection. Beak hits a wall and falls down. Kim tells him to get up so that he can finish all of this with his own hands. Beak wipes the blood off his face and says that he is right, they have to see the result till the end. He stands up and moves forward towards Kim and pinches him in the face. They start fighting with all of their last strength. Beak manages to land a few punches but Kim quickly counterattacks and starts hitting him non-stop. Beak is gets blacked out for a moment and remembers the time when he was in the hospital. It felt like he was just walking in a long tunnel which never ended. When he finally gained consciousness, he asked for what happened to Kim and his family and his men told him that Eugen died while giving birth and gave him the location of Minji. He remembers why he was doing all of this in the first place for revenge. He wanted Kim to feel the despair and hopelessness he felt when he was unconscious. He gets back into his senses and starts punching him. Kim is surprised to see this sudden change in his attitude, and they both start exchanging punches after punches. While fighting, 
Big justifies his faking his daughter's assassination and says that Kim and Eugen also conspired to stab him in the back and he's talking as if he had lost everything. Kim looks confused and Beak tells him that this is his final plan. It might be sloppy, but this is the last time he is fighting him. He further tells him that he had ordered all of the spies from the south to kill his daughter and everyone with them. As Minji and everyone is leaving the hospital, she sees two police officers and runs towards them asking for help, but is stopped to see a red dot laser pointed at her head. They were the spies of south. Hansu saved her and they both fall down. Suddenly a car stops behind them, and a group of men works towards them. They are also from the spy division, and are here to kill them. On the other hand, while fighting Kim asks if he has lost his mind ordering the spies to shoot openly as this can cause a war, and Beak replies that he is not afraid of the war, and the higher officials love the war. Kim replies that he is not the only one with contacts. The vice president and his men reaches the hospital to catch the spies and starts shooting them. The vice president reaches the parking lot and confronts everyone present there and asks if they think of the South's laws as a joke and introduces himself as the vice president of the Special Missions Bureau and everyone is worried after hearing this and wonder what is he doing there. He orders them to not move and simply surrender, but they try to counter him and start taking out their weapons but are immediately stopped by a sonic boom grenade. The soldiers handcuff them and arrest them. He sees Minji and Hansu running away, and remembers the time when he fought against Hansu and was defeated badly. He shouts to Hansu to not run and surrender as he'll not let him leave. Suddenly all the lights in the parking lot are turned off, and he orders the soldiers to turn on night vision and look for Hansu. He further tells them to shoot him if they see him, and they can later declare them as spies and kill them off. The old grandma says that things have become complicated to which Oksun replies that he already told them to get away quickly, and they have bought enough time to get away, and asks her if they should go too. To their surprise they are stopped by few men in suits who introduce themselves as the 17 Venuses of the Special Missions Bureau. The granny asks them where did they learn these things and says that even if they don't know anything they should act like they do, and even if they do know something they should act like they don't, and these are the basics of intelligence. Back at B.O.L. Barwick him and Beak are still fighting. Beak is angry because he stopped all of his plans and already made arrangements for anything that should happen. Kim hits him again, and he lands against a wall. He says it isn't over, and pulls down his collar to reveal the scar that the wound left. Kim says that all of his wounds can be fixed if he starts paying more attention to the small wonders and joys of life instead of the big plans. He gets back up to attack Kim again, but he has no more strength, and Kim hits him in the chest and his heart stops beating. Before coming to the fight, Beak had told his comrades that he will take all the responsibility if anything goes wrong. His comrades see how it ended up with Beak when suddenly a man works into the room and orders them to first listen to his will. About half a year ago, Beak had infiltrated the general chief's office and started killing all of the soldiers. The general chief of Biol Bawi, Guangzhou worriedly asked him why he is killing them and what does he want. He walks up to Guangzhou and asked him for a cigarette and to change the maze of Biol Bawi without any floor plan. Guangzhou looks at him shocked and asks why does he want to do it. He further tells him that he needs orders from the officials above him even if he's from Division 51. Beak takes out a photo of his wife and kid and says that if he doesn't listen to him things won't be good for his family, and if he does what he says then his family will be safe and he will be promoted to a higher position in Pyongyang. He hesitatingly asks why he is doing all of this and Beak replies that it is his will. In present time, Beak is on his last bits of breath as he lies on the ground and laughs while coughing and says that he'll wait for him in hell since he cannot go anywhere now. He has already planned out everything to this last moment. These were his last words and he dies lying flat on the ground. Meanwhile outside Cheel and Sam Dak are still fighting. Cheel says that they need to leave and tells the doctor to go and start the helicopter. They try to stop them but fail. Sandak says that they are leaving not because they are getting tired, but because they are low on time. Kim tries to get out of there, but since the maze is changed, he cannot. Cheel tries to follow the floor map, but he is also stuck and cannot find the entrance to the maze when suddenly Guangzhou comes out of nowhere ordering his men to stop them. Cheel sees him and beats him up and orders him to change the maze back according to the floor plan. He replies that he can't because Beak had promised him a promotion and safety for his family I'm Pyongyang. Cheel's radio buzzes and Sam Dak says that the Korean People's Army Unit 994 are marching in and they should hurry. Cheel bluffs Guangzhou into believing that Beak lied to him and manages to find Kim through the maze. He gets Kim on his shoulders and works out of there. He asks if his burden of his ill relationship with the North is over now. 
Kim gives a smile of relief and says yes and that he cannot go through anything like this again. Hansu's son arrives back at his home but is shocked to see it all broken and asks to himself what happened to his house. An hour earlier at the BL Bawe, two soldiers were keeping guard and one of them spots Chil's helicopter and asks if they should report it to the higher-ups but the other soldier replies that it is a South Special Missions Bureau helicopter and it must be all the will of Beak. They see him and others leaving after finishing the job and starts firing at them, but Chiel stops them and tells them to save their bullets as the prisoners have broken free and everyone inside is probably already dead and then left in the helicopter. Minji and Hansu manage to escape in a car and are driving away. Minji asks if everything will be all right, and Hansu tells her that her safety is their number one priority right now. He tells her that there is a car following them since they left the parking lot. The car following them is being driven by Shinsira, the section chief of White Tiger Forces. She calls Lee, and he asks what is happening. She tells her that she is following the car and maintaining the distance, and asks how is it going on his side. He replies that he is angry and orders her to find manager Kim as soon as possible. Suddenly Hansu stops and turns around his car, and she have to stop too. Hansu walks up to her and asks why is she following them. She says that she is a huge fan of him, but Hansu gets annoyed and breaks her window. He says that this isn't the time to joke around, and she should get to the point to which she replies that the Major General is looking for Manager Kem, and they can't reach him at all. Back at the parking lot, Oksun had been beating up the soldiers of Special Missions Bureau when the Deputy Manager of White Tiger Forces and Yong Chiel reached there. Sangi says that the situation is quite severe than what they had thought and they didn't want to get involved, but they don't have any other choice. They walk by the vice president and stands in front of the granny and asks her where manager Kim is, and that Lee is looking for him. Meanwhile, on the helicopter Chiel says to Kim that he should give Peng Kwan a call since he was really worried regarding him and the North dispute, and he agrees. Hansu is standing in front of Shin shocked because he cannot believe what she just said. She repeats that Peng Kwan had died earlier today and had left a will. She further tells him that the content of the will was that he is leaving all his powers and wealth to Kim. This will turn the world of underground upside down, and she asked him to find manager Kim at once. Kim is admitted to the central hospital for his treatment. Chil tells him to take all the rest he wants here and they will take care of the cleanup. Hansu asks him what they should do first and he replies that they take care of the Special Missions Bureau first and after that they can focus on laundering their identities. He further asks if the North business has been really taken care of to which Chil replies that yes, all the records for the Code 6 to 6 have been completely erased. Minji works in and asks Kim if he's alright and sits beside him. He tells her he is fine and asks what did the doctor told him to do and she says that he needs to rest for better recovery and stay still. Hansu was wondering about Peng Kwan's funeral and Kim says that it has been postponed by a week because his men are investigating about his death and they have something to ask to them too so they will send someone there. There is a knock on the door and Lee works in with Sangi and Yongchil. Lee greets Kim and asks his to rest. He asks Kim as to when will he return to his work. Chil gets annoyed and asks him that he was trying to get rid of him in the first place, so why is he asking him to work again? Lee gets up and says that he shouldn't talk to him like this, when suddenly a nurse walks in and tells them to leave because the patient needs to recover. They walk out of the room and the nurse works up to Kim to give him an injection, but as she's about to inject it Lee grabs her hand and says he knew they would do something like this. He tells Kim that since he inherited Peng Kwan's will, his successors will try to eliminate him, and he will be under the protection of White Tiger forces now onwards. Kim asks Chiel and Hansu to go to their homes to rest and they say their byes. As they're leaving suddenly the door opens and three men work in. They walk inside ignoring and hitting Lee and Chiel. They introduce themselves as the Chion Wai Tion group and asks Kim to stand up and go with them. Kim asks if they're Peng Kwan's men but they didn't understand as they are Chinese. Chiel and Lee hit two of them for hurting them first and the man in the suit, Jen Yuan, says this is why he prefers coming alone. He walks up to the door and locks it so that no one leaves. He takes off his blazer and asks them to attack him. He will handle them with just one hand. Sometime earlier, before leaving to take, Kim Sung san asked his elders permission to test him to see if he's capable of becoming the successor of Peng Kwan, to which he agreed, but warned him about Chiel and Lee. Back in the hospital, Chiel and Lee were hitting him very badly to the extent that it damaged the hospital building. After they settled down, Chirozi, the other member of the group asked him what did he learn and he replies that he did not know about Kim but the people he is surrounded by are sure strong. He bows down to them and apologizes for his indecent behavior and tells him he just wanted to test him. He further tells them that according to Peng Kwan's will they have come there to take the successor with them 
and it's a very confidential matter, but rumors have already been spread. Chiel asks him how did Penquan die, to which he replies that he cannot disclose any information right now, but his death seems like a murder. Everyone is shocked to hear this. He further explains that when they found his body, he was holding a bunch of flowers, and he didn't hold any flowers during his lifetime. He tells them that he always used to talk about his successes being those three, and he even remembered them before his death. Minji interrupts in between and asks if Kim will be able to ride an airplane as he's not well, to which he replies that the Chion Wai Chion group has arranged for everything from medical staff to private jets for them. Lee asks him how will they protect him from potential dangers. He thinks for a bit and says if they are so worried about his security. They should all accompany him since they are his acknowledged friends. Chiel asks Hansu what is he going to do and he replies that of course he is going to go. But he thinks that his house burned down and his son would be looking for him. Chiel also thinks about his daughter. As they are talking about this Sung Sun interrupts them and tells them that he has already sent people to pick up their kids. They look worried and tell him that their kids are a bit weird and they won't like if strange people go up to them. Hansu's son, Tihoon beats down a group of high school boys who came to fight him when the members of Chon Wai Chion group find him and Chiel's daughter. Davin is also fighting with some other schoolgirls when they go to pick her up. The men sent to pick their children up puts them on the phone with their respective fathers. Tihoon refuses to go and says he don't care if it's Pangkorn or anyone else and he hangs up the phone. He asks them where they are from and they tell him they are from China so he asks them to take out their wallet and give him 500 won. On the other hand, Davin also refuses to go and says she has an exam in two days which she cannot miss. She hands over the phone to them and tells them not to come looking for her like this as it upsets her. Disappointed, they decide to go alone with Kim. They get in the flight and reach the place where the funeral was being held. At the funeral house a man asks the elder of the Chon Wai Chion group if it's okay to carry out the funeral like this to which he replies that Peng Kwon was Korean and he always said that his funeral should be as humble as possible. Kim and others reach the place where the elder introduces himself as Shi Jin Kwon the director of the Chon Wai Chion group and welcomes them. The three of them stand before Peng Kwon's photo and remember the times when they used to hang out like friends and when he used to guide them like a parent. They bow down to pay their respects. Shi Jin Kwon comes in and asks Kim to accept the succession. They get up and Kim says of course but first he wants to know what happened to the first and second successors, Peng Kwon's sons. A long time ago Peng Kwon had told him that he had two sons out of which his eldest son is the first successor. His second son is the second and Kim was the third successor in case something was to happen to his. Shi Jin Kwon looks worriedly at him when suddenly he is shot in the head. The men who shot him start firing at them saying that they found out. They take cover behind a wall. Lee calls one of his men for intel on Peng Kwon's son and he tells him that the elder son is dead and the second son Ziyi Ziyi Guan is in Songdo International High School and someone attempted to kill him along with Kim. He asked if he should go to find out about the second son but Lee tells him that Shin is already sent to find about him in disguise of a student. He decides that he has to protect the second son and that is their mission now. Lee hangs up the call and says they should leave the second son to Shin Sira and they should take care of the shooters first. He orders Sangi to tell Yongchil to get ready to run, and he replies that he already did. Hansu attacks and knocks down the shooters and all of them start attacking him, but Chiel throws a stun grenade and run out of there as soon as they are disoriented. Lee asks Kim if he's alright, and if he has any idea who attacked them at the funeral, to which he replies that he's not sure. They run out and get in the car in which Yong Chiel and Sung Sun are already seated. Shin reaches in Inchun at the Songdu International High School and thinks she should find the second son before the other side gets to him. She gets into the same class as the second son according to the intel, the teacher introduces her as an exchange student who has come there from Beverly Hills. She introduces herself and says that her father owns an overseas company and her grandfather handles the foreign affairs now. The teacher asks her to get seated wherever she feels comfortable before the start of the first period. Soon when she gets seated, the boy beside her greets her and as is about to introduce himself is interrupted by another boy with blonde hair. His name is Jeff Logan and he's the eldest son of US Logan Corporation. He mucks her and touches her inappropriately on the shoulder seeing which the boy from earlier grabs his hand and asks him to leave and knocks him down. As Cam and others are leaving in the car, they reach the entrance of a tunnel, but Sung Sun suddenly stops the car as there is a man standing in between the road. They all look shocked and Kim remembers the one time he was on a call with Peng Kwon and he told him about some of the people Peng Kwon warned them about. The man is Hong Wikun, one of the nine people Peng Kwon coveted. 
He walks to the car and tells them to get down from the car. Shin says that she appreciates their effort, but their acting was very bad. They look at her shocked and asks her what does she mean. She explains that Logan fell even before the punch really hit him, but they reply that they do not know what she's talking about. So, she works out of their apologizing and, in her mind, she knew that something's wrong and the second son is hiding with the help of other students in the school. She walks to the cafeteria and grabs her lunch. She gets seated down and thinks to herself that all of the students present there are financially well off and their families are also very powerful, so why would they be helping Gui Guan? And then it struck her that they are helping him because they want to and not because they want anything. The class teacher comes and sits beside her and asks her if she's enjoying her food. She stops for a bit and thinks that Chi Yu Iguan cannot see injustice and someone being bullied so she starts crying in front of the teacher and tells him that the boys from earlier hit her and her mother in front of her. Hearing this the teacher gets angry and walks over to them and starts scolding them. He was indeed the second son of Penquan. He had sent Chi Yu Guan to teach at a school because he had a very short temperament. Back at the tunnel, Chiel and Hansu attack Wichin, but he dodges them without any difficulty. Kim exclaims that he's really fast, but Lee tells him that he has mastered the art of prediction and human body language. He can see and predict the attacks before they hit him that's why he is so strong. Lee walks up to him and starts fighting him. Wichin cannot predict his moves and is having a hard time fighting him. Lee breaks out the car door and hits Wichin on the head cutting off his ear. Hong Wichin with a tore off ear and hand full of blood wondered if he wants to take on that beast. Even one second predictions weren't enough and he must see beyond that. He must be able to predict even inside the anomaly. He closed his eyes for a second and then fought Lee Dog Yu while dodging his attacks. Lee Dog Yu praised his skills but also claimed to foresee Hong Wichin's moves landing a painful knee strike. He felt as if a truck was hitting him. Despite the pain, Hong Wichin retaliated with a jump kick, slamming Lee Dog Yu to the ground. In the midst of this struggle, Hong Wichin aimed not just to defeat his opponent but also to surpass himself, believing that winning against Lee Dog Yu would elevate him to new heights. A fight based on irregularity, anomaly and senses. The moment he overcome that, there will be no fight he could not predict. In the staff room, the teacher questioned Sira about her claim of having nowhere to go. Sira shared a fabricated tale of enduring abuse and escaping her father's relentless push for succession education. Believing the teacher to be Zhou Jiyuai Guan, she gauged his knowledge. Tearfully, she sought his advice on coping with such a challenging family. Zhou Guing Wan, holding Sira's hands, emphasized the diverse nature of people and the unique importance of family bonds. Reflecting on his past, he pondered whether his rebellious phase Turning away from his family was necessary. Sira found herself in trouble as she knew a bit about Zhou Ji Yuai Guan's situation, and others were starting to bother him. A burly Russian named Breslovsky, known as the Russia Killer, introduced himself as a new teacher. Sira felt uneasy, thinking he didn't even try to hide his identity and might resort to violence if things went wrong. Realizing she needed to act fast, she decided to move quickly. As two boys emerged from the restroom, Sira approached them asking if they wanted to help the teacher. She explained that she was there to assist their teacher as well. In the past, Zhou Ji Yuai Guan confided in the boys, revealing he was the successor of Chon Wai Chon. He empathized with their daily struggles and their desire to rebel against the burdens of being successors. When they asked him to share his experiences, he agreed, suggesting they all bring something to the table. As a senior who had wandered before, he emphasized the importance of having at least one person to trust in life, aligning with his educational philosophy. They questioned Sira about her trustworthiness, expressing how Zhou Ji Yuai Guan was the first adult to truly understand their feelings. Sira admitted uncertainty but pledged to try harder for their trust, emphasizing her genuine efforts this time. Meanwhile, Bruflovsky, the Russian infiltrator, roamed the hallway, discussing his mission related to Chon Wai Chon. Encountering an empty Russian class, Sira informed him it was a mobile class. Bruflovsky, armed with a knife, demanded information on Zhu Penguin's second son, but Sira claimed ignorance. The two boys attempted to escort Zhou Ji Yuai Guan out of the school while Sira stalled for time. Bruflovsky pressed Sira for information, but she advised against infiltration due to his conspicuous appearance. Kim Hyo Seung, a recent White Tiger Forces subcontractor, revealed himself. Earlier, Sira, at Lee Dog Yu's advice, contacted Kim Hyo Seung before Sing Ho's arrival, acknowledging his usefulness. Kim Hyo Sian criticized Broflovsky's lack of effort in infiltration and instructed Sira not to intervene. Anticipating Kim Hyo Sian's arrival, 
Sarah considered him the man respected and admired by Lee Dogyu. Kim Hyo Seung warned Broflovsky to prepare for a fight comparable to his battle with the Major General, signaling the imminent clash with the boom of the Blue Dragon. Kim Hyo Seung, aged 42, held great admiration for the person he respected most in the world, Lee Dogyu. Kim's life took a turn of excitement when he decided to follow in Lee Dogyu's footsteps leading him to establish his own Blue Dragon Air and Center. It was during this time that he received a remarkable gift, a golden hook hand weapon, which served as his prosthetic arm. Kim's fascination with Lee Dog Yu went beyond physical appearances. He admired Lee's strength and devotedly followed his training methods, aspiring to become like him. However, the reality of Lee Dog Yu's power became evident when Kim experienced it firsthand in a battle that ended in a crushing defeat. Despite this, Kim felt an even deeper respect for Lee Dog Yu, appreciating the powerful aura that surrounded him. Gratitude overwhelmed Kim when Lee Dog Yu not only provided him with the opportunity to work together, but also handed him a business contract. Though Kim was hired as a subcontractor, Lee treated him like family. Filled with gratitude, Kim promised to work tirelessly, swearing his loyalty to Lee Dog Yu. Now, facing Bruflovsky, Kim demonstrated the same respect he held for Lee Dog Yu by delivering powerful punches. In an intense battle within a classroom, Kim and Bruflovsky matched each other's strength closely, captivating the onlooker, Sira. Meanwhile, Lee Dog Yu, observing the ongoing skirmish, grew annoyed and decided to join the fray himself, confronting Hong Wichen. In a casual manner, Lee Dog Yu mocked Hong, even removing his hat eye to showcase his true strength. Despite feeling fear and anxiety, Hong stood his ground refusing to back away from the fight. Lee Dog Yu, boasting about his abilities, claimed that he had never exerted more than 50% of his power until now. Charging up his strength to 51%, he laughed menacingly, ready to reveal his true might to Hong. On the other side, Kim Hyo Siang surged with power, causing his muscles to expand so forcefully that his shirt ripped apart. Witnessing this incredible display, Bruflovsky stood in shock as Kim aimed directly for his face, delivering a powerful punch that sent him flying backward. Bruflovsky, still bewildered, struggled to comprehend the astonishing strength Kim possessed. Without hesitation, Kim continued to unleash a barrage of blows, relentlessly pummeled Bruflovsky. His singular focus was on garnering Lee Dogu's attention, and he paid no mind to the aftermath of his assault. In Kim's mind, the sole purpose was to showcase how he had grown in strength, aspiring to surpass Lee's might someday. Meanwhile, Lee Dog Yu swiftly dealt with Hong, delivering fatal strikes that left him lifeless. Observing Sangi and Young Chul watching the fight, Lee mockingly greeted them. Meanwhile, Kim succeeded in subduing Broflovsky, yet his relentless assault continued. Sira pleaded with him to stop, insisting that the battle was already over. Finally, after beating Broflovsky senseless, Kim gazed at his battered fists. Concerned, Sira inquired about Kim's well-being. In that moment, Kim felt a surge of power, as if he had momentarily become Lee Dog Yu himself. Gritting his teeth and smiling, he let out an ecstatic scream, feeling like a formidable beast. Sira urged him to quickly put on his clothes before someone noticed, pondering why men acted this way. As teacher Zhou Ji Yui Guan rushed into the classroom, he was shocked by the chaotic scene. She explained that Zhou's first brother had died, and they were here to protect him in the ongoing purge war. Despite Zhou's reluctance to become a successor, Sira confronted him, emphasizing the gravity of giving up the succession. She pointed out that not only Zhou but those around him, including relatives and acquaintances, must die for the transfer of succession to be completed. Sira clarified that she didn't know who was orchestrating this, but they were gearing up for a fight. She warned that countless killers worldwide, drawn by the scent of money, were involved. Their unit price might be high, but they never failed and the strongest reinforcements were en route to Korea. The White Tiger forces, led by team manager Kim and Ares, were now in Korea. Simultaneously, a mysterious man received the same message, laughing menacingly at the potential bounty for capturing a conglomerate's son. Cho Ji Yui Guan felt disappointed in his son and expressed his feelings to him. He shared a belief that the people who suffer the most in this world are those with righteous personalities. Cho emphasized to Jo that being righteous means not being calculative, and if one can't be calculative, their surroundings might begin to crumble. Cho expressed concern about putting someone with such a personality in charge of the company's future. Despite Joe's attempts to explain, 
Cho interrupted him, stating that he once saw him as a more suitable successor but no longer believed that to be the case. Cho had even told Joe to leave and advised him to avoid trouble by not meddling in others' affairs. He suggested that Joe pursue teaching in the school he created as it would better suit his personality. Joe understood that his father already knew what kind of life suited him, and the decision made was out of respect. When questioned about his future plans by two other men, Joe had no clear answer. He expressed uncertainty about whether he still needed to watch things unfold to the end. Joe mentioned his inability to go to Chon Wai Chon immediately, and his subordinates suggested staying together for the time being. The White Tiger forces arrived at the school, and Sira informed manager Kim that the situation with Proflovsky inside the school had concluded. However, the main problem was just beginning, and the final darkness was in motion. They planned to send people on a full-scale operation, and decided to closely monitor Zhou Giyuai Guan for the next 24 hours. Sira inquired about Major General Lee Dogyu, and manager Kim explained that he would be delayed due to immigration issues. Taking charge in his absence, they decided to head to the hotel first for easier protection. Meanwhile, Zhou Giyuai Guan and his two subordinates found refuge in a hotel. Exhausted, the two subordinates enthusiastically crashed onto the beds, expressing their excitement at being in a hotel after a long time. They suggested ordering room service, but Zhou, still in shock, just stared at them. Their moment of relaxation was abruptly interrupted by a knock on the door, and Sira, a member of the White Tiger Forces, informed Joe that they would be on a stakeout at all times to protect him. Sira explained that their mission was to safely protect Joe and assist in the succession of the successor. They would be ready to help Joe in any situation. Before leaving, Sira advised Joe to lock the windows as they were the most vulnerable entry point for potential enemies. However, while Sira was explaining the security measures, Ahmed Hooded men had infiltrated the room, holding Joe's subordinates at knife point. They demanded Joe to remain still emphasizing that they hadn't harmed his friends yet. Joe, shocked and nervous, was then interrogated by the Ahmed men, who asked if he was the second successor of Chon Wai Chon. Suddenly, the power went out in the entire hotel, and chaos ensued. Manager Kim, another member of the White Tiger forces, sensed trouble and left to address the situation. Outside Joe's room, Sira banged on the door, panicking and asking if he was all right. Joe remained silent. In the hallway, Manager Kim encountered three armored men, revealed to be the ninjas from Japan. They attacked him with knives, but Kim skillfully dodged their assaults. The leader of the ninjas, Shunpai, slashed Kim's face with a poison knife, intending to paralyze him. However, Kim, despite being poisoned, managed to evade their attacks, surprising the ninjas. He explained that he had trained since childhood and recalled his master, who was even more skilled. Back in the hotel room, the assailants closed in on Joe, ready to strike. Simultaneously, Hansu, who had been hiding in a nearby closet, emerged to confront the ninjas. In the fierce battle that followed, Shunpai managed to slash Hansu's face with a poison knife. Although enraged, Hansu fought back, feeling the effects of the paralytic poison. As chaos unfolded both in the hotel room and the hallway, the situation became increasingly perilous for Joe and his allies. Hansu found himself in a tight spot, grappling with one of the ninjas. Memories flashed in his mind lessons from his master on how to build tolerance against poison. His master had even gone as far as poisoning Hansu's food to strengthen him. The most significant change was that once suppressed trauma exploded, turning a person into a monster over time. Now, Hansu had transformed into one such monster, driven solely by a pursuit of strength without reason. Superhuman strength and reflexes became his new norm. As he clashed with the ninjas, he effortlessly dodged their attacks. More of them rushed in, aiming to overwhelm him and aid their comrades, but Hansu had reached peak power. He engaged with the ninjas with remarkable ease, tossing one out of the hotel building as if they were a mere feather. Despite the relentless onslaught, Hansu faced them without breaking a sweat. His strength was truly terrifying, and the word overwhelming couldn't fully capture its magnitude. Just as the ninjas kept piling on and charging at him, Sira and the others arrived on the scene. Sira, Desperate to intervene, seized Hansu and implored him to stop. However, Hansu, teetering on the brink of insanity, lashed out at Sira. Manager Kim, sensing the urgency, took action, eliminating another ninja. He sternly urged Hansu to halt, explaining that they rushed to the scene out of concern that the ninjas might use poison, a concern that had proven justified. Manager Kim and Park charged at Hansu, realizing that his limits had been lifted. Understanding the urgency, they knew they had to give it their all to try and stop him. With a simultaneous plea to halt, they attacked Hansu. However, 
Hansu, in a display of agility, dodged their strikes at the last moment. Leaping into the air, he delivered powerful kicks that left manager Kem and Park lying unconscious on the floor. Hansu shifted his focus to Sira and the others, causing confusion among the group. Joe, bewildered, questioned Sira about Hansu's sudden change, recalling that they were on the same side not long ago. Sira, urging Joe to stay back, asked him to hold on while Hansu menacingly approached. Just as Hansu closed in on Sira, Park regained consciousness and called out to him. Rippling with determination, Park tore off his shirt, preparing for a fight. He taunted and mocked Hansu. Concurrently, manager Kim revived and launched a barrage of kicks and stomps on Hansu, urging the others to evacuate. He disclosed that the hotel had been discovered, and the situation was dire. Suddenly, two Omidgan men landed on the balcony, opening fire on the group. Sira, Joe, and the others made a swift retreat. Sira took a moment to explain the gravity of the situation to Joe once again, leaving him with the stark choice of kill or be killed. Manager Kim, prioritizing the protection of the successor, hurriedly left the scene, dismissing Hansu as a problem the gunmen could handle on their own. Park, however, stood firm in the room, declaring there were various ways to protect the successor. Bravely facing the gunmen and Hansu, he proclaimed it would be a remarkable feat to kill two birds with one stone. Unfazed, Park asserted his identity as a soldier, resolute in his decision not to retreat. The last successor and the final black men received news that Zhou Jiyuai Guan had been spotted in South Korea. Simultaneously, Park engaged in a confrontation with a group of gun men at the hotel. The assistant informed the final black man that there was a minor issue. Some individuals had aligned themselves with Zhou Jiyuai Guan. Curious, the final black man inquired about the extent of their network, and the assistant reassured him that they had deployed their people to locations near the site of the planned assassination as much as they could. The assistant assured him not to be concerned and predicted that the situation would be resolved by the end of the day. In the hotel room, Park and Hansu successfully overcame all the gunmen, leaving only the two of them facing each other. Park, attempting to defuse the tension, called out to Hansu, asking if he had calmed down. Before he could receive an answer, Hansu abruptly kicked him straight in the face. Reacting swiftly, Park grabbed Hansu's foot, slammed him to the ground, and tried to reason with him. However, their moment was interrupted as more ninjas arrived to attack from behind. Observing the scene, the ninjas noticed their leader, Shun Pai, had been defeated by Park. As Park continued to grapple with Hansu, an overwhelming sense of danger and rage emanated from him, turning the place into a metaphorical battlefield. Despite the distraction caused by the ninjas, Hansu managed to kick Park again. Park skillfully evaded the attack, landing on his feet. Determined to stop Hansu, Park confronted him once more. Hansu, however, charged at Park, tackling him toward the window. In a swift move, Park dodged at the right moment, causing Hansu to crash out of the window and onto the streets below. Unfazed, Park approached the remaining ninjas berating them as idiots. He informed them that a nuclear bomb had been dropped on the location, rendering any further resistance futile. Meanwhile, Sira drove Joe and his friends away from the chaotic scene, only to witness the news breaking about the shooting on their phones. Joe urged his friends to return, expressing his concern for their safety. They hesitated but eventually agreed, asking Joe to promise he wouldn't die, revealing that they considered him family. For Joe Giyuai Guan, the concept of family had felt like a shackle surrounded by envy and jealousy, but now, he realized he had people who genuinely cared for him. As they headed back, a sudden collision occurred, a jeep t-boning their car, causing it to flip on the road. The perpetrator, a man from the US, named Zombie White, the boss of the White Barrel, emerged from the jeep. Panicking, Joe saw his students lying injured and on the brink of death. In a desperate moment, Zombie White approached Joe choking him and questioning if he was Chon Wai Chon's successor. Joe, overwhelmed, pleaded to take his students to the hospital. In the nick of time, manager Kim intervened, tackling Zombie White and declaring their commitment to protecting Joe with all their power from that point forward. The police tried to stop Lee Dong Yu from entering the airport, but Lee Dong Yu and the others just ignored the police and kept working. Suddenly, Lee Dong Yu noticed another group. He saw that it was the Chinese group, the K security team, Black Dragon Squad. They walked towards their jet, and the Black Dragon Squad leader, Lao Dong, sat on his seat. He asked another member if he had talked to the Korean side, and the member said that he did. They mentioned a smuggling route used by the Yantian people. The member then ordered the flight attendant to take off right away. Suddenly, they heard a menacing voice, 
and they saw a huge man entering the flight. It was Lee Dong Yu. He walked in and told them to hand over the plane to him, saying that he would only ask this once. Meanwhile, Manager Kim managed to save Joe Ji Yuai Guan from Zombie White. Manager Kim assured Joe that from now on, the White Tiger forces would protect him with all their power. Sira urgently called Manager Kim, updating him on the situation with the students and stressing the need for evacuation. Joe hurried towards the unconscious students in a state of panic. Zombie White, however, lunged towards Joe to attack him from behind. Manager Kim swiftly intervened, delivering a powerful punch to Zombie White's face. With another punch, Manager Kim aimed near the heart attempting to finish him off. Despite Manager Kim's efforts, Zombie White became enraged and retaliated with a barrage of punches. Manager Kim valiantly blocked the onslaught, struggling to hold him back. Zombie White, hailing from the US and a former White gang member, earned his nickname for his seemingly immortal-like body. He fought with the readiness to die, always emerging victorious. Manager Kim, seizing an opportunity, grabbed Zombie White's arm and, with a swift motion, broke the bone. Undeterred, Zombie White launched another punch and a powerful kick, sending Manager Kim flying to the ground. Meanwhile, Sira and another member assisted Joe in taking the two students to safety. Joe instructed the member to transport the students to the hospital, emphasizing the urgency. Joe, realizing the gravity of the situation, left the students in the car and instructed the member to proceed without him, fearing that their pursuers would follow. Approaching Sira, Joe understood the weight of his responsibility. Sira questioned Joe about his decision to become the successor, and Joe acknowledged that the world's attention was now focused on Chion Waichion. Determined to protect, Joe declared his intent to confront the challenges head on. Sira suggested heading to a branch building in Songdo, but Joe refused to avoid the impending conflict any longer. He resolved to fight relentlessly, unwilling to lose any more precious people. Back in the intense battle between Manager Kem and Zombie White, the two continued to exchange blows. Manager Kim, realizing Zombie White's formidable strength, understood that prolonging the fight would yield no favorable outcome. Feeling pressed for time, Manager Kim decided to cease the battle abruptly, surprising Zombie White. Manager Kim admitted that he had no other choice and revealed that he needed to utilize what he had learned from Major General to grow stronger. Meanwhile, in a different location, Park confronted a mysterious man. Despite Pock's attempts to land a punch, the man effortlessly dodged without even moving his hands. Park managed to connect with one punch, but the man skillfully flipped and kicked Park in the head. The man, introduced as Kim jong yoo from South Korea, confidently stood up, adjusted his glasses, and taunted Park. Manager Kim recalls a time when he was in the hospital, recovering from a broken arm. The doctor informed him that his arm's condition was the most severe. Curious about how much time he had left in that condition, Manager Kim inquired. The doctor commended him, stating that being able to use his arm despite the severity of the injury was noteworthy. Minji, concerned, sat by Manager Kim's side and asked about what happened in North Korea. However, Manager Kim gently parted her head and explained that the injury occurred before his trip to North Korea. Lee Dong Yu, also present in the room, heard the conversation. Manager Kim disclosed that he got hurt during an interview with the White Tiger forces. In the current moment, Manager Kim faces Zombie White. Suddenly stopping, Manager Kim confuses Zombie, who questions his actions. In a flash, Manager Kim rushes at Zombie, launching an attack. He grabs Zombie's ear and, with a swift force, breaks it off. Zombie, holding his bleeding face, is visibly affected. The injury Manager Kim sustained during the interview has yet to fully heal, marking that time as the most dangerous and horrifying. Manager Kim continues his assault, poking Zombie's eyes with force. Recalling the past, Manager Kim acknowledges that if the Major General hadn't composed himself during the interview, at least two parts of his body would have been lost. Undeterred, Manager Kim attacks Zombie again. Despite Zombie's attempts to strike with a knife, Manager Kim effortlessly dodges each attack, causing Zombie to panic. The battle intensifies, resembling a struggle between beasts, much like hyenas hunting their prey. Manager Kim seizes one of Zombie's feet and snaps it, breaking the bones. Zombie rides in pain on the ground as Manager Kim, now holding Zombie's knife, prepares to finish the fight. Meanwhile, Park finds himself in a challenging confrontation with Kim jong Woo, who proves to be a formidable and overly confident opponent. Attempting a punch at Kim jong Woo's face, Park's attack is effortlessly dodged. Although Park manages to land one punch, Kim jong Woo flips skillfully and counters with a powerful kick to Park's face. After sliding back, Kim jong Woo mocks Park, claiming luck is on his side today as he didn't bring a weapon. Undeterred, Park remains confident and asserts to Kim Jong-un that the presence or absence of a weapon won't alter the outcome much. Mocking his opponent, 
Park remarks that empty vessels make the most noise. Kim Jong-un, impressed by the banter, acknowledges Park's ability to provoke people and questions if Park would still be all right without a weapon. In a surprising turn, Kim Jong-un removes his wristwatch, holding it like a knife. Park realizes that this seemingly ordinary watch is more than meets the eye. Kim Jong-un charges at him, slashing with the transformed watch, and Park, feeling cautious and fearful, recognizes it as a deadly weapon. Simultaneously, the final black man engages in a conversation with his assistant, questioning why he bet on the South Korean team having the highest chance of winning. The assistant explains that Master Zhu Penguin believes that incredible martial arts masters were concealed in South Korea, a place filled with lunatics. According to Master Zhu, lunatics top monsters in strength, and the assistant reveals that one of the three lunatics is in South Korea, turning everything he touches into a weapon. Back to the intense confrontation. Kim jong yu continues to slash at Park with the wristwatch turned blade. Park, skillfully evading the attacks, quickly draws a pistol and aims it at Kim jong yu But to his shock, the bullet doesn't leave the gun, leaving it broken in half. Standing there in disbelief, Park realizes the dire situation as Kim jong yu once again pointing the wristwatch weapon at him, questions the significance of having a weapon or not. Chinese conglomerate Group K's security team, Black Dragon Squad, and the boss of that Black Dragon Squad, Zi Hao, who can face hundreds of men in a fight without even taking a scratch. Zi Hao gets called by the Group K chairman and he informs Zi Hao that Chion Wai Chion is split and the succession war has begun. He informs Zi Hao that they put a bounty on Zhu Penguin's second son and in the black market at that. On top of that, they put the prize as Chion Wai Chion's shares. Right now, the man who put up this bounty, his goal isn't to have Chion Wai Chion. His goal is revenge and destroying Chon Wai Chon is his goal. He tells Zi Hao that there is no need to think hard on this and it is the fight between a dog and a rabbit. He tells Zi Hao to get the shares of that Chon Wai Chon and beat Group T which was on Zi Hao's mind when he himself gets beaten up by the legendary Li Dong Yu later. Li Dong Yu intercepted Zi Hao and his group when they were trying to get on a plane. The airplane went up high in the sky. And inside, Li Dong Yu and Zi Hao got into a strong argument. Even though Zi Hao tried to fight back and say mean things to Li, it didn't seem to work. Li Dong Yu easily responded and made Zi Hao fall to the ground. While everyone laughed, Li Dong Yu teased Zi Hao about the silliness of running in the airport and warned about the possible bad things that could happen if someone trips and falls. Meanwhile, Li Dong Yu's friends carefully looked at the information on Zi Hao's phone and found out that some important details were now out in the black market. The exposed data included news about a reward for Zhu Penguin's second son, and there were extra benefits like shares from Chion Wai Chion. In response, Li Dong Yu's pals strongly encouraged everyone to support manager Kim quickly highlighting the increasing number of enemies in these tough situations. Curious about what was happening, Li Dong Yu asked one of his members, Yong Kiel, about the White Tiger Force's motto. Li Dong Yu proudly declared, never see any loss, and with a little laugh, he asked Yong Kiel if he had ever been a part of a business that didn't work out. To ease his friend's worries, Li Dong Yu said they shouldn't be concerned and expressed confidence that they would get the best rewards, no matter what happened in the end. In the midst of everything, Park found himself facing a tough challenge against a strong opponent, Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un, known for turning anything into a weapon, had the advantage in their fight, using his wristwatch unexpectedly but effectively. Despite the danger, Park didn't give up. With a quick and powerful kick to Kim jong us face and a strong stomp, Park showed resilience and determination. Among the laughs, Park made an interesting offer suggesting that Kim jong yu should join their unit and become a soldier. Kim jong yu easily escaped Park's grip, retaliating with kicks to Park's legs, making him fall face first onto the ground. Making fun of Park's proposal, Kim jong yu continued his attack, slashing with his makeshift weapon. Park skillfully dodged the attacks, unaware as Kim jong yu slyly took out a pin and Park's own belt. Taking advantage, Kim jong yu started slashing with the belt, catching Park off guard. Despite Kim jong us fierce slashes, Park managed to block the attacks with his arm. Seizing the moment, Park took control of the belt, pointing out that everyone, no matter how good they are with a weapon, has their limits. With a laugh, Park teased Kim jong yu joking that if he wanted to kill him, he'd need something as big as a tanker. Confidently, Park declared his intention to bring Kim jong yu to Ares. Meanwhile, 
Director Sun Weijo informed Ihua that the group supporting Zhou Jiu Guan was the White Tiger Forces. It appeared their mission was to protect Zhou Jiu Guan. In response, Tihua quickly told the director to contact major shareholders, announcing his succession and challenging Zhou Jiyuai Guang to step out from behind the White Tiger forces. Tihua proposed a substantial prize 30% of Chon Waichon's shares. The director hesitated, but Tihua revealed his personal vendetta against Master Penguin and suggested an additional prize of 10% of Chon Waichon's shares for the White Tiger forces. Excited about witnessing exceptional talents in combat, Tiwa expressed eagerness for the upcoming showdown. The King Sung Association president, Toku Taro Fujimori, received shocking information about the White Tiger forces. His guards informed him that it's an organization in South Korea, and a person named Lee Dong-yu is in charge. They revealed that Yuuki was killed by Lee Dong-yu, and they are currently looking into the specifics of the incident. Upon hearing this, Tokutaro became furious and commanded his guards to prepare. He declared that the entire King Sung Association is heading to South Korea, determined to confront Lee Dong-yu and transform the location known as the White Tiger Forces into a barren wasteland. Meanwhile, manager Kim emerged victorious in the battle against Zombie White. Quickly calling Sira to inquire about her whereabouts, she informed him that she, along with Joji Yuai Guan, was on the move and currently inside the Chon Wai Chon's branch building in Songdo, in Chun. Sira disclosed to manager Ken that they had taken advantage of Joji Yuai Guan's absence to summon major shareholders of Chon Wai Chon. Now, a full-scale war was about to begin, extending beyond the protection of Joe alone. Urging manager Kim to come as soon as possible, Sira conveyed the urgency of the situation. In the midst of this conversation, manager Kim was startled to witness Zombie White, the man he had just defeated rise again and pull the knife from his neck. Letting out a scream of pain, Zombie White revealed that it was his first time experiencing broken legs. Expressing shock, he explained that in the United States, conflicts are usually resolved with guns, devoid of room for martial arts. Manager Kim grasped the meaning of they as Zombie White mentioned it, and suddenly, two other individuals, Donnell and Dominic, launched an unexpected attack from behind. Swiftly evading their assault, Manager Kim managed to throw them forward, but he soon realized that the threat was not limited to just these two. Surrounded by a menacing horde of men, all poised for an attack, Manager Kim found himself in a perilous situation. Just as the tension reached its peak, a car careened into the crowd, striking some of the individuals in its path before halting right in front of Manager Kim. The driver, Choi Sang-ho, swiftly informed Manager Kim that the Major General had everything under control on his end and instructed him to hop in. Without wasting a moment, Manager Kim complied, entering the car. As the horde of people began to swarm the vehicle, pounding on its windshield with bricks and unleashing a barrage of attacks, Choi Sang-ho turned to Manager Kim and asked if he had any escape plan. Casting blame on Manager Kim, the situation became more dire until another vehicle approached, halting nearby. Subcontractors from the White Tiger forces emerged, ready to clear a path for Manager Kim, following orders from the Major General. Seizing the opportunity, the driver informed Manager Kim that they would now accelerate at full speed, while the other reinforcements faced the oncoming horde. The counter-attack commenced, with the horde leader, Zombie White, left shocked on the ground. Attempting to rush towards them, Zombie White was abruptly struck by the car, Manager Kim nonchalantly seated in the back, indifferent to the chaos around him. Meanwhile, the ongoing battle between Park and Kim Jong-u continued. Outside the hotel, the commotion attracted the attention of both the police and onlookers. Amidst the growing crowd, a man entered the hotel with the intent to quell the fight. The Blue Dragon Errand Center boss, Kim Hyo Seung. Park and Kim Jong-un were in the midst of their intense battle. Park taunted his opponent, proudly flexing his muscles while Kim Jong-un struggled to fend him off with his belt weapon. Despite Kim jong us swift movements, he felt like he was trying to conquer an enormous mountain in his fight against Park. He couldn't believe that there was another man as strong as Park in South Korea. During the clash, Kim jong us makeshift belt weapon snapped in half. Park seized the opportunity to mock him, holding the broken piece in his mouth and joking about its taste, suggesting it must be a branded belt. Continuing to show off, Park's antics began to genuinely annoy Kim jong un As Kim jong un assessed Park's strength, he was surprised and now faced the additional challenge of Park wanting to recruit him, an idea Kim jong un was not interested in. The two opponents continued to exchange blows, neither willing to give up or admit defeat. Even when Park was knocked down, he quickly recovered and rushed at Kim jong un again. However, their confrontation took an unexpected turn when boss Kim Hyo-seung appeared in the middle of the fight, 
catching Park off guard. Seizing the opportunity, Kim Jong-il grabbed Park and threw him off, causing Park to slam against a window. As Park tried to recover and charged back at Kim Jong-il, the glass shattered, leaving Park in shock as he realized he had been outsmarted. Boss Kim Hyo Seung, standing behind him, expressed his surprise at seeing Park in trouble and claimed he had come to help. Kim Jong-il, engrossed in his phone, didn't even notice the towering Kim Hyo seeing behind him. While Kim Jong-il checked his phone, he discovered a card for Ares, realizing that Park had sneakily placed it there without his knowledge. Meanwhile, boss Kim Hyo seeing contemplated asking for an autograph, but quickly reconsidered, recognizing the seriousness of the situation. When Kim Jong-il inquired if boss Kim Hyo seeing had also come for the bounty, he laughed and explained they were there to assist the successor, Jo Ji Yui Guan. Meanwhile, at the hospital, Wu Sung Sun successfully brought Zhou Ji Yui Guan's two students to safety and urgently contacted Zhou to deliver the news. Assuring Zhou that the kids were now secure, Wu Sung Sun pledged to keep them out of Hom's way. However, their moment of relief was short lived as a group of ominous individuals entered the hospital room, led by the formidable Jin Shi, also known as the God of Destruction. Without hesitation, Jin Shi seized Wu Sung Sun and effortlessly tossed him aside. Advancing towards the students on the hospital bed, Jin Shi confronted them. Wu Sung Sun, undeterred, rose to his feet and charged at Jin Shi, launching a series of attacks. To his dismay, his efforts proved futile as Jin Shi remained unaffected, not yielding even an inch. Climbing onto Jin Zai's shoulders, Wu Sung Sun unleashed a barrage of blows to his face, but Jin Shi seemed merely annoyed akin to swatting away an irritating fly. Jin Shi seized Wu Sung Sun, slamming him onto the floor and subjecting him to a ruthless onslaught of kicks. Commanding his followers to capture the students and place them in their vehicle, Jin Shi faced an unexpected interruption as a nurse worked in. And phased, Jin Shi, devoid of expression, struck the nurse fatally without a hint of remorse. With the students secured in the car, the group prepared to depart, but Wu Sung Sun, though battered, remained resolute. Standing in front of their getaway vehicle, he was determined to thwart their escape, even if it meant sacrificing his own life. When Jin Shi inquired about Wu Sung Sun's motives, the latter explained that true ownership of Chon Wai Chion comes to those who sacrifice for others. In response, Jin Shi delivered a powerful blow to Wu Sung Sun's chest, mocking him and encouraging him to revel in his loyalty before ultimately ending his life. In Wu Sung Sun's final moments, he found solace in the side of Han Su, trusting that his commitment to Zhou Ji Yui Guan would be upheld. Now with only 9% of his remaining personality intact, Hansu confronted Jin Shi, who stood perplexed and questioned Hansu's identity, unaware of the impending challenge he was about to face. With only 9% of his original personality remaining, Jin Shi questioned the stranger in Chinese, doubting his humanity. Before Jin could comprehend the situation, a brutal kick sent him crashing towards a car. Sung Hansu's bloodlust was evident as he relentlessly attacked Jin, slamming him to the ground. Jin, struggling to rise, questioned Hansu about his allegiance to Chon Wai Chion's guard. The reply remained silent as Hansu, consumed by rage, advanced towards Jin. With a swift punch, Jin attempted a one-punch murder attack, only to be met with Hansu's formidable defense. Jin's fist collided with Hansu's feet, resulting in a brutal slam to the ground. Amidst the chaos, Jin's flashback unfolded, revealing his mastery of a family martial art, burst fists. Though intended for non-lethal purposes, Jin had molded it into a destructive force. He urged Hansu to stand, acknowledging the latter's resilience. However, Hansu's counter-attack caught Jin off guard, leaving him with broken ribs and a newfound respect for his opponent. The scene transitioned to manager Kim in a car, discussing the situation with Shin Sira. They decided against returning to China opting to address John Wai Chion's major shareholders in South Korea. Ji Yui Guan, visibly shaken, initiated a video call with the shareholders, declaring himself as the rightful successor due to his brother's demise. As Ji Yui Guan announced a gathering in Songdo to decide John Wai Chion's future through a bloodbath, preparations were underway. White Tiger forces, including Dogyu, Kim Yung-chul, and Han Sang-gi, readied themselves. Meanwhile, Wu Sung Sun lay defeated, and communication with his side remained elusive. Sira assured Ji Yui Guan of the White Tiger Force's readiness and Tiwa's arrival. Ji Yui Guan, aware of a hidden family secret, contemplated the impending revelation. Tiwa entered the room, 
Greeting GUI Guan with a chilling long time no see. The ominous undertones hinted at a confrontation that would expose the family's darkest secrets. The chapter unfolds with a child addressing a man with glasses as director. In the midst of their conversation, the child seeks advice on dealing with someone larger in a physical altercation. The child reveals a classmate being bullied by an imposing figure named He Chen. The man, presumably a Taekwondo instructor, emphasizes that the gym isn't about teaching how to fight especially against bigger opponents, due to the inherent danger. The scene transitions to a fierce confrontation featuring a bloodlust-driven character named Sung Hansu. He faces off against Jin, who employs a deadly attack named One Punch Murder. In a flashback, the man with glasses, advising him to overcome the size disparity by getting stronger. The teacher emphasizes the importance of toughening both the heart and body. Returning to the present fight, Hansu successfully lands a powerful punch on Jin describing the strategy as becoming smaller and tougher. The impact is devastating, with blood gushing from Jin's mouth, resulting in his instant demise. As Hansu contemplates his victory, his phone rings, revealing a call from Tihoon's mom. The narrative shifts to Sira and Giyuai Guan facing Taiwa. Giyuai Guan questions Tiwa's unexpected presence, to which Taiwa reveals he has been in Korea since yesterday. A new character, Su Weijo, is introduced as a member of Taiwa. Sira reacts shockingly to Giyuai Guan, hinting at an undisclosed event. Taiwa, nonchalant, dismisses concern for others in perilous situations, recalling a past encounter with a younger GUI Guan. The storyline unveils manager Kim and Choi Sang Ho beneath a building, discussing GUI Guan's location. They are then surrounded by the White Tiger forces, identified as the Thai Assassin Group S. The chapter takes a turn to Parkland, lying on a car roof, observed by citizens filming, and being approached by the formidable Philippine gang, the Redhead. Returning to GUI Guan and Taiwa, the latter discloses placing bounties globally for revenge against GUI Guan and Chon Wai Chon. Taiwa shows no remorse, expressing his determination to conclude the vendetta. The focus shifts to Hyo Siung and Kim Jung Woo, cornered by the Iranian mercenary group Eka. Jung Woo reflects on the need for a swift response as the Eka members attack. He asserts a temporary alliance teaming up with Hyo Siung to fend off the attackers. We witness GUI Guan confronting Taiwa, questioning if everything he has done was solely to secure the successor position. Taiwa responds ominously, warning GUI Guan that everything around him will crumble from this point onward. Taiwa asserts that GUI Guan knows the true reason behind his actions, prompting a flashback to their shared past with their father. In their youth, their father, Zhu Penguin, was consumed with grooming one of them to become the successor of Chon Wai Chon. Despite their close sibling bond, Giyuai Guan drops a bombshell by expressing his desire to become a painter, rejecting the notion of being the successor. Giyuai Guan acknowledges their father's playboy tendencies and the possibility of other illegitimate children vying for the succession. Fearful of losing the family legacy to unknown siblings, Giyuai Guan vows to support Tiwa's ascension to the successor position. However, their father dismisses Giyuai Guan's dreams of becoming a painter and introduces a mysterious figure, a young Taiwa. The father declares Taiwa as the chosen successor, leaving both Giyuai Guan and Haiyang in shock and silenced by their father's authority. Fast forward to the present, Taiwa, with hands on Giyuai Guan's shoulders, asserts that Giyuai Guan is finally remembering the past. He urges the director to explain the hardships he has endured due to these circumstances. Meanwhile, Sira stands beside the director, lamenting the White Tiger Force's apparent sloppiness. As Sira prods Taiwa to continue his narrative, mercenaries from different countries surround the White Tiger Forces. However, an unexpected twist occurs as men in black suits affiliated with a mysterious organization emerge and swiftly eliminate the mercenaries. Manager Kim looks around as out of nowhere representing the King Sung Association Ryusei Iran, enters the scene, questioning the White Tiger Force's identity. The focus shifts to Sira revealing the enmity between their group and a faction in Japan. She approaches Taiwa, injecting him with a substance that induces dizziness. While Taiwa collapses, Sira remarks that she enjoyed his story before deciding to contact the Major General. Simultaneously, Lee dog -Yu, a member of the White Tiger Forces, engages with a Japanese adversary, Fujimori Tokutaro the King Sung Association president. As the two face off, it becomes apparent that Fujimori harbors a vendetta, and Dog Yu questions his motives is getting revenge or something else. In the chapters, we find Zhu Penguin seated on his chair, questioning Giyuai Guan about his sudden decision to give up the successor position. Giyuai Guan, determined, 
stands against his father's decision. Zhu Pengren criticizes Ji Yuai Guan, attributing the problem to his personality. Young Taiwa listens from behind a door, sporting a slight smile. Ji Yuai Guan attempts to console his father, suggesting becoming a teacher, as in disappointed voice his father tells him to go and pursue his dream of a teacher, but at a condition that he must help his first son to make him worthy of being a successor classes even it takes 20 years as he calls in Taiwa and tells him that till then he is giving him the responsibility of the Chon Wai Chon. As the scene shifts to the present, where Sira is trying to contact Major General Lee Dogyu. Suddenly, the subdued director of Taiwa gets up, realizing he let his guard down. He acknowledges the unique skills of the team, specializing in missions. The director, curious about the other staff, approaches Sira, shaking her hand. However, Sira discovers a pin and is stabbed on the hand. The director reveals his main specialty as acupuncture, waking Taiwa with a pinprick. Taiwa expresses curiosity about what they are hiding. Simultaneously, manager Kim and Choi find themselves surrounded by men in black suits. Choi, engaging in combat, advises Kim on survival. The black-suited boss, Ryusei Ren, confronts manager Kim, revealing knowledge of his actions. Ren attacks, but Kim dodges and retaliates, surprising Ren with his skills. The scene shifts to Dog Yu facing off against Fujimori Toku Taro. Dog Yu taunts Fujimori, insinuating a desire for revenge. Fujimori's men attack Dog Yu with knives, but he is swiftly assisted by Kim Young Chul and Han. Dog Yu breaks Fujimori's katana, praising his loyalty as a pass. The director informs Taiwa of a dire situation. The allied forces against the White Tigers are stronger than expected, but an even bigger enemy is present, the lunatic of South Korea. Taiwa bites his lip in anger upon hearing this revelation. Kim jong Nur engages in a fierce battle against men in black suits, showcasing incredible knife skills. The enemies are astonished at jung gus power and speed, dubbing him a ghost. jung Yu declares his intent to lend his power to the White Tiger forces. Considering it a rare opportunity, he signifies his readiness for a decisive confrontation. The man checks the message on his phone seemingly frowning upon learning the fact and then calls to Hani to say about how he felt the situation wasn't good, saying one of the three lunatics appeared, shocking him. He then tells him it was the one whose face seemed unknown. The man who attacked the other man questions the old man standing behind him as to where he belonged. The old man with a trembling tone states that he was from the blue dragon which now is white which Kim Jingo was unaware of. The old man introduces himself as Kim Hyo Seung. One of his men who played on the floor wounded wanted to expose Kim Jingo as to how he was intimidating the old man and plans to take a picture of him and too aware about such lunatic who was extremely dangerous and was staying in South Korea. The man then starts to get unconscious due to which the old man was portrayed of causing the King Sung Association massacre which terrified the Japanese archipelago. Many people got the information circulated as he was wrongly portrayed as if he belonged to the Blue Dragon instead of White Tigers. Tawanan then thinks as of how one of the three lunatics acted which led to the defeat of the mercenaries because of it. Tawanan then gets furious upon learning the fact on how he got tricked again. He then recalls the time where his first elder brother, Jo Yancy, was foolish and incompetent had no talent of becoming the successor. He then calls his brother Hyung that he was such a troublemaker listening which, Hyung Nim throws a bottle of wine at him saying how it was arrogant for someone like Tawanam to be born as a child of wedlock and wants him to continue the things how he used to sow to raise the company. Tawanam takes this as an opportunity and talks to his father upon how the first brother had no qualification to become the owner of Tan Wei Tion, complaining about him as to how he was behaving for 10 years and states the second brother was better. After which he confronts, she was best among all as he assisted the brothers by working hard all his life dispute the first brother being helpless and second one being the Ian who lacked will. He then kneels in front of his father as to gain the chance to take him as owner as he contributed to raise it. The father then apologizes for not being able to take him saying that the succession of children born in lawful wedlock had that filthy wall of bloodline. Listening this, Tawanam hopes broke and he grew furious seeing his father who was same after all he pretended to be a good person. Jo Wigwam then enraged, attacks Tawanam as to how him doing such things made his father's name tarnished. Tawanam with an evil grin on his face reveals that he was the one to kill his own father the few days before he was called by him and then was attacked by the bunch of men, leaving his murderers unknown then tells Hyun upon how Zhu died due to his carelessness in his hands and says it was due to the purpose of him wanting to run the company. As Hyun held Tawanam with a knife, 
Chun arrives and captures the secretary lady supporting Tai Ahas that he did the best choice for Chun Wei Chun. Then the manager general arrives claiming he would solve the issue and then pinches clean leaving him choked by his blood. The general then stares at Hyun stating he looks same like Su leaving an impression of a stranger by Dee Quim as he didn't look any like him. Then the general rivals that he got operated after having two sons confirming he wasn't the child of Zhu. Hyung then comes forward saying Zhu hid him from the fact about his father and decides to reveal the secret about it. The man reveals that Tewanam wasn't the real son of Penning, who was not his biological father either. Listening to this Tahani starts to lose his mind as he isn't ready to believe in the facts said to him and starts to choke him yelling not to speak rubbish the time when Penning was holding the baby only to hand over it to an old woman saying her to take care of the baby and that it was one of his friend's baby who requested him to look after him before he died. The old woman then agrees or take care of him saying that she is in debt to Penguin and she would help him manage the baby. She then asks him whether he wants to raise him as her child to which Penguin tells her to raise him as his son as he doesn't want the baby to grow up without a father and says that she doesn't know what his mother was like. Then when Penguin is about to leave, he reminds the old woman to raise the kid righteously saying he is the blood of a dangerous man. As he grew up, he was doing mischievous things as a kid such as pulling the girl's hair seeing this. The old woman calls out for him and asks as to why was he pull along out his classmate's hair which he shouldn't do. The boy seems to be enjoying the thing as he tells the old woman he feels good while doing it and asks why he shouldn't do it as such, leaving the old woman with a strange feeling. The old lady then meets Sue Penguin saying to hear his condition is serious as he was acting weirdly and questions who was even his father. Ju then tells her that Tiwa's father was such an incredible man who was into arts and Shine knew the distinctions between life and death and that he committed many crimes in the name of art leaving the old woman scared. He was involved in such an activity where human experiments were done, despite them being prohibited in China Zhu then says that he heard that Tahira's father had challenged the realm of God after which he completed his study and later was discovered by the government after which he died, and they could trace his material involved after he died. Zhu then tells the old lady to tell Tawanam that he wouldn't be liked by his father until he does such things which the old lady tells the boy after which Tawanam turns weird asking her what he could do to be liked by his father the old lady then says to listen to her and to follow how his dad wanted him to be. Technic tries to get a thought of whether he would be liked by his father if he became part of the Chon Wei group. He was seemingly obsessed with his so-called father. Listening to this whole story, Tawa's grip loosens from the man as to how he wasn't ready to accept the fact and he then yells out mad he could have any illegitimate child of Zhu and couldn't accept he was in if such a man who did crimes if human experiments. Haiyang then continues to say how Zhu protected his life recalling the incident of the old lady talking over the phone that she would receive a huge sum of money when Zhu learns that she raised him well and talks over the phone threatening someone that if she would receive less pay from him. She would then plan to kill Tawanam after Zhu inherited all of his property to him. Zhu and his secretary were listening to this conversation hiding from her, where she was waiting for Zhu's order to attack her for planning as such. Zhu then stops her saying that she was the only one who belonged to Tahira's family, who would make the old lady his mother. After seeing her intention, Zhu decides not to hand over his company to Tawanam as long as the old woman is alive. Listening to this, Tawanam trembles and laughs in tears after learning the truth from him as he had killed the one person who loves and thinks of his life so much. Kim then proceeds to fight the man who was attacking him with a sword swiftly, fighting tough against Kim who was Ryusei Ren. Kim then manages to knock out Ryusei with a hard punch to his face and then his attacks leave him lying unconscious on the ground. Kim then watches how Tawanam jumps off the building along with Hug through the window where Tawanam has whelmed grief of killing his father without knowing the truth about how his grandmother was planning to kill him and was saved by his known father Zhu. He then apologizes Hyang for doing such. The general yells out at him asking him to help get them to save whatever needs to be taken to which Kim agrees. Tawanam jumps from the window of the building, apologizing to him along with Hyang as he wasn't ready to believe the truth. He got to know from him and was guilty of how he killed his father despite things were not as he fought. Kim then arrives at the place they are about to fall and sends them flying back and yells out to assistant Cho to catch hold of them witnessed by how Kim is even crazy at situations and thinks of not leaving him at all. Hyun then whispers to Tahira upon understanding how he feels. Tawanan then learns that he was stabbed by Hyun and then Tahira subs recalling the facts of how he killed his father for such a misunderstanding he had about him. He then bursts out asking Hyung whether his father who gave him his living addresses him as Master Zhu if he would be disappointed with how Tawanam had become. Kim then approaches saying that he saw Master Zhu holding the flowers and Japanese honeysuckles, which symbolize the love given by the parent to his son. Tahira then remains confused as to what Zhu had to say to him as a parent. He then recalls Zhu and cries upon where Kim estimated that Zhu was about to tell him the truth about Tahira along with his true feelings towards him. Hyang then hugs Tafai, telling them that he will always be the son of his father, 
and by then Kim discovers that Tahira died in his arms. It was about how humans make mistakes to hurt someone who loves them than someone they fear, which eventually led to this kind of tragedy upon the parents who raised them. Kim then prays offerings along with his daughter saying that this man was her saviour, and says he would be indebted to him for the rest of their life.